Welcome to another episode of Summoning Insight. That's right, I'm back as the host. What you don't know, what you all don't understand is, I'm not actually a selfish player. You know, listen, I'm a fucking scorer and I'll never, I'll never pass up a shot that I can make, mate. But I will say, like, when I pass the ball, I get my teammates involved. So when Monty was coming back to the game, he could be the host, you know, it's less stressful in that regard. You can set other people up. You can have little bits of insight every now and then. Even though, let's face it, I'm the best host in fucking esports of all talk shows. I'm the OG. <laughs> I'm the gangster. I'm the godfather. I invented this shit. This is my stuff. I know that. I know you all think out there, you go, oh, I, I don't like you on talk shows because when you're not the host, you almost act like you're the host and try and steal the conversation. Fucking hell, why would I be doing that, eh? Because, I mean, after all, a guy who's a pro player for Dignitas, he'd probably just be a better host than me. I'll just let him fucking lead everything, <laughs> shall I? Or maybe I'll help him when he's doing it similarly when you go i don't like you on talk shows i just like it when you do those interviews you do all the research you are aware beyond like 2014 i haven't researched a single fucking interview they are all on the fly i'm just that much better than you or anyone you know so anyway with that said speaking of being better than you or anyone you know let's determine the best players ever in the history of league of legends so we're <laughs> gonna go obviously roll by roll because one thing that needs to be said is like realistically the whole i've, I've said this many times i think all people finally came around to my way of thinking the idea of who the best player just without roles in League of Legends is the most like whack stacked deck argument of all time because like how could a top player in a tank era be faker you can't how could a support player ever be better than Uzi I like it's gonna be fucking hard isn't it so in my opinion it just makes more sense to go roll by roll and then after that you can decide who you think is the best out of them but we can have a mega discussion just on the roles because it's all time remember like, we're doing all seasons of League of Legends although I'll give you a spoiler hardly anyone from season one season two season three really gets on this list <laughs> Also, I will say, we took a very interesting format, and I'll tell you right now, I copied it from what I saw when Match of the Day did their like all-time Premier League starting eleven. where the premise was you have three people, because we're going to vote eventually on each role, so two out of three decides it. it's democracy. If you don't like it, maybe think about what the premise of democracy is, and it's probably a flawed concept, isn't it? So anyway, <laughs> then... The way we'll make it fun is this. I had each of these guys give me their shortlist. And the idea of the shortlist is, this is all the people, Monty individually, Dom individually, I individually, think should be the best top laner, the best support, the best jungler. And then I'm the only one who's got all three lists. And then what I did was I made an overlap... And in theory, the overlap is the real nominees that we're discussing, because the logic is, like, already we've decided between them, we sort of agree one of them's the best. But in each role especially if they're fun ones. We'll also do some of the ones where it's like, right, well, actually, neither of us had this one, but Monty had this guy for top lane. So why did he have this guy? And you know what? If you make some amazing case, maybe they make the short list. And then we'll go to the process where we pick. And the idea of picking is going to be very simple, like I say. We make our arguments back and forth. Yeah, we have to eventually have two out of three. Someone has to decide. So it's not going to be that we're going to like to the end die like, we've already made our point about who we actually think is the best we'll just eventually do a negotiation and see what's the fairest for each role and we'll decide each one and obviously we've got Dom here because first of all certain other people who watched the game for a long time said no I'll just be real with you and secondly <laughs> he's okay. also listen I keep it real he's also one of the only people though this is one thing I give him mad credit for he's one of the only people who's actually watching both LCK and particularly LEC, uh, LPL, the last few years, aside from, like, even LS doesn't do that, because LS just leaves LPL out, essentially, does, like, the odd game. So, as a result, I actually think most people are not qualified to do an episode like this. Like, I wouldn't have an LEC caster on this, or some guy who's, I don't want one of those people who does the fucking semis or finals of Worlds, maybe they're American, to tell me who the fucking best jungler of all time is, and just go with shit storylines about an ESPN esports five years ago. So, okay, let's start out, right? So what I'll do is, again, I'm doing one with the list. So I'll start out like this. We'll start with the top of the map. We'll just go roll by roll. Perfect. Okay, so now, top lane. Let's start there. Okay, so obviously, there's going to be... I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you a spoiler. Everyone's Korean. Right, but let's do this, okay? <laughs> let's just see how it goes. So the overlap... I think we do that. We do the overlap first and then we do the out outlier cases and we see, do they really need to be in? Because the idea sure. there would be, to be fair, someone could have forgotten someone or, you know, maybe they didn't know something about, about their career. So the overlap is, we'll just go player by player. So one of the first ones, everyone had this guy, is The Shy, the guy who won season eight worlds for Invictus Gaming, the guy who is, like, he either carries the game or he hits the game. So Dom, why did you pick this player as a candidate um, for best top player ever? So he's the highest peak ever. That's like that. That's essentially what yeah. what I'm putting him on the list for. Um, he, like obviously in 2018 and even 2019, I think he was just peaking out of his mind. Even at Worlds, I mean, he obviously threw that game four. We had a massive lead, but he was like this next level freak where he would just dominate 
the game from topside and like he would he played all the range matchups and he was just able to like accrue massive advantages and and, and he actually was the one that that um you know like has you know the, uh, all the all the accolades right because the other people on the list the other people that you talk about aren't also world championships or for my list uh there's a, there's one other player that was a world champion but then he also won um uh he won lpl uh and he's he's just a, the the type of player where you can see that like his impact on the game severely changes how the enemies have to play so i think that for me that shy is just uh highest peak level out of all top laners in the history of league of legends so that's why he needs to be on the short list yeah i mean that's exactly the same reason that i put him on there i do i you know i put him on the short list not thinking that he was actually going to be the best but he deserved to be in the conversation simply because of that peak because i think if you examine his entire career the level of variance and it's not like smeb where smeb went from literal worst top laner in korea to best top laner but he kind of stayed there for a while like i feel like the shy goes up and down like really fast over time and so it's much harder to make an argument for him so unless you're arguing you know we all are going to have different criteria here where i i think if if the criteria is who peaked the hardest it, it's the shy but if the criteria is who actually had my criteria would be who is a great player over a long period of time? Uh, and also, maybe I'm a little less... Um, I don't consider necessarily like the number of world championships or domestic championships super important because otherwise I won't be able to make an argument for score later. <laughs> but I think for me, like the shy is is an example of that peak, but not an example of whom the criteria I would select for being the greatest of all time. Yeah, there's another thing. As we're making our points, maybe we throw in as we, as we do each role, you know, some, maybe even specifically to the role, you know, what criteria, because I also agree. I don't know where Dom comes down it, but I, like, put it this way, like, world championships and stuff, like, that isn't, like, winning you this award for me. First of all, everyone in this list is amazing. Like, these are unbelievable players. And I think it's the same as, like, someone like basketball. You can genuinely be the best player ever, and you might not actually ever win the NBA title. I think that's really possible. Like I might have picked the wrong spot with NBA to be fair as like more of a team a individual star game. But football even soft, for sure. NFL. Oh American football, of course. Even ice hockey yeah. I'd say because you don't play that many minutes, you know, and there's so many to, to get taken off, etc. So basically I, I also agree the shy has to be on this list. Like I say everyone had this guy on. The thing for me is that I'm gonna define this. I always start with eye test because in my opinion it, how how does it make any sense to go? Let me look at guy's trophy cabinet. Yeah, you might be the best. Now let's watch him in the game. That doesn't make any sense at all. Like, because as a result, the most carried players of all time would be in conversations like this. There's players who've won two or three worlds. They aren't that good players necessarily. You know, they're just yeah, okay. I'll, I'll do a little. I'll do a little spoiler. Like, Bang's not making my fucking list for ADK. Like, that's <laughs> what I'm gonna say right here. Like, this guy <laughs> is not making my list. Yes. And, perfect. On a, more, on a more topic. On a more topical note, guys. Like. If anybody put Khan, I would be shocked. If anybody put Marin uh, as top player, I hate, I I hate when cut. people do that. I, I hate, hate the Marin example. I hate fucking like. Look, guys, Marin wasn't that good. Okay, I don't understand why everyone thinks Marin was great. He was not that great. Even at the time, he wasn't that great, guys. He was like he, he dominated on Maokai, and that was about it. There was like a random narrative that came out where they're like, "Oh, but he was like the shock caller of season yeah. five, oh, and he was like the main character." And it's like so we knew that wasn't true at the time. I don't, I don't, I just, I don't see a world where people are like, Hey, who's this new fucking top laner that we, that we just got into? Oh, Marit. Yeah. We're going to just like defer to everything he says and not faker the guy who's like the best player in the world for the last three years <laughs> by fucking far and has won like the world championship for us when our, when, when our team won it. Like, I yes. just don't buy that shit at all. <laughs> and so also here's what, the thing. What did Marin do after he won worlds? Yeah. Riddle me all that right. guys. Yeah, he went to. <laughs> he, he joined LPL, looked mediocre, came back, started streaming. Nice, congratulations, you did it. It was also in the Africa Freaks where it was worse than the one when they got Kane. So again, yep. that is, even the AB testing doesn't check out. No, on the shy, I would say this. The reason I bring up the eye test is though, I do think though, like every term in the game, the problem is this. Terms and simple label concepts, tempo, engage, they're actually invented. It's like I always say about the roles in basketball. Those roles aren't real things. Like if you're Tim Duncan, technically you play the center position, but you play it like a power forward. You basically do whatever the fuck you want, right? You're just, you're just the best player. You're not really like the center. You don't have to only do what a center does. Like there's no limit. Like that, the limits are in our minds. But the reason you invent those terms is to explain very quickly to a layman, like that's what the concept of the role is at least. Like that's generally what some of these players are going to do. Or oh, this guy gets the rebound, this guy shoots at this guy shoots at long range. This guy handles the ball. So similarly, right? I personally think the term eye test has been run into the ground. People think eye test just means like, oh, wow, he's super flashy. 
So here's an example. People might wonder. I say I test is my ultimate god when I decide players. So then how could I pick perks over caps, right? Because I even think with the eye test, depends what eye test you mean. If you're talking about flash and mechanics, caps might win that. But the eye test also involves, like, you can see if the guy's well-rounded. You can see if he is polished. You can see if he can integrate all of his skills. You can see how consistent he is with your eyes. So that's why I personally always add perks over caps. So that's the problem I have with the shy. If we're talking mechanical, peak, is the eye test is unbelievable. The problem is, if we're talking, like, polish, like, do you play responsibly... That's actually pretty fucking pretty average for this guy, I'd say. Like, I think that's the way he tanks the game sometimes. So I, I'm very interested to see, because I will say this is one of the most competitive roles, in my opinion. This is one where there's, there isn't like a clear cut one like some of the other roles. So we'll go to the next person. We've all referenced him because he's on our list, all of us, obviously. And this is Smeb. So the, the Rocks Tigers top later and obviously later on katie rolster and then we pretend he didn't play on the teams after that i want to i want to start with this one just because i think he him as a player is just so interesting because for those of you who don't know like doa and i used to jokingly it wasn't an actual award but we used to give out the long panda memorial trophy for like the worst player the worst top laner in uh in champions now known as LCK every season. And when he was on Incredible Miracle, this guy was fucking shit. Like he was so, so bad. And then all of a sudden he became the best top laner in the entire world, which is probably one of the biggest, like the most rapid ascents I've ever seen from any player in any esport ever. So I'm not sure. I would love to hear an interview with him to see like how exactly that happened or like what switch flipped in his mind or if he changed something about his tra practice. As far as I know, he's never really commented on that, but I think it's really interesting. And then also, now it did take a while for the t the Tigers to actually win a championship because you know they were kind of repeatedly falling to SK Telecom in the finals, um, even though they would routinely have the best record in the regular season. And he was also incredibly versatile. I think that had there been a double elimination bracket at the 2016 world championship, there's definitely, you know, if they had been able to play against SKT again, I think there's maybe a chance that they would have won uh, the world championship that year. And his dominance lasted for like two, three years where he was pretty much uncontestedly the best top laner in the world. So I think he's a pretty significant contender. Yeah. For, for me, I have him as my number one, um, top laner of all time. And, you know, it's rough because he never had the peaks that other top laners um, did on, like, my short list, for example, which is pretty much world championship, right? Um, but I think that he was good enough for long enough. And then the other thing that that I uh, really respect is his, is his, like, versatility. Like, he could literally play any top lane champion in any meta. There was never any type of issue where, like, you know, you, you look at the other players that you have on the list, right? And you're like, the shy, well, the shy's, like, tank play was significantly uh less like impressive than when he played range top laners really really like the shy's biggest strength was being able to play like jace and kale um, mm -hmm. who obviously becomes a, a range champion later in the game the fact that he um like integrated Callista to the top his quinn versus renekton his lucian top like this is what made him such a, a strong player whereas when Smeb was playing, like I felt like he could seamlessly go to a tank, like play a Maokai, play a Poppy when it was relevant, all that stuff. And th there was like a long tank meta during his tenure. Uh, and then easily when things switched up, he would be the best cannon in the world, like by yep. far. Like he would just be by far the best cannon in the world um, in the next meta. So I think that that is super, super valuable to me. And that's why I think he's the best of all time. And also you have to take in consideration people's teammates. So like the shy head rookie, who is obviously going to absorb a lot of pressure, Dude, look at fun Jackie Love. Yeah, and like look at Smeb's mm -hmm. teammates, man. Like Prey is an excellent like passive AD carry, but he's not going to be the one who wins you the game or puts you over the top most of the time. And so mm -hmm. Kuro, his other solo laner, like oh my god, this guy this guy is literally the reason why this team never won. I swear. Exactly. Exactly. You know this? Here's here's the test you do. Take anyone you think's better than Smeb and tell me that they could have taken a player like Kuro. Not oh, only win nice. LCK, by the way, have like three or four chances to win LCK and then have legit two chances to win Worlds and be yep. in position to. That is, by the way, I consider mid lane the most broken role in the history of League of Legends. So <laughs> that is unbelievable. And then you add in intangibles we've heard about. Supposedly he was the main shot caller. Like supposedly when he went to that KT super team, half the problem was Matt and Smeb were both like, right, so anyway, everyone listen to me. What are you talking for? I'm 
I talk now. And it's like, and then they just had divided opinions. And then Matt was like, well, of course we'll be playing through the bot lane. And he was like, I just come from a team where we play through the top lane, mate. <laughs> so I think that that's an angle as well. Like he was a, a guy who wasn't just playing it. And I also think he had an unbelievable understanding of how you win the game of League of Legends. Because with those trash tier Rocks Tigers players, this guy, it's not like he wasn't just like hard smashing the lane every time. It didn't matter what happened. He could die two times in the first 10 minutes. He'll still find a way to make that matchup work, to be relevant in the game, to get to the team fights, to be creative with his teammates as to how to use them. And then they'll just throw this in there. The other angle people never talk about. This is why this guy is unfucking believable. Think of what he almost did. He was this close, no joke, to like best resume ever. Like that's how close he is to like he could win this final, this final, this final. He could have still he had a very good one. If if he had beaten SKT in 2015 and 2016, he would have won two world championships. And, but this and like, is how he did it. Yeah. Think about this. <laughs> he did it in season five. Most of the people watching the show won't even be able to name his jungler. His jungler was a fucking nobody. Yep. And they even subbed his jungler out at one point and put another jungler. He was just still fine. Another nobody. Yep. Then he had Peanut. We all got to go, I love Peanut. I fucking don't. I've got an allergy to peanuts, mate. They make my head blow up and go red. Because this motherfucker <laughs> was the ultimate razor cake. He would always look like a stud in the regular split, and then he would shit the motherfucking bed. Like, one of the things I hate about Bengi is that people talk about that niddly game like it was some fucking god-tier performance. It was just peanut <laughs> inting the fucking game away. He just shit the bed. He just got psyched out and blew the whole thing. So basically, this guy was close to accomplishing everything people like Faker have with a joke of jungler, but I mean, you look at feed up since then, or and then a no mid laner, me, bro. Jesus. and no mid laner, <laughs> and no mid laner, and, and also, he played in Korea for fuck's sake. Kuro, Kuro's just like, I, he's one of my least favorite players of all time for the reasons Dom said, which is like, if they had just, you know, they thought they were going to win with the power of friendship because that was what the Tigers were known for, and they didn't have any but, money to be fair. <laughs> yeah, but realistically, like, if you replace Kuro with Many other mid laners in Korea in either 2015 or 2016, I think a lot of those losses in finals turn into wins. And it's really depressing to me that that didn't happen for the sake of Prey, Gorilla, and Smeb in particular. Mm hmm. Okay, so those are the only two players that we all agree on, right? So obviously they're strong candidates. Then what we'll do is this. There's two players that me and Monty put forward, and then there's one that only Dom put forward. So this is where it's going to get fun. So me and Monty went with a bit of a new school flavor. We put Nagori, right? So I want Monty mm -hmm. to give his reasoning for that one. What do you think? So I, I think that I put him on there because I think you can make a case for him. Um, but I, I wouldn't actually pick him because I don't think he's been good for long enough yet, if that makes sense. But I do think that like in a year or two, we definitely could replace him with Smith. Like mm -hmm. he has that potential. He's on that like trajectory right now, which is why I thought it was interesting. First off, I mean, he continues to perform amazingly well. You can clearly see that Dom Juan is worse without him. You can clearly see uh, if you watched the finals in LPL that his performance was, you know, he was the focus, like they were trying to shut him down. And even then he was still making insanely good plays. Um, so he's, he's already proven that he can kind of come up and become the LCK champion, become the world champion. Right. And, uh, now he's gone to China and he continues to do it. Presumably, even though he is not fluent in Chinese right now. So I know you guys were just talking about this on the crackdown about the language of league of legends, but he continues to perform at a high level and around his teammates. Mm -hmm. And I think th that to me is really impressive. And if he can continue on this course, then I think maybe, maybe in a year we might say, okay, he, he has gotten better than Smep. Yeah, I yeah. have the same reasoning, basically, which is like, it's actually like what I did with Smeb. It's sad that these things always fucking die on the internet. You can never find them. Because back, back at season five Worlds, at, when it, when they had the quarterfinals in the UK, Susie did an interview with me because she was working for Twitch, right? And she asked me about the Rocks Tiger. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was Rocks at that time. She asked me about the Rocks Tigers versus... Um, no, it was Koo Tigers, actually. There we go, because Monty did the Koo Koo thing or whatever. Like, she asked me about the Koo Tigers versus Katie Rolston in the round of eight. And because Katie Rolston had beaten them in the summer split that year, everyone else was going like, right, the rankings go like this. Marin number one, Someday number two, Smeb number three, and KT will win the game. And I basically explained in this interview, like, they're just wrong. Like, I actually look at Smeb and I'm like, this is the fucking true successor to Flame, mate. This guy's going to be the best top laner. He's just got the whole all-around game. And if you just play through him, he's just the best. They win that game, they go to the finals. Basically, that's how I 
I, I saw Smed back then. I actually think, spoiler, I do think he actually delivered on that promise and he did become the greatest top player. I'm probably going to vote him. We'll see. But that's what I think Nagori is right now. He's the guy who the first mm. part of his career is so impressive. And that we've seen now between teams that it's like, that's the trajectory. Now, I will say, as anyone who's watching CS Go knows right now, you never give them the title before they've done it. Like, Zero was looking incredible these last two years but he hasn't done what Simple's done yet. So you never go, you've got it already. You go, you have to wait and they do it. But if you have the trajectory where you're going like this, then yeah, maybe it can keep going and you could be the best ever. So the problem I have with Nagori is he really hasn't played long enough. Like people forget the first year he came in, it was a bit ropey the first split or two. In fact, people forget this. They brought Flame in as a backup and just started playing Flame in some of the regular season games because actually the team had shot calling issues when Nagori was in the game. So some of that maybe helped him. Then by Worlds, he was very good. I already thought he was great then. Last year was obviously fucking... Like, I think the thing people don't understand about last year's team was it was the push-pull of having two unbelievable solos and a strong jungler. And then the top laner arguably the best carry top player, can just fl flex up and play fucking Lulu if he wants and just play for the team. Like, you can't beat that. That's why no one could beat Damwon Gaming. It made sense. That's why I wanted to see top. So anyway, yeah, I have Nagori there, again, just because he deserves to have his name in the conversation. The other one, I've referenced him already, me and Monty both put Flame there. So a bit of an old school pick. What was your reasoning, Monty? We have the same fucking uh, thing in the so, background. Well, let me, let me go on Nuggery first. Because yeah, I did, no. I didn't oh, have... sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, you yeah, didn't yeah, listen, so, but yeah, go on. So I didn't listen to Nuggery. So I, he's someone I obviously considered. Um, but for me, like, I think that that the reason why he doesn't make the list is 2019. Um, I considered him, like, I think he pretty much choked that world championship. If you look at, like, his level coming in um, and what people expected, the fact that, like, you know, everyone thought he was going to be the best top laner in the tournament and he looked relatively outclassed. I mean, he got... Out, he he had that game that he pretty much solo lost versus uh, Impact when he was playing Vladimir into Aatrox, which was, which was considered super good. He kept on going klepto on Vlad no matter what, whereas like through the tournament, people started realizing phase rush was just much, much better because whatever you gained out of klepto, uh, essentially if you like if you weren't playing against a strict tank and you could just pure farm them, the fact that, that you could avoid all ins from champions with phase rush was just better. So I take away points there. And then also like his world championship win, like I, I never considered him the, the best player on, on Dom one, right? Like for me, it was Canyon. Like he was the, the star of the show. Um, clearly probably has to do with, with jungle being strong. Um, but for me, I just don't think that he was like the best player for, for, for the time that he won. And I just don't think that he um, is someone who's like, been good for long enough that we can say the consistency argument right like i think 2019 oh, I was relatively bad 2020 was like pretty good but like the thing that, that people people overstate um like how much volatility like nuggery had because he would end up having like good performances in games but like the meme around nuggery for a while was he would go zero two and yes, then two like, kill power spike yeah. right two death power Z spike sorry yes zero two power spike was was his meme well yes. why was that because he would literally just get solo killed like one to two times in every single game and then he would end up being like relevant later on which is similar to how licorice was portrayed in the north american lcs yes. in that year where people would just like kind of be like oh well it doesn't matter that he dies those times uh because you know like he's just going to take over where people will just ignore the fact that if you're on a worse team, you literally lose the game there. Like there's no like opportunities or things that are happening around the map. Like the, the pockets of opportunity aren't created for you to get back into the game. So I think that that's like an issue um, with, with how he played in, in 2020. I think that now he's actually peaking. I think that in 2021, this is yes. his best year that we've seen. I would, I would not have put him here unless we had seen the performances this year, because I agree with many of your points. And that's why I think it's the, tra the trajectory, because mm -hmm. in my mind, the, he's still, he's just going up. Right. So it's yep. still like a year, uh, like probably a couple years out from mm -hmm. making any kind of definitive statements about that. But for the most part, like, He's in the right direction, which is, you know, to even consider him on that course potentially with Smeb, I think, is a, an accomplishment. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is the first time that you could potentially, like, pause the tape and be like, is he the best in the world right now? And then he has to be, like, in the conversation. I think last year, like, maybe he was the best in the world, but, I mean, Bin was also really fucking good at the World Championship, and it seemed like his teammates kind of just outmatched there, so... Zoom, yeah, there was a bunch of people in the mix yeah, then. I, sure. Yeah. And I I also think that if you compare this point in his career to Smeb, like, it, you know, certainly Smeb is, was impressive at it, at his first Worlds when they made the finals, but realistically, they were massive underdogs coming into the finals mm -hmm. against SKT. Um, and, you know, I don't hold a, a, the first world's performance against anybody. And sure, like, you know, Dom Juan, the rest of the team wasn't as good. And also he has better supporting pieces in the jungle and mid lane than Smeb did. That's also mm -hmm. true. Yep, right, so true. anyway, then me and Monty had flame. So why, why flame Monty? 
So this was mostly, if you're going to evaluate on a, on a, um, the idea of innovation in a role yep. or like fundamentally changing the way a role is played, which is why I almost put Reaper in here as well, weirdly, because mm -hmm. even though Reaper would have been a very odd selection, Reaper actually broke the meta on numerous occasions, especially in terms of play style and itemization in the top. It's lane. game influence, right? It's like influence yeah. on, on the game is what really is being measured. With yeah. Flame. Like Re Reaper was the one that was like, fucking around with jungle items and playing Vladimir with old jungle items in the top lane and doing super well on them and actually just shifting the meta entirely and like forcing Riot to make balance changes. But I think Flame, the way that they played around the top lane, he was kind of the prototypical uh, carry top laner, obviously. And it's really hard to, to if you were not existing in that period um, of League of Legends, it's really confusing a lot of the times because he was the first one doing a lot of wave manipulation to like stack waves and create pressure on the map, which was super helpful. He was, you know, the term Flame Horizon comes from the fact that he was dominating his opponent so hard through like minion denial that he was a hundred. Yeah, all that shit. Yeah, yeah, he was a, a hundred, a hundred creeps up on his opponent, and so it, and also the fact that blaze was upset in 2013 in that final was like inconceivable like that was mm -hmm. supposed to be probably the most one-sided or one of the most one-sided uh korean uh korean championships in in league history and it ended up as a 3-0 for mvp ozone at the time so that said like the expectation is is huge there so I don't know. I think I think Flame is I don't I wouldn't pick him, but I think he deserves to be have a nod in the conversation. He he's like to me what Mad Life was to support, where it's like yes. I don't think that you can say Mad Life is um like the best support of all time. I don't think like he has the accomplishments for it. I don't think he was good enough. But like his amount of influence um definitely like needs to be taken into account. I mean, there's something this is like something that that goes in, in into the list. Like how much do you actually measure influence? Because obviously early players have a higher chance to um influence like the the game, right? When the game is less understood, there's more opportunities to like create innovation. So it's something that that overall I don't count that highly, which is why I don't have flame on the list. Um and and yeah, like that's just like players like that. I'm just not going to put on my list because I think that the game was so underdeveloped that it's like, well, somebody else would would get credit for that if they weren't there eventually. Is is how I see it. It might have just happened later. So like, players like Diamond Prox, I'm not going to be like, oh, he was the best jungler in the world because he was super innovative in uh, season two. Uh, here's the thing. I have it for similar reasons as Monty. Basically, I know now for modern fans, it's actually Smeb that will have this role. Like I said, he was the successor to Flame. Flame basically is the gold standard of how you view a carry top laner. You look at like, do they win their lane? Do they win their champions? Do they win their matchup? Are they good in team fights? Do they not inter inter interact with the jungler? If you put all the resources in their basket, do they carry? Because traditionally, it is a role Koreans always carried through. A lot of other regions in the world just put you on a tank. They just make it simple because it's really complicated to have a top laner be the guy who carries the whole game. If you fuck up any other element of your team setup, your bot lane gets behind, mid laner has no priority, jungle just as is fucking getting gapped all the time, you're going to have a really bad time when you put that guy on the carry matchup. Like, it's just going to look shit. So as a result, like one of the things that fucked Flame's career though, unfortunately, is he was very good the first year. I'd say half of the next year he was still very good. And then after that, he just basically made poor career decisions. He went in a lot of scenarios where he was sobbed. Like in the LPL, by the way, he was still LGD. a very good player. The problem was their team, put it this way, the guy eventually became the temporary coach who was his pl second player. So do you imagine he played himself or the fucking other guy? So he just made all these bad decisions. And uh, also I'll say a lot of his years were during the time where it was the dark days that generally you don't play through top lane. Everyone's going to go, what about Smeb? Smeb's team effectively, as Flame explained in an interview I did with him, was designed to allow the top lane to carry. That's why they had Praying Gorilla. That's why you had a fucking... You, a Korean poor bell to mid laner and he had no jungler so who the fuck do you think you're going through every team flame joined would have like well we've got a pretty good mid laner and he carries all right well then you're just going to pick what's the meta and go with them aren't you so I just put him here for similar reasons like once upon a time he would have been legit in this conversation but the longevity he's not there at the elite level it's more just again just to mention the person's name because of what they did for the role right there's one other person and only Dom put him in so I'm just going to say this if Dom's going to go with the angle of like I don't think mad life's that good right Dom has impact Mm -hmm. Come on. Yeah, so so impact is is different, right? Because I don't view impact as like influence on the game, which is what I'd be measuring with Mad Life. For for impact, I'm measuring 
like how long he's been good and been like a top performer. And like a lot of the things that you have to take away is like, obviously because he's playing in North America, like he's not getting the opportunity to go to like semifinals and like, and, and, and uh, finals of, of worlds. But he, but when he plays against top players, like through the world, like, I mean, he shit on Nuggery, right? Like, like verse versus Nuggery in group stage. It's not like, TL made it out, but he was a, like one of the strongest performers on on TL. Uh, not only did they have the the game where he played Aatrox into to Vladimir, where he just essentially outclassed um, Nuggery. The game after that was like the Scion lane swap, where it was like the team decision. Like he's the one that's taking the L, Scion lane swapping, and then they end up like getting absolutely ass blasted on, on a fight. So I think that that impact um, overall, I think, is, is somebody who has to be in the conversation because of like the amount of time that he's been good. Right. So it's like, also it's also that he steps up. He's very clutch when it matters too. Like in play, in playoffs and international tournaments, or, or when he peaks <laughs> in terms of his performance. Yeah. So like so he has he has the credentials, right? He has um, you know domestic titles in Korea. He has uh, at least four splits that he won in in North America, right? So he has he has accolades. Um, he has a, a world title. championship. Yeah, he has a world championship, <laughs> obviously, um, which is what I was going to get into next. He has a world championship, obviously. At, at that time, I don't know who you'd consider the best top laner in the world in season three, right? Like this, it's it's kind of like up in the air because the role was so new, and he was recently like role. So I mean, the game was so new, um, and yeah, like so I think that that he has like the accolades, and I think that his longevity is the main thing that I'm measuring. Like he has literally been a like top ten top laner in the world from season three until season 11 sure. like that's fucking insane like right like uh, i mean up until season 10 obviously like sure. season 11 you can't really measure but like you put him in a bunch of these situations and he's completely fine like you you put him in in group stages versus like wonder and you put him in group stages versus uh versus shy uh, whoever, yeah bin right and the shy and, and nuggery and you always think wow I mean, Impact's not going to be able to compete with them. Like, he's decent, but yes. he's not going to... And then he'll, like, he'll just be completely fine. Like, he's probably the, the most underrated player. player of all time, right? Yeah, potentially. So, I mean, I think that he's somebody who, like, for me, I would say is probably, like, in the conversation. That's my third. So my first would be Smeb. My second would be The Shy. And my third would be Impact of, like, top leaders of all time. Right, here's the only issue I have with that is one of my criteria also goes like this. This is why I don't have Impact on my list. I know, in theory, a body of work and a whole career, blah, 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 blah. The problem is, if I can't ever go to any moment in time, ever, and say you're the best, you can't be the best at that role, by definition. Like, you can't be the greatest basketball player of all time if at every moment in history you were never the best, you just played the longest. Like, I know everyone's going to say, like, but you know, LeBron is for that reason. Like, yeah, LeBron was actually the best player in the world at one point in time. Like, that's not, that's not just his career that did that. Like, he didn't play during the same time as the other players. So that's just the reason I wouldn't disclose him, right? So here's the thing. I actually think this is one of the easiest roles, basically, because we've sort of all said, as far as I can tell, we're all going to vote Smeb. Yep. <laughs> we're all voting Smeb, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Smeb is number one. I, yeah. I really, I really like actually struggled to come up with enough. Li I was trying to like add more names to this list because I was uh, basically for me, it was, it was pretty clear. Um, and I think that for people who are like, well, what about Zoom or Bin or 369 or these Chinese tops? I, I just don't think they've, they've been around long enough yet to really earn that. And also they haven't peaked as high as some of the other players either. Mm hmm. Just look at, no, here's the problem. Smeb has it all. Basically, all he doesn't have is worlds. You can't mm -hmm. fuck with, like, excellence, longevity, how the team plays through you. It's a bad teammate. It's like, man, he has it all. He checks every box. Yep. So, okay, let's go to the next one. This is one where, actually, I'm very interested because we kind of went all over the place on this one. So, next one is going to be Jungle, obviously. Dom's role, we will say. Technically, he played it as a professional. We did not. We just watched the game. Monty just secretly believes he was a jungler when he was watching all the Korean teams and fucking <laughs> rotations and all that, you know. <laughs> whatever. So, listen, we all had one player, and the rest are all debatable. So, the Ooh. one player we all had is Dandy from Samsung White. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even argue this guy is the best either. Yeah, I don't think he's the best. For <laughs> me, it's going to be an interesting decision, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. For, for me, he's highest peak, right? Like his level when they won Worlds season four was the highest level that we've ever seen a jungler. And it's like the most carry, uh, the most carry that we've ever seen a jungler um, have because it was it was different than like, for example, when Canyon um, won Worlds and he was the MVP where it's like, he was good at carrying, but his team was enabling him to carry. So like the strategy for Dom Juan was Canyon carries. We help Canyon get into positions to carry. Whereas it didn't feel the same for like Samsung White. It felt like they were all strong and he was like good at like getting his own advantage. Like he got his advantages through ganking. Like he would take dragons himself. He would 1v1 the enemy jungler. And he had like the champion pool that was above and beyond everyone else's. It felt like everyone else saw Dandy playing Rengar 
and was yep. like, shit, we actually have to start playing Rengar now. And then it they sucked like, at it. <laughs> yeah, and then everyone sucked dick at Rengar, I mean, right? like, the, like, the difference is, like, he could actually play Rengar, and he was the only person in the world who could, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So his ability to, like, play, like, he was so far ahead of the meta. I mean, when people played against Dom1, people were, were understood all the champions that, like, Canyon was going to play. People knew going in, he's going to play Graves, he's going to play Nidalee. Like, this is just, like, his champion pool. It's like, how well can we contain the strategy that we know Dom1 is bringing? People had different perceptions of, of junglers when they got to Worlds. Like, people didn't know that Rengar countered Kha'Zix. People thought that Kha'Zix was just, like, still pretty fucking broken. After the nerf, people were like, oh, well, it's going to be, like, Jarvan meta. Or, like, people are going to be playing, uh, like, Lee Sin. He was the person that was able to, like, actually not only play at the highest level, but also he had the best read on the meta. And then he also was, like, the most individual jungler where, like, I mean, obviously there's things where, like, Mata was good at warding. Like, there was some level of, like, duo synergy. But but Dandy got a lot of advantages himself. So, I mean, I think that he had the highest peak ever, but I just wouldn't say he was the best ever. I also think that, you know, Mata was the one who I actually voted for as Worlds MVP of that Worlds when I was on the desk. And I think it was hard because the two of them were so inextricably linked together that it's really, really difficult because basically, like, that was the season where Samsung White effectively invented kind of like the the jungle support synergy uh deep warding uh vertical jungling was basically invented by them as weird mm -hmm. as it sounds like you didn't really go in your opponent's jungle before even though that's common practice in like gold solo queue now right mm -hmm. um so there were a, in terms of innovation so if you if you think about uh the peak play like we were talking with the shy he had that and then he also had kind of the innovation alongside Mata that we are talking about with Flame. But he also had a very, very brief kind of time in the spotlight. And that time was effectively 2014. And then he was just butt cheeks after it's that. He's still pretty good in 2013 as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he was good before that, but I mean, his, his, his longevity was, was short. I, I mean, I could tell you even, even when he was on like those fucking MVP teams, he was good in 2012. He was one of the best junglers I played against in the world in, mm. in 2012. Like oh. I scrimmed against his team a lot. Um, and he was like one of the people I was like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, no one ever told me who Dandy was. Like, it was him, and then it was um, I believe his name was Haru. Um, yes, yeah, Haru. yeah, Haru. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was a jungler for for one of those MVP it was teams. Samsung well. later on as well. Yeah, he yeah, was yeah, yeah. Was in, yeah. Yeah. So he was he was the, the other player. Those were the two best junglers I played against um in Korea. Like, I I actually like kind of disrespected um. Uh, Cl uh, Cloud Templar. I never thought Cloud Templar was actually that good. From playing he, against he him, wasn't. he was like, he was like the type of player where it's like you're just winning because your team's better. You're not actually good. Like that. That's how I felt when I played against him. Even though he knocked me out of OGN, you know, like I, I, I didn't put him on the same. He level was a supportive. I, he was a supportive jungler, and he didn't have that much uh, breadth to his play. Yeah, I think I mean, he, was, he was. He was like, like a he could play anything. Player. Yeah, yeah, it was a whatever Trundle Shen Skarner, Shen Skarner, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so yeah. I wasn't so, super impressed yeah, by that. On. Like those were the, Dandy Dandy and, and and Haru were really insane in the early days in season two, even though they just didn't get the chance to really show it. Cloud Templar was just Korean Snoopy, basically. Yep. Yeah, I, I well, never basically, thought Snoopy was that good either, to be honest. Basically, the the thing with Dandy is, and this is the mad understatement in my opinion. i I've, I've never seen any player at Worlds be that far ahead of the competition in the jungle role. I know yeah. people are going to worry about Canyon last year. We'll never know because we never got to see Carsa versus Canyon. So we'll never actually know who was who was li literally the god of the jungle at the time. We don't know. Well, it, I mean, it, it, and also like the final wasn't like, like Canyon ended up ahead, yeah. but he didn't actually like get his, his own advantages that much. It was kind no. of like SFM did fine. And then it's just like, yeah. Dalman was just the better team. So there was, there was yes. plenty of chances for Suning to win games if they were on the same level. It's not like they got completely mechanically outplayed. So I don't know. I, I actually thought that Canyon kind of like, he, he kind of coasted to, to his, like, I think he was probably the best jungler in the world, but I think he kind of coasted to that uh, win. Like it felt like if no him and else SFM good teams, team. it would be. Yeah. That's, yeah, That's why I say it had to be top. You needed top to play them so it could be fair in terms of the teammates. Then we could also, the best. Also, in the peak where we're talking about right here, I mean, you're looking at who else was winning that world championship, and certainly Imp was good, right? But Mata and Dandy were the stars of the team. And like Pawn and Looper, you know, I mean, especially Looper, just really. I, I thought Pawn was fine. Pawn, Pawn was fine. I mean, he was really good in that meta um but and he was good versus faker which is actually like something that's really really True. fucking important like <laughs> well yeah that was the I mean, there were, yeah, the there were there yeah. were there were like a i mean there's there's a lot of discussion because 
for my money, that year was probably the most like stacked single league in League of Legends history because no joke, probably eight of, or ten of the top teams in the world were in Korea in 2014. If you look at the concentration of talent that was there, so it it was harder for Faker to be good. But that's also a knock on Faker that we'll discuss later, which is that he didn't actually win when Korea was at its peak. Uh, yeah, d- d- you know, domestically. So I mean, anyway. I, I would just say that like having a mid laner that did not get completely fucking destroyed by Faker was like enough. <laughs> and the fact that Sean was like the the first guy that you that came around that you're like, wait, he's like kind of even. Like, oh shit, he's like up ten CS in this lane. Like he was like the first player that came along where he, he wasn't getting completely butt blasted. So I was like, I actually you know think Dade was a better mid laner that year though. Be- I, I I mean I just I just like Dade is like choking in his underperformances <laughs> later like take away so many points from me it's like it's like it's like blabber right like if if you're really dominant domestically and then you go internationally and suddenly you're just you're just choking like I view like pressure performance as one of like my highest criteria like if you're not able to perform like as the pressure goes up and up I take you down way on my list which is gonna go into the next jungle yeah. that that I have on my list that I'm not sure if you guys have um, so here's the interesting the thing. This is what's interesting, is after that, we have three uh, people who are on the shortlist, but it's a mixture of us. Like, it's basically me and, uh, I think it's just me and Monty for these next three. So the first one is the one that you're probably going to talk about, which is Monty referencing before, Score, the KT Bullets uh, Mm -hmm. jungler. So why did you have this guy, Monty? Uh, Well, for me, I I think he's probably my number one uh, of all time. So several reasons. Now, you know, it is difficult to talk about role swaps here because there are, you know, are we considering role swaps, which is a, a you know, a, 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 a nod to impact, which we discussed earlier. Uh, but score went from being a very good AD carry to an extremely good jungler that was constantly kind of brought down by his garbage teammates. And the con- really what's so amazing about score is his consistency was just unbelievable. Like the guy who, barely ever had any bad games and even though it took him so long to win a domestic tournament i, I think he still played more games in lck than anyone else he may have been passed by faker recently since he went to the military like uh, a couple years ago but i also think that they were probably the best team at the 2018 world championship and again this is another thing where if double elimination had occurred and they didn't just randomly hit ig in the quarterfinals that we would have been mm-hmm. having a very different conversation about piece his of it trivia so today I published an interview with Young Buck, who was on Fnatic, the team in the final of Worlds. And he says that if KT Bullets had won the series against IG, it would have been an amazing final. And he doesn't even know if Fnatic would have won it back and forth. And that RNG, if they'd have won, would have just won the whole tournament. So actually, like, he also supports the idea that, like, it's not just some hype. Like, I, the problem is this. Fans can't escape what did happen. They think that always had to happen. So yeah. what they do is they go like this. Yeah, it was five games, but the first two were shit, and then IG was about to beat the Nexus. Yeah, that's one possible scenario. That is one yep. possible scenario. What happened the rest of the year when IG played? What happened in scrim? Well, I know, you know that doesn't matter to the result, but like the point is, what were the potentialities? Like so, IG, if, in my opinion, only hit that peak in the playoffs. Like they were way worse when they were playing. Like fucking Soaz was dusting them off in the fucking groups. Mm-hmm. Like, like the people again, you can't just take the results ordinarily. We have to look at how they played. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the best way to like. Like do this is you you go into like recent times right and you 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 think about with a different format let's say lpl doesn't have double elimination and they just have the standard winner bracket format which is what they have up until the top four right fpx three o's yep. rng yep. right and then rng isn't even the conversation we're not even saying are they one yep. of the best teams in the world they yep. they three o rng and you're like look at fpx's level they're so much better than rng how could they ever lose to rng they didn't even drop a game right and then you look in what re- what reality happened with the format with double elimination. RNG battles back, has has two five game series back to back, and then they end up beating FPX, and now they're considered the best team in China, right? Without that happening, like, you don't totally know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. more history would remember that FPX also, was way better. Yeah, also, FPX was the best team in China by yes, far. That's what people exactly. Would say. In terms of like the world's format being dog shit, which it is, like 2018 is the ultimate example of that because effectively we got the best match in the quarterfinals, which was just awful, right? And like yep. it was a super good series. Who wouldn't have liked to have seen another like rematch between those two teams? We never got to see KT versus any of the other like top teams in the tournament in a best of five. We were just robbed. Like the fans are just completely robbed in 2018. So, uh, you know, I don't count that on score. Like, that just sucked in terms of he got formatted by Riot, right? Mm-hmm. And 
you know, he also, if you look at his career, look how many times he was like so close. The last final I casted in Korea was the 2016 summer final where he basically, you know, was one smite away from winning the, the his first title, right? He came mm -hmm. this close and the Tigers got hit their first title instead, right? But he kept coming back. You know, he was in the final again, the next split, right? And then he, he got third place after that. And then he won finally. But his level of performance. And remember, this is a guy whose teammates changed completely mm -hmm. multiple times. Like, he, you know, and he thought you just talked yeah. about like dragging his team I, back. I, I, I Let's think see the, if they can guess, right? Let's see if anyone could guess. Again, fans, if you think you're knowledgeable, when Monty's talking about these teams, like season six summer, he was also in the fi in finals in season five summer. Who were his mid laners those years? You're going to have a hard time. And when you realize it, you're going to get exactly. fucking depressed again, these guys, that's why you know that they are real candidates for Nagne. the greatest because <laughs> yeah, most Nagne of the was 2015, right? Was that 2016 yes. as well? Just summer 2015 when Faker just like body yeah. Nagne. Anyway, mm -hmm. continue. Sorry. I mean, most of the Nagne, people, well, I was just going to say real quick. Nagne was significantly worse than Western midliners at that point. Like Bjergsen was a level far above Nagne. When you saw them interact at Worlds, it was like, you're getting solo kills, 50 CS up. Like, Bjergsen handed Nagne his fucking asshole uh, at Worlds. So, yeah, I mean, that's just some context of how bad fucking Nagne was compared to, like, the Korean goats or whatever. The problem is, a lot of the people that fans are going to put forwards not only won the most titles... But it goes hand in hand, had some of the best teammates, hence they won the most titles. So what you're going to realize is the even the idea that like score could be in this conversation with very few titles. Then you go look at the teammates and you go, holy shit, mate, like your GM just ruined your career. Like you should never even like essentially here's the answer. You, someone else goes to me. It must have been a choker if you lost all those finals. And I go, you dumb motherfucker. He should never have been in the finals. It's the other way around. It's like Aaron Rodgers, mate. Oh, he can't be that good if he loses in those playoff games. What, where he just always scores like 20 points in the defense, that's 37 in like... <laughs> but he taught, yeah, by that logic, he should never even be in the playoffs, should he? Well, well it's also, he was he lost four finals yeah. before he actually won one. And then it was, it was just like, he finally got there when he had good teammates. But the fact that his teammates were just constantly changing, constantly changing, and he was always in the conversation. And I think, mm -hmm. in fact, he should have at least made the finals at 2018 had the format not been awful. Mm -hmm. uh, if not won the entire thing, because I think they were a better team than IG. Yeah, so so what I, I, I think counts against him is the fact that like at his supposed peak, which is like 2018, 2019, is the worst performance that we've ever seen from Korea. So like when he was absolutely peaking, you know, like how you say 2014 was like the absolute height of Korea, that's like when um, the, the league was the hardest to win. So like if you win that league at that period, you get more points for that. I feel like you lose points if you're the best team in Korea in 2018, 2019, because those are the two worst years that Korea's ever had in the history of League of Legends, besides for maybe 2021. But you say that, but again, like would we having that conversation if... IG and KT had faced in the finals and we would have still, and KT had taken second place, right? That's the problem. Mm, I mean, I think that, it, that like what, what you, you lose is like maybe KT was that good, but then you look at like the second best team. Um, sure. You look at the second best team, which is like Africa, right? And they got three owed by cloud nine. So that's like where yep. the issue is, is like the third, the third team at that tournament bombs out of groups. Right. And that's the former winner. That's the, that's the, the, uh, you know, the, the champion of 2017 the champion of 2017 goes one in five in groups, loses to like cloud nine, which is like an NA team, which is crazy at that time. Right. And then the second best team also underperformed. So like the fact that all three Korean teams underperformed, I feel like is where like the argument kind of breaks down is like, okay, maybe KT was that good. <laughs> well, I don't, I, look, I don't think they underperformed. They lost to the eventual champion in a match that was on the cusp of They were the only people to win yeah. fucking games against them. I'm yeah, not missing true. something. G3 owed the well, next two well, rounds. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, the thing is like, also like Fnatic, like Fnatic took two games off, off IG, like in groups. In the right? groups. Yeah. 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 So like for me, like my perception of IG wasn't that they were going to like win the whole thing at that point in the tournament when they played against KT, like they didn't look that, that good. You know, like they looked at that point, my perception was, Oh shit, they just lost to Fnatic. They're probably worse than Fnatic. And then you also consider the fact um, that like IG was not supposed to even be the best team from China at the tournament, right? Like RNG had just gone, got done clapping IG's cheeks. So at that point, you're expecting like RNG to just win in quarterfinals versus uh, versus G2 easily, and RNG is like the favorite to win because they're former MSI champions and everything. Right, Dom just needs to take a toilet break for a sit. So we'll take one now because we're not going to be able to finish this roll in time. So we'll, we'll we'll be right back afterwards and we'll we'll go through the rest. All right, perfect.
Right, we're back. As I said, this is actually a role that has a million people on the like some potential ones between. So what? But again, we do, obviously everyone doesn't have the twenty-minute segment, but we'll go to the next one. Well, the well, next I, one. I, want, I want one more point on score. Fuck I want one more point on score. <laughs> 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 to to address Dom's point, uh, because he was saying like that was the easiest years to win in Korea, but that was the only time that Score had real teammates too. So in in terms of his his performance, I think his individual performance over the years was really good. And in terms of stability, I think it's not really controversial to say that he was the most consistent jungler of all time. Mm. So. Yeah. I'd have to think about, uh, I would have to think about that one more, but I could, I could accept that for now. I, I'm, I'm just surprised. That, like, is there any other jungler in any other region that could be viewed as more consistent? Like, I, would, I would think that maybe Carsa could be in that. Um, oh, Carsa's on my list too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd say Carson would probably be my like in my um yeah like in my conversation for most consistent jugglers of all time because he's played so well across so many different teams even with like super demanding teams right like yep. he's he's had to play with guys that it's like really 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 known as tough to play with and almost no one survives like who survives playing with Uzi and Jackie Love like what the fuck like. <laughs> That's, I think Carson is definitely a strong candidate. <laughs> yep. Let's do it then, because Carson is the next one. Me and Monty had this guy on the list. So Dom's kind of done the... Do you want to say any more, Dom? Uh, no. I mean, I'm fine with this transition. He's somebody I considered okay. to put on my list, but I didn't put there. Okay. Monty, what are your reasons for putting Carson on? So first off, he spent a lot of time in a minor region. And even though it was really... It, it, a lot of it was like... There were many players, including Sword Art and Maple, that he played with that I think elevated his play. So it's not like he was on a team with shitters. I think that overall, his kind of the Flash Wolves were known for their consistent upsetting of Korean teams, their performance in that regard. Uh, I think, as Dom noted, him playing with Uzi and Royal and having to deal with a team that was purpose built around Uzi is v difficult to do and impressive. And then also, having to make significant changes to his play style later on uh, when he joined top and then was playing around a more mid and top focused play style, right? He's playing more around a solo lane, shows his versatility. His overall performances, I think, have been very, very good overall. He's won a major international tournament in MSI in 2018. Has he had the same performance at Worlds? Unfortunately not, when they got upset last year by by losing to Suning. Um, so maybe he hasn't had that peak, but his career, his career longevity is very similar to score and how long he was around. Okay, I agree. Like it's like for me, he has to be in here for the longevity. And you can't underrate the Flash Wolves thing because you have to look at who his teammates are. Like, listen, Maple was a pretty good mid laner. I always said he should have been in the West, by the way, but he would always have been like, you know, like a good mid laner in LPL, but he would have never been the best. Like, even then they had mm -hmm. better players. Sword Art was funnily enough, it Sword Art back then was what people hoped he was now, but isn't, which is like he was just like a really good shot caller, could play certain types of champions and didn't need the AD carry. So that it was kind of like the their version of countering when you can't play like basically he was their matter, essentially, but without the raw mechanics. So he realistically wasn't a mega player. So with those three players alone, you should not be winning as many games against Koreans. Like this, something mental, like four or five international tournaments, this team's, this guy's Flash Wolves teams beat Koreans in the group stage. Here's another little detail no one ever points out there. So, okay, Flash Wolves with Kasa won a Worlds group featuring a Korean team. Right, quick quiz for everyone. Which um, Western team, LEC, everyone loves Europe, which European team ever won a group with a Korean team in? Spoiler, it never happened, right? That's the end of that one. Move on. I'm pretty sure if you go back off the top of my head, I don't think it ever happened ever in history. That's ridiculous. So, you look, then he went to these other two teams. Sorry, his career didn't even end there. He went to RNG. They were like literally, they were tracking to do the fucking Grand Slam of the whole year. And as we say, playing with Uzi Ai, an incredibly demanding player. You think when you're, you think when you play against a team that has forgiven, upset, Uzi Ai, you think the other guys in the other jungle don't know this jungle's going to have to go bottom all the time. I can just base my whole path around where, like, they, that gives you an advantage. And essentially, he has to know. They kind of know what I'm going to do and I just have to execute it. Then after that, he goes to top esports, a team that like literally just looks like a super mix of players that don't even sometimes play together or interact in the fucking game. Knight just does whatever he wants. Jackie Love just plays aggro all the time, no matter what the state of the game is. And 369 either carries the lane or into the fucking game. Like, And he had these guys in position to, again, almost win both the splits. Again, maybe win worlds. Like this guy is like a linchpin player. Now, okay, we'll move on beyond that. Let's go to the next one. 
Next one is me and Monty put diamond procs on there. I'm going to guess this is in the vein of the flame, the mad life picks, etc. Right, Monty? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Basically, yeah, pretty it's pretty much in innovation, opinion, right? Yeah. <laughs> define, define the jungle role hugely. I mean, especially in retrospect now, if we look at who was the best player on that entire like Moscow five gambit roster it was diamond prox changed the way the jungle pathing was done uh fundamentally played the jungle in a different way focused around farming or denying camps to enemy junglers was instrumental in kind of the international wins that that moscow five had so just in terms of sheer effect on the total way the jungle is played in league of legends he was enormous Mm -hmm. yeah i definitely agree with all that like I mean, I, I was somebody who actually got to like compete against him, right? So I got to see firsthand like how 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 um how good he was. Uh, like that was his peak, right? Like that when people talk about Diamond Prox's peak, they're talking about what like season two when they won IAM Hanover, going into worlds of of uh, season two, et cetera. Like that's when this guy's perceived peak was. And I think that like he definitely was good, but I think it's it's hard for me to like to know like how much of it was him innovating and how much was the whole team like innovating right because people forget that like it wasn't just him that counter juggled like darian counter juggled a shitload himself and then they also were the first team that ever like roamed their support and soloed bot lane so i feel like like he gets credit for it because you know he's the role that could do it the most but i think that it was something that was a concept that his whole team understood that other teams didn't understand which was just, like viewing jungle as a mini resource and like understanding the value of Hey, if we're taking away a camp from the enemy jungler, not only are we just getting one camp, but they're also losing one camp. So it's a two camp swing. So like understanding that value and being able to contextualize it. I just think that he played too far back um, to be on the list. And uh, to me, like I'm just not measuring influence as highly. Uh, the only the only person that that I uh, that I think could be like from an influence perspective, like there would be Mad Life. But I think that support in general has like been probably the weakest role in terms of like God supports of all time or like having the best players of all time. So I take it with a grain of salt essentially is what I'm trying to say. I I agree with all those. Unlike unlike Mad Life, I don't think Diamond Prox was ever the best player in the world. Whereas Mad Life Mm -hmm. for a time was in fact the best overall player, I would argue. Outside of role, he means that like, yeah, the total Mm -hmm. best player. Yeah. Okay. Right. Here's the thing. I'll disagree with all that. All I'll say for Diamond Prox is this, is a lot of people don't understand this because I got to do interviews with us. His English got better and better and better. I did translated one, then I did English, then I did English one years and years like later, like only a couple of years ago. And basically I used to read every interview this guy did, every AMA. And what's amazing about him is other people when you talk about innovation it's the most overblown concept of League of Legends it's like oh they came up with a lane swap it's like did they how do I know what they came up with like uh, was that their coach was that them did they see something did the practice partner come up with something or like oh he played this champion right half the time when people say he innovated this champion it's like a champion that was a top lane champion you know four years earlier and then somebody figured out oh it's slightly good now this is how next level Diamond Prox's mind was because I talked to him loads Basically, he was a guy who was an actual savant. And what he would do is he didn't literally look at anyone else in the world who played jungle. He would literally read the patch notes and then look at the champions and almost free of all like societal considerations of what the role was, just go into solo queue games and go, right, I think even though they've just nerfed Evelyn, so it's not an AP champion, I think actually like a bruiser Evelyn would work if I use these. And he would, as a result, again and again and again, just invent new champions and item builds and and comps that they could work like literally just out of only his mind like uh, mm-hmm. no one else is helping him and like i say mate literally the evelyn one if people forget like i think that was like in season four like this is even years later like that the innovation continued even when his teammates were shit and he wasn't as great an individual player like i don't think i've ever seen, like literally he can go with the best koreans in terms of like mind for the game as far as yeah i, I mean tell. one thing i i, I want to also contextualize there though is that there's a lot of those experiments that end up failing that like no one really like counts against him when his team was so dominant for example right like for example i remember he tried to bring out karma jungle when it got like changed in at least in uh eu lcs at the time like you know played it poorly lost the game on and then just like threw it by the wayside so i feel like he was also like one of those players that tried a bunch of stuff like he was he was more confident because of like maybe his team's abilities and the fact that that his team was always good that he had the freedom to try stuff whereas like other players might not have had the same ability because it's like hey man if you don't pick the best fucking juggler you can for this game like we're not making playoffs so i just wanted to say there were like definitely like fails in there too that that i just like like for me i'm gonna count against him 
Yeah. The other thing that I consider when I consider Western players is I engage in a thought experiment as well, which is what would happen if they spoke Korean, uh, which is really important, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of times some of the Western players in these conversations are going to be held back by their region. And so I, I like to at least consider the possibilities that would have existed. Had the, could they have been on an all Korean roster? Or an all Chinese roster. Right. There's sure. then, bizarrely, we've got four outliers. Not he's got oh two God. of them. So what we're going to do is, like, these are only one each. So we'll just let the person who picked them go through. I'm pretty sure they're not going to win, but one of them's contentious. Yeah. So you can imagine, are you ready to get triggered? So Dom had mm -hmm. Bengi. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I, think, I think Bengi is one of them. I think he is potentially the most underrated player that's ever played the game. That's my... Yeah, I think he's one of the most overrated. So there we go. Really? We're on the so, opposite side of that one, yeah. Okay, <laughs> awesome. So for me, like, I think about a jungler and I think about, like, the role of jungle conceptually. And one of the things that I appreciate the most about junglers is, like, understanding how to win the game and being able to sacrifice for your team in multiple different ways, in draft, in terms of, like, gameplay, and, like, being a true facilitator for your team. And I think Bengi is one of the players that, like, he just never got credit when he would actually win his team games. Like, there would be games where he would get... He would get shit picks in shit games and and Faker would like carry the game later on and he would get all the fucking praise. And people would just be like, oh, Bengi, yeah. Like Bengi like fucking carried the whole early game or like got them in a position to win the game. But he never got credit for those games. Like Faker did have performances that could be completely like like discounted. When you, I went back actually and I watched um I watched the season six uh rocks tigers versus skt series i did this on stream with munchables and this was a, a series that in my mind is like the best series of all time right that's the reason oh. why i watched it and i was surprised how bad faker actually played within that series like faker actually did not have a great series but because they ended up winning and because he had like a big out play or whatever um in one of the games people completely were like were completely misrepresenting what happened within the game where i was like you know like faker being being able to to win that series was a lot of of because Bengi was able to take away a pick from Peanut, um, which he wasn't supposed to be in the game for, right? Like the Nidalee thing. And I think that that's super like valuable. Like having a player that has a fucking, like uh, has that level of confidence and is that selfless just shows what Bengi's whole mindset was. Okay. Well, I think first off, that was a mistake, if I recall correctly, where let go Koma by forgot yes, to yes. ban Nidalee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so Coma, so yeah, exactly. So Coma forgot to ban Nidalee, and he's like, "Hey, like Bengi, can you play it here? Because if not, like we're gonna have to give them Nidalee and Peanut gets Nidalee." And he, he, and obviously the like the player is the one that has last say because they're gonna be the one like playing. Like if if, if Bengi goes in that that situation, hey, then we haven't practiced it with it at all. I can't play it. Like I'll just play against it. I think a completely different world happens than what actually happened, where he's like, "Yeah, just give it, give me Nidalee." Like, that's so hard for a player to do that's not even considered, like, mechanically confident. He wasn't the mechanical player at that time. They were using Blank, right? So, not only that, if you look at how the series went, Blank's literally getting shit on every game, and Bengi has to win a higher percentage of his games than anyone else in that 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 series because he's getting subbed in when the games are already going yes, to shit. But unfortunately, Dom, you've activated my trap card, which is exactly why Bengi is such a double-edged sword, which is, yes, he played the Nidalee, right? But... Also, the fact that that was his first professional game on Nidalee is one of his greatest flaws as a player, unfortunately. Like, he was never a complete player at any point in time. And I will, look, man, uh, no one loves PvE League of Legends more than me. I'm the fucking king of loving PvE League of Legends. And I will sing Bengi's praises about his, like, Metal Gear solid new-new performances where he's just running around, you know, past Callista ghosts uh, so that he can get objectives and completely out pathing the shit out of his opponents. I will sing his praises as being the perfect player to play with Faker and the fact that he enables Faker in so many of these occasions. But equally, he is a flawed individual player and he's a flawed individual player because he was never able to play some of these picks. And that's just embarrassing when you have years and years of play under your belt that, and you're right. But, but, but I don't even, I don't even hold that against him because like people are saying, Oh, he can't play those picks. Well, clearly he demonstrated in the most pressure and most difficult situation. One, possible game, ever. Game. One game. Yeah. But, but that's, that's like how you can, that's how you can judge. Right. Because you look <laughs> at, you look at the fact that no, I'm, I'm completely serious about this. So yes, the fact that he played it in that game is so relevant because it shows that not only can he play it in the most tense situation ever, he probably was not playing it, not because he couldn't play it, because his team couldn't fucking play with it, because they were they were so they were so stuck in the mindset of like Faker is the fucking carry that they couldn't like break that mold and be like, oh well, let's let's play a game with like 
Bengi carrying a game on Italy. Let's let's play around anyone else. I think that that was one of the biggest problems with SKT, and part of the reason why they stopped winning at a point is because the, the game stopped being all around mid lane. Once the game transitioned from being about mid lane to being about jungle, SKT is like not the best team in Korea anymore because it feels like fundamentally they don't know how to play that style. And because of like the way the game worked, I think that people were they were so set on what they needed and what a jungler did, what a mid laner did, that they didn't adapt with the game over time, which is why they've like they fallen off as, as an organization. So I think that that Bengi gets discredited for not being able to play picks where he could have played it and it might have just not been possible to work within the team comp because of the players he was playing with and because of the environment that he was in. Uh, here's the thing. Here's my angle on this. I've got two. So one is I actually think the exact polar opposite, which is the only reason SKT won any world championship not called season three is because they hard played around Faker when it made sense to and mm -hmm. let Faker call everything he wanted. So when he didn't so when he didn't need the jungler and the jungler could afford to just farm, he would just say, don't come. I'll pretend like you're there and I'll do all these mad dances near the jungle where I'll make people believe you're about to come out the brush if they come in on me. And if they don't, maybe I just get some free hits on them and they have to go off the CS. Or you know, on this particular account, now I need you to be there. Now you do exactly what I say. I think that Dopa video that got released last year was mega Mega intriguing because I'd heard from loads of the really, really good Korean mid laners. Like Faker isn't just beating us; he's better at CS or he's better on the champion. Like he also just knows how to play the game where it's like he's inside your head. And as a result, like it's like he always has the jungler there when he needs it, and then when it isn't, he always fakes like it's there anyway. And that's not just that you do it twenty four. He's not like Marin; he's not just doing it like an idiot. Basically, what Dopa made the point of right is that if it's even in this series, the season six one against Rocks, I'm pretty sure when you mm -hmm. go back and watch this one particular moment, Faker legitimately sets up an entire gank by faking an area so it looks like Bengi's there when Bengi's pathing a different area then creates a scenario where the other mid laner thinks they can go in on him he has a fight and they use the jungler and get an easy kill right and basically if you watch that game without knowing what Dorper explains about how he was distracting the mid laner and then how he faked this area you would actually think Bengi did that. You would go, fuck, Bengi's a genius. Wow, what a great idea. But if you actually watched the way he was pathing, his path would have made no sense, basically. Like, there's no way he could have known this scenario would happen. Faker was setting it up the whole time. So I think it was the opposite, personally. And I think Bengi was just good enough, and he wasn't even for most years, to actually make Faker be able to work. And there's a reason why they weren't playing Bengi beyond season four. They used to play a blank who was just a mechanical player because, basically, he, they won most of the games when they played him. Like, a lot of people don't know this. They won MSI without, without Bengi playing a single game mm -hmm. they were they hadn't played bengi most of this world until the playoffs and they started to insert him during they, these they games and his they also won that same split in lck without even playing faker in the finals so yeah i mean they were, they were the, like that was the year before it was wrong year. you got yeah, the wrong oh, okay. year it's okay, okay. it's okay 2015 <laughs> yeah wait isn't that yeah but here's the, the MSI? so the rest the rest of the no, they, that was edg 2017 yeah, EDG, i'm talking about they lost oh, okay, edg okay, in okay, the yeah, finals of msi and also that first when they won playing easy oh, was probably yeah. <laughs> the single worst season of champions in terms of overall skill because they were recovering from the exodus in spring mm -hmm. um of that year that ever existed like you say 2018 was bad and maybe it was bad as a whole year but as a single split spring 2015 was pretty fucking depressing and I have one more angle, and this is actually key because I think it counters, unfortunately, some of Dom's angle about like how he played under pressure and he had to come in when he was 0-2 down. Think about this for a second. He was able to watch the actual live game feed of the other jungler pathing for two games, then enter the server and play against him, and it was a player known for choking. That is so OP. No jungler in history has that. They have to play from game one. They're not doing a full review in the break. They're just playing the series, bro. He's watching like us on the stream and going, well, I can see everything on the map and what I'm doing here. Oh, I get to play now. Cool, right. Uh, he normally goes up here and he actually has a tendency. I, I think it's overrated. Down there. I, I think it's overrated because the amount of tendencies, like the amount of blanket, like like things you can come up with in the jungle based off watching like two games is, is not going to be more than like watching the entire season up until that point, right? Like he's saw, seen so many games of, of, of sense. Like uh, assuming that the players are actually doing their due diligence, they're doing VOD reviews on these teams. I feel like, like, one of the worst things you can do is like look at two games from the series and then just be like yeah fuck everything i do up to this point like this is what he's doing within the series and he's gonna do it every single time like i think you still have to just play the game correctly um and you know it goes the other way right like people use the other side of that argument to like discredit times where players got to watch the game and then came in right like so for example i'm thinking of uh c9 versus tl where blabber played the first game and then Svensk Karen had to come in and a huge thing that 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 is talked about there is like, oh, what happens if Svenskeren got to play the entire series? So I think it goes both ways. Like it's 
it theoretically is an advantage, but there's a lot of things that could actually happen um, within that to like, yeah, I mean, not necessarily completely play. Like the other thing is uh, um, we got to see uh, in finals, right? Like Soaz play the, the final game into uh, uh, IG and it's like, oh, well, they had already lost at that point. So, so nothing had changed. Like you could end up being so beaten down at that point as a team that there's no ability to recover no matter what. Like, so I think it's a really hard position to be put in. I don't think it's automatically like, like, oh, well, he got to watch two games, so he's of course he's going to smurf the series. Especially when you consider, like, not only do they choke, like, or they they lose two games. The other thing is that when he came in, like, the coach is fucking up the draft and shit. Like, the, the coach is like putting him on something that he's never even played before. So, like, whatever he's thinking of, like, oh, this is how Peanut plays. This is what he's going to do. Like, he's probably thinking it through the context of like, okay, and this is my job. Like, these are the champions I'm going to be playing in these matchups. He's not thinking like, oh shit, I'm going to play a random Nidalee game. And if you watch that Nidalee game, the amount of like pressure that he had within the game, like he's burning flashes, like he's behind enemy turret. He's, he's forcing so many summoners. He's doing so much in the game. And then like, honestly, I don't even think Fager deserved to win that series. I really don't think Fager deserved to win that series, which is not the interpretation I had when I watched it for the first time in 2016. Plus minus in history, who won the other one more games, Faker or Bengi? Oh, Faker for sure. <laughs> Okay, just saying, because he made that sound at the end there. He fucking saved his bacon, you know. Yeah, and and also, like, again, it was a one-off on Nidalee. There's a reason why they never played it, because he was was just not a a mechanically strong player. It wasn't some, like, in-depth strategy. I mean, but he he was at points, right? Like, so, like, in Season 3, you'd have to consider him one of the strongest mechanics. He's already in Season 3, yeah. The the argument, the argument, yeah, in Season 3, sure. Uh, The argument you're making is, like, Scotty Pippen was the greatest small forward of all time when he was only really... He was good, but he was only truly excellent in his relationship to Michael Jordan. That's a bit uh, of a reach there, Monty. It's a bit outside your purview on that one, man. <laughs> he was a very good player. He wasn't missing. He, was. he was, definitely wasn't the best at his role. I agree. Yeah, That's else. what I'm saying. I don't oh, think there's one other angle. Bad. I forgot to say this. The reason why I gave the angle of, like, I think it was all through Faker is because the, this is the worst thing about the Rocks Tigers versus fucking SKT that ruins the whole discussion is that people only look at the end who won the championship and go, right, they're the best the whole time. Rocks Tigers and, K- and <clears throat> GE Tigers were better than SKT every split except fucking one or something mental, like three out of four splits. They were the better team. The problem is they fucking chalked away the finals every time except when they just played KT and KT did them a favor and beat SKT. So that means SKT weren't the best, but they still won and then would win Worlds as well. Yeah. <laughs> that means so- that the team wasn't that sick. So the problem is one of the reasons they weren't that sick is their jungler was a fucking liability and they had to keep using... They even had another guy called Tom before that they were trying. They were literally saying, anyone out there, is your name not Bengi? And could you have hands at work, right? Please play jungle. And then if we if we have to, we'll put this corpse back in the game. Like, so, I mean, they did that with, like, the entire team, right? So, like... By your logic, I'm just asking. By your logic, you include Koma among the people who who thinks Bengi is mad. Uh, he underrated Bengi. Yeah, I mean, well, it's not that I think he underrated Bengi. I just think that, like, his perception of what the team... Like, I think that he was so, like, dead set on the fact that Faker has to carry every single game, like regardless. Okay. That we that like we can't play in another in another way, which is why I think he eventually ended up leaving the team. And honestly, I don't even know how to view Akuma as a as a coach because they've done a bunch. Of, he's done a bunch of questionable things in recent. But times, but right? if if your theory is that Faker has to carry the game, then why was Koma keep why did he keep putting Easy Hoot in? <laughs> well, I mean, I, that, that, I mean that to me was, was 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 literally like it looked like it looked like an ego thing. It looked like a, oh, we don't need to use Faker because we're yes. so much better than everyone else. That's how I perceive yeah. that was that like because because they were so much so ahead of, of other teams at that point like what's the point of using our like ace if we can beat you with our king you know that's kind of how, how I saw it so there's that and then there's also like the reason I don't fuck with the like Scotty Pippen example is because like the jungle changes fundamentally in what its relation is to the game consistently and sure. like small forward doesn't really like it's not like Small forward sometimes, like, I mean, you can have a carry small forward, right? Like, you can have a LeBron James who's, who's like, a carry small forward, and it's going to be equal in all the basketball metas, right? Yeah. Like, so, like, but to it's not degree, like yeah. that for jungle, right? Like, in jungle, there's metas where you just have to play tanks, right? And you don't have the sure. ability to play carries. And there's times where, where you ha- were... So, like, within the times where Bengi played, I think he was, like, playing well within the role. So, I think that, that Bengi is just really underrated because of just, like, overall what his what its influence on the game was. And it's, like... People just forget when when Faker dropped the ball, it wasn't like it wasn't like random other people would carry. It was normally if Faker 
didn't carry, then Bengi would carry it. It's like those moments I feel like mean so much if you're going to win multiple. Like how many world championships does does uh, SKT win with instead of those four years uh, that they had Bengi, they have Dandy for those four years. All like, of they them? maybe win in season four. You think they win all? Yes. I don't think so. I think I think I think I think Dandy was like so incredibly washed by season five, season six that his fall off was like incredible. That's the problem, Dom. Like I know this is going to be a t- complete intangible, but I cannot judge a player who lives in Korea his whole life, plays in the same team his whole life, goes to China, where literally every fucking Korean pro they don't do it anymore because China's such an ascendant power. Used to always complain in interviews, I can't even breathe here. I fucking hate the air and food. And then they're in a team where this is the era when nobody's speaking Korean. They're, you're just playing with Chinese players and he went to a dog shit team. So the problem is after that year, mate, and he's also made of like 10 times more money that year. I can't know where his head was at. Like to me, that era, that era when he came to NA, I thought I didn't even count that as real. I was like, you, don't, you as far as I'm concerned, you retired when you went to fucking China, mate. It was just done after that, you know. Well, it's it's also, yeah. I, I think, I think you know, I, I casted basically, Bengi's entire career and Mm -hmm. there was never a time where I didn't wish that he could play more champions his champion pool was always an issue season three (laughs) okay maybe season three a little bit but Mm -hmm. also it was a pretty one-sided competition between SKT and also Faker was just so incredibly ahead wasn't wasn't KT pretty close at that point Uh, SKT in summer yes but by the time that Faker had really ascended uh, by mm-hmm. the end of summer and into worlds, there was really no other competition. I mean, it was a pretty foregone conclusion that they were going to dominate the world championship in season three. They come back from season three and Faker, they have a perfect season in winter mm-hmm. after that. Right. So I, I just, and then after that was the 2014 where they had a lot of problems and couldn't win anymore um, and didn't go to worlds that year. Yeah, I, I just, mean, yeah, I, I think that there's I, like not, no one's arguing that he's not good. I just don't think he's the best of all time. It's the problem, Dom. Here's the basic scenario, right? Your mm-hmm. angle is that he was underrated because basically we don't even have him on the list. Okay, by that logic, that you've maybe got a point, right? The problem is this, mate. The reason why we're saying he's overrated is because fans, no joke, have him as just the consensus court. You can't even talk yes. about it. Some <laughs> <Exactly>. people, <laughs> certain people who used to write for ESPN, would even maybe argue he was the second best player of all time, literally using the Scotty Pippen angle. Well, he won six championships in a row, Michael. Like they're actually mm-hmm. using that angle. So that's like to me, I think we're not even like we do definitely have a different contrast in view of the jungle. Of course, you, you play the jungle, you have a different perspective on it. But we're not saying like he was the fucking sh- absolute shit. No, of course not. No. I also agree. Season three is very good. Right, let's bang the other ones out because there's three more, and these ones are going to be pretty quick. So I personally had Yankos, and it's the same argument as Casa. Yep. Like first of all, you just look now at his accomplishments. This guy, a lot of people might not understand this has been in four world's semi-finals with three different sets of teammates. Sit the fuck down, anyone else who's born and not Korean, by the way. Not Korean. I didn't say Chinese. Not Korean. That's unbelievable. That's ridiculous. I so then he did young- that. Yeah, I should have put Yankos on my list. I Andy Elsa has absurd fucking uh, longevity. Now, listen... Sure, maybe he did choke in some semi-finals as the blah, blah, blah. Listen, there's a reason you play the regular season. You don't just play it as seeding for the playoffs. Those are games in your career. Your body of work over your career. It's the reason why you go in the Hall of Fame even if you don't win the NBA title. If you have like a fucking... If you average like 25 points and 10 rebounds for like 15 seasons, you will be in the Hall of Fame at the end of your career in the NBA because you had an incredible body of work. So this guy, like every year pretty much, one of the best Western junglers, always very, very good. Like at one point a mechanical wizard, later on actually bastard, like all the style. Now, here's the problem. He definitely dies on the scenario I said about the top laners. Like, I don't think he was ever the best jungler in the world. Like, that's yeah. a ridiculous premise. So, I can't, like, I'm just naming him because just like Carter, I think the body of work you know, sort of justifies, you know, but, sort but of like in, a, a name in, check, you know. In, in that logic, how can you nominate uh, Yankos over like Bengi just because of the longevity? Is that like the main thing that he's winning out on? Because, like, I would say that Bengi's peak is higher than Yankos. And if you're talking about like, who's the best jungle in the world, you can argue in season three, Bengi was the best jungle in, in the world. There's no season you can actually argue Yankos is the best jungle in the world. Or like, maybe not even second best, maybe not even third best. Like, it's very hard to find a time where he's like, really, right, That's really one peaking. criteria I'll give Bengi. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, but here's the other thing is that Bengi played with better teammates. Like, this is again, the thought experiment of what would happen if Yanko spoke Korean, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. But I mean, like, uh, if you just look at individual level, right, like you, you can have players that are not even close to like 
on the best team that are considered like the best in their role at a time. So I just like, for example, like before Knight had even been to a world championship, people were talking about him being the yes. best mid laner in the world. Um, so that's like an example of, of that happening. I just feel like Yangos has, I mean, so there's, there's all the splits that he like that he didn't win for me. Right. So like for me, he didn't, he couldn't win on his own. He needed to have great teammates in order. Wait a minute, to who, win, who wins from jungle on their own in an LEC? Who wins from from jungle on their own? That was your LEC? fact that you just gave. Yeah, which jungler won on his own from jungle in the LEC? Like without having like the best teammates? Well, I, I mean, don't I, know because that was your criteria. I'm just asking. Well, no, no. So I'm not saying that that you have to have like like he won with all the best teammates. But that's my problem. Is like other yeah, people. Yeah, he didn't won. win when he had Ryu. He didn't win when he had Overpow. I mean, Is I he think supposed to. Of, I think I think some of those splits he 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 should have had like he should have placed higher than he did, and I think that he choked himself in a lot of those finals where the team. Oh, place I agree. Yeah. So so like for an example of a player like I think that that I mean El Yoya didn't have like the best teammates this this split like I this mean, is one of the most garbage splits I think overall though let's be real. I'm mean, sure. I mean, like I don't think Trick had the best teammates when 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 he won, and Trick was like the MVP of the league. Yeah, that's not a terrible one. Yeah, I'll give you that one. Uh, so, he still had so, books. They all had yeah. a god tier mid laner, by the way. Yeah, god tier mid laner. But I mean, I think at, at points, like, uh, let me, I, I would have to look through Yangos' entire career. I know my perception for sure was that he was underperforming in games that mattered. So, I, I, mean, I, I, think, I mean, I think we all agree, and I don't think he's going to be winning this. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> well, well, no, no. Well, well here's, here's another one. It's like, Go on. I mean, tw 2018, right? Like, 2018, like, I feel like his team, like, I mean, he had Perks as a mid laner, right? Perks was probably the best player. Uh, he was the GOAT in the West at that point in, in, in 2018. Um, wonder top lane. I mean, obviously he had Harnan, Harnan would did, but I don't actually think he played that well himself in, in like the finals when it really mattered. So I feel like, like, yeah, I mean, obviously you can't win with no teammates, but I think he had decent enough teammates that he could have performed better than he did in those years. Like, I think he, he was underperforming in, in clutch, uh, moments, but yeah, I mean, I just, I don't see a, a point where I could say that he's like really done something any of the other like for me like i would say dandy's probably the the best of all time and then for me i'd have bengi second and then i guess i would probably have like maybe like canyon or somebody like third like that's probably how i would do my my like or top three. so disrespected hey, let's get these last <laughs> yeah. two going quickly because basically they're both monty picks and he's just throwing them in his name so just you just give the reasons why Monty. There's, you put ambition and tian so two people have won worlds obviously yeah, so Ambition, I think that if you look at that Samsung roster, I think you could definitely make a case that that Samsung roster was probably the worst team to to win Worlds, yeah. um, at least in kind of the more contemporary era. So that would be a knock against him. I also put Ambition because you have to remember that he was also a very top tier mid laner and like a top two mid laner in Korea at certain times and made a like score, made a really compelling pivot uh, over to the jungle role. And I think in general, he was a, He's like Bengi in that he was more smarts than mechanics by the end of his career. But I think that if you had to say, like, who was kind of carrying that Samsung team when they hit their peak, he would definitely be in the conversation for uh, you know, him and Ruler. Yeah. Well, Ruler's on my ADC list, so mm -hmm. it would be him and Same. Ruler who I would say oh, were the standout. But whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> <laughs> him and Ruler were were kind of the standout player per, players on that iteration of the Samsung roster, and I think he does. He's definitely like he's definitely like a Hall of Fame level player when you consider both his mid lane and his jungle careers, but. Maybe he didn't actually hit the same peak at uh, jungle that he hit in the mid lane earlier on, but also he played jungle in a harder era and then had a higher kind of result, you know, a better result in the end in, in the jungle by winning worlds. So I think he's just kind of, I put it through him in there just as a conversation starter, not that I think he is, but I think he deserves, okay. uh, he deserves like a shout out there, right? I, th I think that he got by on like game under understanding and things like that because yep. like, he, I mean, he played in the, the he era where. He, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he he was like Bengi, except like he didn't ever like actually like I, for me, like I don't remember the games in the world championship in season seven where he was actually like mechanically like playing like a champion or like carrying games. It felt like Ruler was carrying literally every single fucking game that they played. So like I think that he was just good because he like I mean, it was trackers knife meta and he just knew how to like play the Korean system and like put down good wards and he like yep. understood where he should be on, on the map. But I, I, I just think that like number one, he wasn't good in the jungle for long enough. and then. Number two, like, I think that he played in the most, like, he played in the least skilled jungle meta that there ever was in terms most of, like... Most formulaic one, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. That's right, fair. Why, why did you put Tian on the list, Monty, and then we'll just move on beyond that? 
So I put Tian on the list because I think in terms of peak, I think he had a really impressive run at the 2019 in 2019 overall. And mm -hmm. I think that he was in pre in IG, it was the Korean players in the solo lanes that I think were carrying. And then in FPX, I think it was him and Crisp that were the most impressive performers at that specific world championship. And this is another one where I think we kind of have to, he did fall off you know, after that. And I think he's only just started to kind of maybe regain some level of his form right now, but he's another one who I think I want to see for another couple of years before trajectory. But, angle. Yeah. Trajectory wise, I think his trajectory is right. pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. And I think his peak at, at 2019 was very impressive, but I wouldn't, you know, seriously consider him. Yeah. I think he had, like, he had a peak. I, I think he had a present peak. I think he was, I think he was too bad in, in the pre in the the following year for it to like really yes, that's count. a big knock <laughs> like he 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 only has like his peak like when you look at like gandy's peak dandy's peak was like a year i would say where like he was good from the beginning of, of season four and he was like already like solid where i feel like tien's peak was like just like finals and, and worlds and then it's just like hard fall off he's no longer yep. in the conversation for even like top five junglers in in lpl so I think he's he might be making a comeback though. We're gonna see the rest of this year. So. Well, I don't know. I think Bo's gonna fucking play over him. To be honest, I think Bo is like the next uh, the next generation of Chinese talent. Well, then he'll never be in this conversation again. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, now we'll do the vote for who's yeah. gonna be there. I will just say by the way, just so people know where we're at, because Dom asked that question. I know he actually was just asking it's a rhetorical question. Like, if you have Dandy instead of Bengi, how many championships do you win? But just so you know where we're at, like basically, I don't think almost any Korean team, except in the latter years, ever had the best players. Like, I genuinely think if you could have gone back in time in season three and you just make a team that's like flame top lane bang, uh, dandy fucking jungle and fake commit you can put anyone in bot lane they win every single fucking title yes. i mean it would literally like, be unbeatable <laughs> jungle is the type of role where like the the re like this is what ends up happening the more you win the better people are gonna say you were oh, like it doesn't it doesn't matter but like yes. other roles it happens but not to this degree right like right. for for you to be on this list as jungle, you have to have won a world championship. Like that's essentially what it is, but it's not the same for AD. It's not the same for top. Like we said, Sveb was the best. But Lies, Sveb I have score on there. <laughs> okay. But like, but, but for me, like the other people that, that you're arguing, like it's like, it's, I think, do you have score over Dandy? You think score is the best jungler of over time? Oh, we're going to do that now. We're going to just do it. So you want to just do it? Right. Okay. So Dom yeah, sure. has Dandy. Yeah. Yep. Right? I Monty have score, has... but because I think I have a different, like if I was arguing for peak, I would argue for Dandy, but I think score is consistency across all of his teams, across all of his teammates is frankly fucking unreal. The fact that he made a, a role swap in order to get there. And the reason why people, you know, the fans of the show are going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about, Monty, with score is because they never, you know, if they were only watching international competitions with Korean teams, you would never fucking know. You would never yes. know. And everybody's going to be like, well, he didn't win a championship because he lost his first four. The fact that he even dragged the corpses of some of those teams to the finish line is impressive in and of itself. So, I mean, look, I'm also the biggest score homer of all time. So I, I recognize my bias, but I, I would mm -hmm. concede Dandy if we're talking about peak and we really are valuing that world championship win. But also, I think this is a very different conversation if game five goes KT's way and they win the 2018 world champion. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the peak is like relative, right? Because like people can be like, you can peak and be the best jungler in the world. And that could, and that could just be like, oh, well you peaked once you were the best jungler in the world at one time. Like one thing that I'm considering in this peak is like how far his peak was over the second best jungler, like any other period that you go to like, who's the second best jungler in the world? Like there's going to be like a bunch of names you're going to throw in where it's contention. We're like in season four, you cannot say anyone was even remotely close to like, to where, where Dandy was, right? Like, like who else would you have in that conversation? Well, spirit Scott wasn't playing jungle yet. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, spirit, spirit, maybe insect, maybe like these are the names that you, you throw in there and it's like, get the fuck out of there with that. Shit. Yeah. You know, we're that's close. very true to to dandy so i think that his peak was so high like i'm not going to view peak like as the number one thing right because like the shy out peaked smeb to me like his his peak was you know higher than whatever um but but if we i would argue that score was the best jungler in the world for more years than dandy was yeah you just didn't see him at international play I mean, yeah, I, I can say that, that 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 could be true. I mean, I would have to like completely. Let me make, let me make a let me make a comparison for you. He sure. is more or less like what Pioshik was this last season on LCK, in LCK, right? Mm -hmm. His team mm -hmm. was kind of butt cheeks, but he was probably you know he's in conversation for being the best jungler. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. Here's what I'll say because obviously I'm gonna have to be the deciding vote here, right? 
I basically, spoiler, I was picking score as well. So actually, we violated Dom's rule. We've picked a good jungler who'd never won Worlds, basically. I'll just say this. Here's one reason why. Since Dom loved that little MSI rant he went on, there's not a single Worlds ever in the history of League of Legends, except maybe last year and the year before when Korea had its issues. So only two times ever, and that wasn't mainly score's peak. He retired after season eight. They're the only two times, in my opinion, ever when LCK was not as hard to win as Worlds. So as a result, I think LCK was the hardest tournament in the world. And this guy, he ready for a stat. Forget when he was AD carry. As a jungler, he had his team's top three in the playoffs of LCK, because remember it was a gauntlet, seven times. Mm -hmm. And half of those are garbage teammates. So and they I, changed I, all his teammates multiple like, times. When you're, as Dom <laughs> said, they changed the role every year. They changed the aspect. You have to play different champions. What if they flip from a meta where you have to play a tank to a cat? It doesn't matter. He's still top three, top three, top three, top three, top three. Put anyone next to him. Top three, top three. Any top laner, any fucking mid laner. Top three all day long. Any support player. So as a result, like, I think there's the body of work on this one, I do think at one point in time he was the best in the world, in my opinion, like Path yeah. and et cetera. I just, I, I'm going to have to outvote you. I'm putting for score on this one. Well, I, I just want to put this to you because one thing you, you oh. always say about like some Western players is like, well, if you are that good, then like there's some onus on you to like find a good fucking team. Like, why do you always have shit teammates? Why don't you leave the <laughs> team, team and like? Was badly oh, no, managed. no, no, let, let him do it. Yeah, let him do this one. Go on. Yeah, no, no, no. But but essentially, it's something that that we always talk about, right? Like, which yeah, is yeah. like, if you are in your peak, like you need to be able to like figure out how to win, and like a real champion will be able to like, you know, find an either like find another team, okay. for example, or like yeah, yeah. move, or guess. like they'll be able to to like influence people to create a team that works for them. And it's like, where is that argument? Where does score fall into this, this type of argument? With yeah, teams? Got... yeah, go for it. Oh, okay. Well, my response would be this. Unfortunately, that only works if you're, if you're a Westerner. Only a Westerner thinks that way. Only expect here and perks and these and reckless go, bring me this player. Or I'm going to leave. You know what? Fuck this team. We're going to come second. I'm off now. I'm going to this team now. There's only two moves in Korea. You either hope your general manager and your owner and your coach just get you the players. If they don't, by the way, they might even, you might win Worlds and they might just put a rookie in and go deal with it. You don't get to say shit, by the way, because that's the way the honor system works. Secondly, your alternative is go to China. Now, if anyone thinks, by the way, players picked all those moves, you don't know what you're talking about. Half their fucking team managers acted as their agent. And that's why some players got paid a king's ransom and would win Worlds and go to an average LPL team or a below average LPL team and go, so even now I can't win and I'm with all Chinese players. So basically the problem is, in Korea, you notice they don't do that generally. I know in the latter years, they sort of have. I mean, we, we, saw, we, saw, we saw a super team, right? Like we saw him join the super team eventually. But yeah, that was, was in the latter years. Yeah, but the problem but is- when he was on the super team, they didn't, they, like, yeah, I mean, it just wasn't what you'd expect. Sure. I agree. If you go season three, season four, season five, like a Korean player has very little agency. And by the way, mm -hmm. wouldn't even conceive of having it. Like, I'm not joking. This will sound edgy to people, but essentially teams and even the players themselves sort of consider themselves owned by that team. Because here's the thing. Their logic goes like this. They put me on. They put me in the league. They paid me the salary. That coach is the reason I'm the best. I know we wouldn't think, because you're a fucking sick player, but unfortunately they did sort of think that. So that's why a lot of these players just never left their teams. Faker stays in his team forever. Scott is in his team forever. It's it's also that you have to look at the time period in Korea in which it was. And if you go back to Brood War, for example, if you look at the history of Korean esports, there are very, very, very few player transfers in StarCraft history, in StarCraft yes. 1. And it's because once you're on that team, once Flash is on KT, once Boxer's on SKT, uh, they just stay there forever. And so in the early days of League of Legends, it's much more common now Yes. for Korean players to swap around. But, you know, up until like maybe three, two, three years ago, those players were not moving off those rosters ever. Oh, I mean, I mean that's what we saw. Like we we saw the, the the like Prey and Gorilla move, right? Like where they went from like Rocks to Longju or whatever. That was uh, shocking. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> but I mean, I, I feel like other people were willing to like take like that upon themselves. And it feels like, I mean, maybe, maybe it's, it's the point where, you know, he feels so like, so uh, I guess, um, so like thankful or like he he's I, I don't even know the word to use for it but he's like so stuck in that mindset that, that he, indebted, like he feels like he's yeah, indebted to them yeah, yeah that's a good way to say it. he's so indebted that he wasn't willing to do it yeah. but i mean I, I just feel like that can be done and we saw other players do it even within korea and you know when he did do it the results weren't what you would hope for and you can By argue the way, like yeah, yeah, the validity yeah. of those results for sure because obviously best of ones yeah, or yeah. not best of ones but a uh, single elimination in worlds but yeah i mean he didn't get it done when he had theoretically I mean, all I the guess. pieces i think in 2016 and 2017 he was the best jungler in the world both years 
And I'll just say this. Listen, I'm with you, Dom. I think Pawn was pretty good at one point in time. He's definitely overblown because he was just had like the head to head with Faker. But Pawn, who was in that super team, was fucking garbage. He's made there's a reason why they had to replace him with Yukon and then one day else he came in. Like yeah, Pawn at that like... point was a man. This is years after he'd already been hospitalized while he was an EDG mm-hmm. and that whole story where he ran to the stadium or whatever. Like the problem with that is like, mate, it is a mid the mid lane game. Like I always look at everyone else in the game and look who their mid laner is. Like, if you can win without, that's why I think Smeb is a god. Like, I don't know how you did that. Yeah. That's a miracle. To me. <laughs> anyway, amazing. Sam, I'm voting score on that one. So, okay, we'll go beyond that now. We'll go to obviously a role everyone's interested in. And spoiler, there's not a massive amount of people because we're in the mid lane, aren't we? Now, I will say this, right? Let's not spoil it beyond this, Dom, okay? So try and answer without, like, referencing other players. Just do it just for this mm-hmm. player. So, of course, all three of us have Faker. So, who, what do you think about Faker, Dom? What do I think about Faker? Um, well, I think he's just, I mean, he's, he's the goat, right? Like he's the best player that that's ever played the game. He's hit a peak for, uh, he, he had a peak that was like the longest peak I think we've ever seen. Like, I think that not only was he the best mid laner in the world, but I think he was the best player in the world up until maybe season eight, like maybe halfway through season eight and maybe even longer. Like, I'm not sure like how hard, how long you'd consider it, but he was, he was the best for so long. He played pretty much as well as you can. And I mean, like he was the, he was like pretty much the main protagonist of League of Legends as, as a whole. So to me, I just think that like, because he was so dominant, there's almost nothing that you could contend with, right? Like he has the highest peak. He has longevity. He has the, the, the biggest trophy case of tournaments that actually fucking matter. Like what, what angle could you he say per- someone is better he, than him? He's at? ultra clutch when it matters yeah, too. Of like course. his best performances come in finals. Um, yep. he, he, not he, semifinals. That Rock Stigers, uh series, not the best. <laughs> not, <laughs> well, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> um, but, that said, um, I, I'm just going to play devil's advocate for a minute just because I think there are some now in retrospect very interesting things because it's it's easy for me to say he was the best mid laner from his very first game in Korea, which is true. That's just mm-hmm. fucking he true. shit on Ambition's face. I he shit on amb- Ambition's face. And, and also Ambition first- like evolved his, did a Kazakhs evolve right in front of him and gave him a free kill. But you know what? Maybe, maybe. Sure. <laughs> like- sure. But also, you have to look at the rest of that year, and especially that split. He literally caused MVP Blue to forfeit the game. He crushed them on LeBlanc so hard that they literally quit the game at 20 minutes rather than continue to play against him. Mm -hmm. Um, His accomplishments are extraordinary in that first year of 2013, even through the end of 2013 when they had the flawless season. Now, the knock I will say against Faker is this, and this is a very real knock is that in the most competitive mid lane pool, which was 2014 and 20 uh, spring and summer, which is when Pawn, Dade, Rookie, all these guys were at their peak, he didn't win uh, and he didn't go to Worlds. So I think that's really hard because it was when the competition was the stiffest in that role in Korean history, he and a lot of it was his teammates sucking. Yeah, it's well, that, that, that's what I'm gonna gonna go to yeah, imme- like, immediately, right? Because season four summer is like that's when Piglet and Pooman do like Piglet literally sucked. had they like were terrible, like a point one five <laughs> KDA or something. They shit. were terrible. Like, like yes, his bot lane sucked. <laughs> so I mean, what do you expect? Like Beggy was having end, a bad year. You know? I mean, at, at the end of at the end of the day, when you're playing League of Legends, I mean, Beggy was having a bad year. Nowhere close to as bad as the bot lane. Like the bot lane was like literally yeah, like the, get the bot them lane off was, the fucking team the immediately. Yeah. So. Like, there's, realistically, no one could fucking win with those teammates. Like, that is just too bad so. yeah. of, of like, uh, your teammates' performances to possibly carry. Uh, th- like I said, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Um, I want a devil's you... advocate then. Oh, okay, keep going. I thought you were finished, Matt. Yeah, and then also, I think later on, uh, later on in his career, up until you know, present day, he's still good, but there's now many more debates. Like, in the in the more recent years, Rookie has been a better player. Sure. I mean, you're now bringing that up, so we won't go into that because that's going to come up in a minute. Basically, I'll just only count the faker points. I actually think that that narrative that like he was the best from season three and season eight, it's like, I think that's absolute bullshit on like a level that's mental. Like personally, season three, probably the best year anyone's ever had, like relative to mm-hmm. all the other players. Yeah, super sick. Season four, like, listen, I can make all the same arguments. His teammates weren't that good. Like, yeah, I also think he was like a little bit worse. I don't think he was terrible, but again, just teammate gaps too big. He can't do anything at that point in time. So... Still pretty good. Season five, uh, I think it was very, very good. So I'll yes. give you basically mm-hmm. like, I'll give you two and a half years there. Every year beyond that, 
they, what happens is they win Worlds or go to the finals and people, or they win the split and the people do the same thing, right? He must have been the best. I think there was tons of times he wasn't that good. Like, I think off the top of my head, like, I think if, if I remember right, like, I think maybe 2017 World MSI, he was like just average and fucking up a bunch of games. It's just that at Worlds, he did the hero carry, so everyone remembers that. He wasn't that good in some of the splits as well. Season six, like, as I say, I, thought, I, I agree with you. I thought he had some dodgy moments at Worlds, quite frankly. Some moments where normally he would just carry. And there was times where, listen, I can't say like anyone was better in Korea. But this is my issue, is I think actually, and we can go to the next one, because interestingly enough, that is the only person Don put because he believes there's just nobody else in this category. Yeah, I don't even think but, there's an argument. No, but me and Monty have rookie. Now, here's the interesting thing for me. The reason why I set it all up like that is because I even went back and tried to think of, try and shadow box at that. Because sadly, every time SKT won, it was the media that did what you were talking about. They said, right, it must have been fake. He must have been the best. And therefore, he's the best in the world. And they, they put him back to his old status. Happens all the time in sports. If you're the best player at one time and you win again, you go straight back to your old peak. You don't go to where you are now. So my problem is this. I genuinely think if I have a gun to my head and they say, who had the most years and elite level in mid? I pick rookie. Individual really? player. Which, which years? Mid. Season 8, 20, season 2014. No, before that, nah, I'm not going to go that far. I would go like season no, six, tw- season seven, season eight. When they won, season six, season seven, season eight, parts of season nine, parts of season uh, ten. I, I, I don't think season seven. I think season seven was I like that. That's where I, I disagreed with you um, when you were talking before. Was I think season seven he actually played really well and he got hard teammate gapped and he still like did the hero carry and he was doing one it, tournament. Like, I mean, sure, but I mean, they want to get into the tournament. And then, like, I mean, I don't know what, what a guy can do when his teammates are running it. It seems like Huni was so destined to lose that fucking finals and, like, lose random games. So, for me, I think that he was still the best. It's just, like, his team just wasn't what people expected, right? Like, Huni wasn't as good as people expected. Peanut, I think that that's the main season where, where people got off the Peanut hype train. Because up yes. until that point, it was like, he's the best jungler in the world. It just sucks that, like, yes. he has to play against Faker, right? Yeah, yeah. And then he joined Faker... And then he was the reason Faker was losing. And I think Faker wasn't 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 underperforming in season seven. I think Pino was worse. I think Cooney was super volatile, and that just ended up being uh, the biggest issue there with, with that team. So I think that that if you're going to go years, I'd say Rookie is the best in season eight. I would say he's probably the best in season nine. But he can't be the best say, in season seven because of Worlds. I just I think Faker was so good, and I think so. I think not only that's Faker just was a, good, here's my problem. I think you win so. I think you play like fifteen games to win Worlds. The LPL is a million games. Like, mm-hmm. got, Rookie was, uh, like, listen, Rookie used to literally just carry everyone. He used to do it yep. with no jungler. He did it when he, when he was changing up the top mm-hmm. laners and waiting for them to get good. He didn't have, by the way, here's the other thing. He didn't have fucking Jackie Love most of those years. He used to have jokes yep. like the kid or whatever the fuck that guy. He's just called kid. kid. I've called him yeah. the kid or whatever. Yeah. 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 And you wouldn't even yeah. be able to name his support players, put it that way. So, mate, he was genuinely no joke. I know they didn't give them for every split or we can't find them. Like, he could have no joke been like an eight time LPL champion. MVP or something mental like mm-hmm. an LPL or listen I know internationally they weren't as good but the average level depth of the league was always good from about season 5 onwards they already had like a lot of strong t- playoffs was always a nightmare in that region it's why sometimes you'd have random teams like EDG and WE win and you're like but what the fuck they don't even have the great players they would just win sometimes randomly yeah yeah, and I think even in Faker's more recent history, when LPL has been a more competitive league, which has stopped Rookie from maybe having the same level of domestic results that Faker has. Now, I think Faker peaked harder, but I, I think Rookie's consistency is just extraordinary, especially when he has a teammate like the Shy, who's like feast or famine. His mental must be insane. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, if I was looking at Rookie, I would say that he was the best mid laner in the world season four, maybe. Maybe season four. I mean, I think that when he won with KTA, that was like he was peaking pretty hard. It's, yes, he peaked super hard for a brief time in season yes, four. But yes. also, KT Arrows was probably the worst team to ever win. Wait a second. I, need, I now realize something. That, oh, fuck. I've just realized it now, Dom. Now I know what some of the dispute in this call has been. Right? Unfortunately, when I meant like they're the best player in the world in season eight, I mean for all of season eight. You're meaning at that point in time, right? And now I get the uh, what the dispute is. Because, for example, no. to me, that that's why the faker one in Season 7, I'm like, yeah, it was at Worlds, but for the rest, nah, I don't think so. So, I mean, for the if you took look at the entire year... And the I mean, they won, they won MSI that year. They won the finals that year. I mean, I think that he definitely, like, wasn't playing, like, like at his peak level the, the entire time. But I would say that, like, if you were averaging out the entire year, I would say that Faker was still the best in Season 7. Like, I would say, for me... Accomplishments wise, yeah. No, just like oh no, I'm not. I'm not even viewing accomplishments. I'm saying average overall level of play. If you go from 
the first game you played to the last game you played, you take every single player, you do that exercise, and then you're like, who had the average, average the highest it's average? That's what I'll do. Yeah, yeah. Here's I what I'll do, though. I just want to know if they watch this VOD. The people who are like the LPL, like hardcore enthusiasts, the ones who just want, just give me your thoughts on season seven specifically. I want to know, do you think Rookie was the best mid laner? Because I'd love to know what they think, actually. But anyway, that's just by the by. Right, okay, yeah. so those are the two main candidates for the shortlist, by the way. We're basically going to vote between them in a minute. But there were a couple of people... They were both from Monty, so he can do this. He just chucked it. <laughs> By the way, I understand why now, because he said before he wanted extra names, right? And obviously, there aren't really other names for that. Like, yeah. no one else Korean yes. needs to be on this. Realistically, I mean, yeah, yeah, like, realistically. who else would you put? Like, Caps, maybe? No, no. Monty put Knight and Perks. So, uh, Knight is the same reason I put some of the other names on the list. In the that trajectory. The trajectory is yes. good. But obviously, it's, it's really yeah. hard. It's much harder in mid lane than in other roles because of how durable both faker and rookie have been like yes. you know to do this rebuild after rebuild after rebuild yeah if years course. from now okay so yes. i just threw that in as kind of like the the chinese goat the, the chinese greatest mid lane right. potentially mm -hmm. yeah. um you could make maybe a Zhao who like call on that one too i mean there there's other arguments you could yeah, make sure. but knight is on that trajectory but i'm not going to make a serious argument for it now the reason i'm saying is the same angle for western angle right yeah, again, it's a role swap thing, unfortunately. It's like the same shit we were dealing with with Ambition and Score um, because he did kind of have results in different positions. But I think people, and my question is always like, what would happen if Perk spoke Korean? Would be, you know, an amazing sure. fucking... I, I actually think he would be worse. That's my take. I think that that part of the reason that he was Because so they wouldn't dominant, let him play how he wanted to play, you think? Yeah, was that he was right. able to approach it sure. with a unique mindset. And I feel like once you go to Korea, you are now or in Chinese. Korean League of Legends. Like, or Chinese. Yes. If he wasn't a Western player, okay? Mm -hmm. I think Chinese but, is more open than, than yeah, Korea is. Sure. Okay, so let's say Perk spoke Chinese. What would, what would happen in that scenario? And really, the reason that I think Perks is interesting is that he made uh, two MSI finals, winning one with completely different teammates in different roles right and there's there is kind of in terms of an all-round player like perks is very fascinating mm -hmm. even though we might not argue that if we were to isolate him to the mid lane role and just look at mid laner skills would we consider him to be on the same like level in terms of champion pool or mechanics or whatever is as faker or rookie no but his intangibles are so huge and the fact that he can do it with all these different his leadership qualities are so huge and he's been doing it in the west made a world's finals as well like he definitely deserves to be at least in the conversation because he has been winning international tournaments or making it to the finals of international tournaments in a what is mm -hmm. clearly a weaker region yes. yeah for sure I, I think that he gets a lot of like points but i mean part of the reason that i'm happy that he's that he's european is because I mean, he's the type of person where I feel like he got to like build the whole thing. Like he got to be like, hey, I want these players on my team. Yep. Bring me these types of guys. Um, and then like, this is the approach that I want to have. He had so much control. And I feel like he's that- He's the GM. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's, he, he, is, he is actually the GM. Yeah. Uh, unironically, like I, I really do believe that. I agree. So I think, I think yeah. that his like ability to like have his own freedom, which was partly because he was in EU, is part of the reason why, why he's so great. But yeah, I mean, I just think that like, the problem is when can you say Perks was the best? Like, I mean, all the other things fall fall apart, right? Yes. Like, yep. When yes. can you say he's he's the best? Like, maybe I could put him on the list for like fourth or fifth best, but I mean, I think well, it's really the, hard. The, the problem with Perks is that it's more his intangibles, right? That's yeah, he's a that's leader. Like a he's a leader, so it's it's a little rough. Like maybe if he go, has a coaching career later on, like he might be considered for something like that too. But I I was just putting it there because I think he. It was an interesting conversation to have, not because I believe that he was actually number one. Yeah, Can we all I, vote Faker the best mid laner yes. of all time. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, we'll do that one. But, but also, go. rookie could overtake him in a couple of more, years. It'll be a nice. Yeah. yeah that's when well, it could I be mean, interesting. Because by the way, Faker looks washed now, and rookie's still pretty good. No, I, I think rookie looks pretty washed this year. I think that he was he was a lot worse uh, in LPL this split than he was previously. Like was also last year, also though. in terms of ascendancy, the other player I want to put on that list is Showmaker because I think Showmaker. Mm -hmm is still extraordinarily fucking good, is better than Chovy, and like... Do you think, could... think Showmaker is better than Chovy right now? I think Chovy's better personally, but that's just me. I All think right. Chovy's better too. You, you think he's better based off last what? I think that Showmaker had less to work with when they made the roster change on Dom One, and I think his individual decision making and champion pool continues. To... Monty means relative to the past Dom One, there, not Chovy's yes. team. Yes, yes not, not Chovy. Obviously, Chovy's on a worse yes. team.
<laughs> yeah. I mean, Cho- Chovy has has people that are literally like yes. they are doing the the Pooh Man do Piglet season I, I, four. I, I agree. I agree. I agree. <laughs> All yeah. right, put it this way. But I, I'll be very quick on that one. Yeah, basically, I, I like we'll have a discussion in a few years on that one. The Shawmaker versus fucking um, Chovy one. I personally kind of like. I kind of have been won over to the LS side as the years have gone on because like basically he is just like the Korean frog. I mean, it's just the monster farmer. That's all he does. Just out farm you every single game. And doesn't matter what you, every champion he does. Except he's even more ridiculous. Yeah, but he's, he he also has that like killer instinct that Froggen didn't really have, where he'll just like kill you multiple fucking sure. times. Like he'll just do that shit and just end up super huge. And then his teammates just hate him for some reason. Like I wonder what Chovy says in comms to his teammates to make them do what he does. Like he literally must be talking about their mothers, their children, like their fathers, <laughs> their sister. Like I'm a fuck your sister after this game, Morgan. And he's like, okay, well you're not winning then. And then he just runs it down. Like something must be happening in comms for like them to, to actually like not let this guy win. Here's my problem. I personally do think Shawmaker, he might be the best player on the team, but he is also a product of his team in my opinion. Like I think if you just throw him into a team like Chovy has, he's not doing this shit. He's not winning the MVP. So that's just my opinion. Anyway, anyway, obviously we gave that a faker, right? Let's go to the bot lane now. So again, there's a couple of obvious ones here, but I will just say, interestingly enough, right? Basically, we all, the only, per, there's only two people that we all put. So one of them is the obvious name. It's Uzi Ai. It is the Chinese player who played for basically most versions of Royal. And then there was the year in OMG that we don't talk about. So Dom, start us off on this one. Uzi Ai. Um, I mean, Uzi, I, like number one, he was competing in a much worse region and still able to like carry games versus top Korean teams. Um, at the time, I mean, he made two finals back to back, uh, insane mechanics. Like, and like, I think that he hit the highest level of AD carry where like, when you look at other players on the list, they're going to be more, um, like the traditional AD carries where, you know, yes. they get all the gold and they don't take much risk. But when, yes. when Uzi was peaking, it's like, he's somehow the first one in the fight and the way that he played, like his ability to walk forward, output as much damage as possible while also dodging forward, but also dodging skill shots and like playing to that level is the highest we've ever seen. So I think that that uh, just like his peak mechanically, like the only thing you can take away from this guy is accomplishments, right? The fact that he didn't, never won Worlds. He won he won LPL, he never won Worlds. He also had that weird stint with OMG where he didn't look as good as he normally did. But um, like obviously he's resource heavy. Like every, every, I mean, I guess that's another knock that you can use on him is that like his team's, played around him primarily and that comes to, i'm like i think it's an argument for him <laughs> well i mean the thing is like yeah so i think it's it's an argument for him too but i'm just saying that that's that's something that people will consider is like well when uzi's on your team you can't play like to the other side of the map because he, he's going to run down the game which i don't necessarily think is true like i think that he could play with like a really good fucking team but it's like the only way that they're going to win a world championship was if he like won behind every game so, I mean, he didn't have a world championship, but for me, like, I've never seen that level of mechanical e- excellence for the time with the level of aggression from an AD carry. All right, here we go. Uh, so I think that if you look at 2013 and 2014, so first off, he had a very long and very successful career. Unfortunately, there are knocks against him because he was injured and had to take a lot of time off. But even when he came back, he would take that time off during the regular season, come back and then dominate playoffs. When he was in back-to-back world finals, he, his other teammates are fucking literal who's now, right? Tabe's become a successful coach. Insec was like on the downswing of his career big time. Like mm-hmm. who who the fuck knows who Corn and Cola are anymore? Which were <laughs> solo lanes. Now that said, in 2014, <coughs> they got lucky because they got into the opposite side of the bracket of both Samsung teams. And I do think they would have lost to Samsung Blue had they actually hit them. And we didn't have the Samsung uh, semifinal, all Samsung semifinal. But even then managed to make it to the actual world finals twice. His teammates were complete dog shit. Never, ever did anything else after those seasons that they played with him. Uh, the entire team realized that it was his job to carry. Everyone in the entire universe knew that they were going to try and let him carry. And you know what? He still fucking did it. Cause no one could stop him. I mean, mm-hmm. I think he's, I think it's pretty clear cut that he's the best <laughs> but in, in the same way that I think is relatively clear cut that faker is, is the best mm-hmm. mid laner, even though I think rookie, in more recent years has done things to catch up. I don't think anybody's even close to this. Yeah. I mean, we'll, for, we'll for, 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 for me, it's, it's, uh, it's not even like where it's like, is he the best AD carry of all time? It's like, where does he fit into the grand scheme of best players that have ever played the game? And for yeah. me, I not only have him as the best AD carry of all time, I have him as the second best player to ever play this game. Right. Here we go. You ready for the devil's advocate? Yep. The seasons when he made the world's finals, 
weren't even his best seasons. The problem is no one watched the LPL back then. Mm -hmm. I did because I was obsessed with Wei Zhao and World Elite. So I always used to watch, especially all the top teams, mm -hmm. right? During the, the those two, two years, <laughs> the best ID carry in China was called Nami. It was not called Uzi Ai. Uzi yep. had a world's buff. He did it every time. Then what happened was later on, there's this middle period where he's in the RNG teams, right? And he's going each year. And in these years, I'm not, uh, this is mental. Remember, the LPL by about season five onwards gets pretty competitive. He is one of the biggest fucking playoff chokers I have ever seen. Like, he's always in the bloody semi finals. And, mate, if this guy goes to a game five, bet your fucking house on the other team. Doesn't matter who the other team is, by the way. The other team could be like EDG with players not called deaf that you don't even know. It could be fucking WE without Wage. I was talking years later when they had fucking She and stuff. Those teams all managed to get the win somehow. In fact, he had to basically meet IG, the other serial chokers, the KT Rolster of fucking China, to get his titles. That was the time when he got his big LPL title. He's only won two LPL titles. I don't know if a lot of people know that after all those years where they think he was the best secondly the whole angle of like you know uh he could have played the other style well he went to omg and they tried to make him do that they were like right you're on Siver, mate and it was, the team utterly collapsed a team that famously played without a bot lane and was playing mm -hmm. through top side and they put him on it just didn't work so what really happened was in my opinion this is why i always thought it was stupid when people just d ignored this comparison he was the forgiven of china he was the guy who was like, right, Eddie Carey is the best role because I play. I win every lane. Give me my champions. Everyone does what I say. You hard play through me. Jungle comes every single time I say, and if you don't, I will just die or I will kill the other guy. And then secondly, the other thing to say is because um, he was so brilliant mechanically, to me, if you watch him in team fights, he is just winning off being a genius, like physical player. He is unbelievable mechanically. Like he is not, in my opinion, calculating everything in some like super sick way when people would slow it down. Like no human could do that, in my opinion. Like very few players had like a mind like that. And in fact, there's other players I've got on this list. I think actually had a better mindset for like target selection and then I go sure. this order. Mm -hmm. and we'll get to them I in totally a minute. agree that he was entirely arrogance and muscle memory. It was so, yeah. listen, he was the most box office fucking AD carry of all time. That goes without saying, you know. Yeah. He, basically, here's the problem. Basically, Uzi I was Mike Tyson, but he wasn't Muhammad Ali. If you get the comparison there, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's apt. I, I mean, I would just, I would just say that, like, sure, you can make that that comparison, but when you're able to execute it that many times, it's like you'd rather have that than the guy that has like perfect target selection any day because he depends has. What my team is? Depends what your team is. I mean, I okay, like I, Damn, I guess. on the other players you were arguing like they had everything like Yankos. Why didn't he win LEC? This motherfucker had the whole team play through him for like seven years. <laughs> why has he got two LPL titles? Why has he got zero Worlds titles? Uh, I mean, I, I mean he has an I MSI know. title. He, he, he does have an MSI <laughs> title, which, which I mean counts. It's with a grain of salt, right? Like MSI raw is, ones, of course. Yes, yeah, of course. It's, King, it's King's one helped. Of those. <laughs> Yeah, look, look, I mean, look at look at Dom here. See, he's he's like hating on score, but he he loves Uzi. Yeah, I, similar kind of results, buddy. <laughs> similar results. I would say Uzi has the longevity over over. What is the longevity? What are you talking about? He started playing in like I 2011. Mean, yeah, but, but I mean, like he was he wasn't the same level. Like I'm so when I'm I'm evaluating score as a jungle. So like to me, Eight years you mean? Like, yeah. It, yes. Well, to me, score season starts, five is score, right? Yeah, season five is when score yes. starts. For yes, me. fair enough. Um. So Uzi has, I mean, he was playing since like even season two, right? Like, like Uzi has been playing for a long fucking time, um, even when he was like too young and like all that stuff. So I think that, that the thing that I, I appreciate the most about Uzi is like in like in those clutch moments, he would he would make plays that no one else could make. And I think that that is, is super valuable when, when you go to talk about like who's the best ever, because there was points where like he was. Like there's vein clips that you can go watch from from LPL that are just out of this world, and then oh, of you, course. you talk about like, the highest the highs of any ADC, of course, yeah, yeah, highest highs out of any AD carry. But it's crazy because like he was playing at like a better mechanical level, and like he was having like more insane outplays in like the 2014 2015 era that you're seeing some of the best AD carries like have in the world now. Yeah. Like he was he was actually so far ahead when it comes to those types of plays. So for me, I think that that. Um, the things that count a lot to make up for like um, the things that, like when I compare him to score is like obviously score, I think only has one domestic title, right? He has one LCK. Yes. Um, and, and Uzi has As a two. jungler, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then Uzi also has two world finals and then he also has um, an MSI championship. So like he has, he has the credentials over, over a player like score. I, I um, would just say this is devil's advocate though. Since you said before about like the games of, let me think, who was it? Who the fuck? What? 
Was it Nagori? Yeah, Nagori. You said like the games he throws go against him. This is the problem with the LPL. And this is why I don't claim to be an expert in the LPL. I pick and choose the games I watch. If you do that, you will never like fully know the LPL players. Because mm -hmm. the problem is they've yeah. always played too many games. So the problem is this, right? Everyone, I used to even have the YouTube channels where I would watch all these. Everyone watches the highlight games with Uzi I carries. Here's the problem. There are games where he's in the same position and he just straight throws the whole game as the AD carry with all the eggs in his basket. It, like he has vain games where he just fucking like rolls right into all of them, double a style just gets deleted instantly and he will just throw like i'm not gonna i'd say like a third of most of the games until his peak years like i'm sort of like season seven season eight season nine before that he just has games where he just throws the whole game mate, like mental ones and games where he's just abusive yeah. with his pick like pick something that just doesn't make any sense in the meta and you could pick like you could have picked like caitlin but he just forces yeah, a like, like as, or, as a or something yeah some ridiculous ones so like i just think as well he's a player where people don't know it he's in some ways closer to what the shy is in top lane in my opinion he's not like the smeb that i think people think it's just the consistency mm -hmm. in the years i see him as more like he has he has bad laws as well especially because he's demanded he put everything in his basket i felt like that uh, yeah i mean i guess i guess the thing is like since he's had such a long career i feel like he's gotten better at that as time's gone oh, I mean, obviously he's yeah. retired now so like yes, i'd say like agreed. season eight season nine he was much he was also consistent. very very young to be fair at the beginning of his career he was like 15 mm -hmm. or something so to be mm -hmm. fair like as he became a young uh, like 20 some plus old that's when he became legit sure also, uh, I think, you know, it sucks when you have to consider this in any kind of like sports or esports perspective, but his injuries can be held against him a little bit because unfortunately, like that, that is an inhibitor of your greatness. It forced him to retire. Uh, it forced him to miss a shit ton of time uh yeah. during allegedly, some of those years allegedly there's other reports right there's other reports that he's not actually as injured and it's more just that he didn't want to play and that's like what they know. Know. <laughs> yeah so i mean you have to take it with a grain of salt but yeah so i mean okay yeah go on I mean, I would just like want to talk about the second one. I can hold both things against him, Dom. The fact that he wasn't playing is just what I'm holding against him. I don't really yeah, okay. fuck I, what the reason I, is. Yeah, but <laughs> okay, okay. then. Uh, well, yeah, I just on. wanted to talk about like, so who do you guys have second? Because I I assume that that the conversation we're going to get into next is going to be like a ruler versus deft conversation. Yeah, is that, is basically the yes. only one that all three of us have as well is ruler, and then yeah, we're going to get in a cut. So let's do ruler first then, because here's the thing, right? I think you set it up perfectly, Dom. So I'll cue you up. Ruler, essentially, is if you're thinking, like I said about the roles in basketball, you're thinking of what is the prototypical AD carry, in this case, Korean AD carry, like, this is, this is Ruler, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's like mechanical excellence, but then also like the consistency that didn't, that didn't occur with like other people. Like to me, I feel like in his peak years, he was just like, he was like what everyone wanted Def to be. Like where it's like, you're consistent. You got like all the resources, like you're going to carry the game now, right? And then he would just carry the games. And then... Like, yeah, I mean, I think that he was probably the, the biggest reason why in season seven, Samsung ended up winning Worlds. Like, I thought that the fact that he was just better than Bang and like Bang was throwing in some of those games in the finals and he wasn't throwing. So like when he would get his advantages, he'd carry them through. So like, I, I just think that that Ruler has pretty much everything you want. He has the peaks, right? Like um, one Worlds, big, biggest uh, peak you could ever have. And then I think that even now he's so mechanically excellent. Like I would say he's the best AD carry in the world. Um, this year, I would say for like the last like, I don't know, three, four really? years, he's definitely in the in the conversation. You think he's the best this year? Uh, yes. Yeah, Still I very think, good. I think Ruler is the best AD carry in the world this year. Let me ask you a question though, Dom. Because then again, what I'm trying to do, by the way, if you notice, this is a little tip for anyone out there who does talk shows. What I do is I try to keep track of my points and the other person's points so I can understand where they're coming from, what they're, angle they're making. I don't just say you're wrong, right? So what I'm trying to figure out with Dom here is this, right? Let me put something to you, Dom. How many LCK titles Ruler got? Uh, zero, right? I don't think he's ever won, has he? Nope. Nope. Never yeah. won else again. Yeah. So now zero. listen, that's not a problem for me, mate. I've had scores, my best jungle, like, even though he won one, <laughs> like, he didn't win worlds, you know, so but I'm not going the accomplishments angle, but it seems like accomplishments do factor for you. So does yeah, that knock sure. against Ruler? Definitely. Definitely. It, it knocks against him. But like, I mean, obviously there's just how, how high you value them, right? Like you can say yes. that, like, so for me, even though I think that there are times where, a, a regional league could be tougher than Worlds. Worlds is still going to always be the biggest accomplishment in my eyes. Like if you prestige, of course, yes. yeah, for prestige, right? I don't feel the same yes. way about MSI. I think MSI is significantly see, overrated. See, see, I'm, I'm, I take your thing about MSI, the point you made on Twitter the other day. I'm like, oh, I always just felt that way about all international competitions. I was like, this is news. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but for, for me, I just think that like Worlds, because of like the level of like intensity and the fact that there's yeah. there's LPL leveling up, LEC leveling up, yeah, yeah, LEC of like the fact that it's at the end of the year, like that is the final like patch sure. that people will play on. Yeah, um, for the split, like that is the ultimate right so to me like that's more than domestic titles um 
period, just because of the prestige that goes along with the tournament. And yeah, the fact that he's never won um, LCK definitely matters. And that's why that's essentially why I don't have, have him as the, okay. the best of, of all time. I mean, if he had the LCK title, if he had like three LCK titles and then also won Worlds, then I'd probably have him as like the best over Uzi. But for me, right. like like he had he had a high peak but i just think that like his level of mechanical excellence is like really really insane like it, he's he's almost like the perfect ad carry when you look at like how he fights yes he's like the better version of deft basically in terms of style like deft was always the more conservative you know the more the, the kind of early conservative player he and like imp were on uh, very opposite ends of the spectrum um, except he's he's like the better version of Deft in, in my mind. I, I agree that his his titles are kind of lacking. And even it's hard to say this because I agree that he was probably that he and ambition were the, the biggest parts and him more than ambition to their world's win. But also, like I said, I think you could argue that that iteration of Samsung was maybe the worst team to ever win worlds that wasn't like season one or season two, like, you know, before it yeah. was really a global game. Yeah, it's definitely um, the worst team to ever win Worlds. I agree with that. So, you know, I, th that's kind of a knock against him in a lot of ways. And also, as flawed as Uzi was, like, I, sometimes I just feel like Ruler lacks the kind of killer instinct or the the the, mm -hmm. the sheer, like, eye test that's like, holy shit, this guy's on another level. Yeah, he's that's going to be my point, basically. Because my very... I, I, I've kind of taken the bat on this one, because this is my angle, right? I actually am not that big a, a proponent of the idea because he didn't win LCK. It's like a big deal. Like I think go look at his teammates. His best teammate ever was crowned before he went off the boil. That's it. Aside from mm -hmm. that, like, shut the fuck up. Kuvier was never like some god fucking top laner. He basically had like weird junglers his whole career. In fact, they had a jungle mm -hmm. problem where Ambition was just like a fucking Bengi character just hanging on. And then the Harugaj never yeah. fucking like inherited the throne. His support player, listen, he was still pretty good at times i guess but he's never some monster i think support no ever... now is like the best that he's been compared yes. to like the rest of the league because at no, least, his like... support was never even the best in korea most of the time i think core was good the difference is that i think that life complements ruler well because when you have a player like ruler who is not going to throw his advantages but he's not going to be the type of uh of ad carry where he just he wins the lane like completely by himself 50 cs up and is like auto spacing the guy under turret he's the person that's going to take like that he's going to just take a bunch of 90 tens over and over again. You need a player like life. That's more volatile. That's going to just flash in after flash in and just give you opportunities to kill, to get a player like that going. So I think that life is probably the best support he's had for him um, at this point. It just sucks that like the top side of the map just seems to like not be able to really get it together when it matters um, for that team. Right. The other thing I would just very quickly say is the reason why I also don't hold it against him. Because as I say, I don't think his teammates were ever actually that really great quality. Like, they weren't even in many finals, if people don't know. And then I think you look at him, and because he plays the perfect AD carry style, this is the same knock I have against Reckless, although it's not about playing style here. It's just about the idea that you play AD carry, like you farm up, you just never go behind in lane, and you win the team fight. If you can't get to the team fight with half these like, chance to win the game, you, can, you can't carry the game in that scenario. That's actually where Uzi I, for all his flaws, where he throws the game, does win you a game that you never should both Exactly. Mm -hmm. He breaks the game and just says, fuck it, I'm just going ham completely. Yep. Ruler's more like a Korean mentality of like, I will walk the fucking path I'm supposed to. And if that path involves chances where I can win the game, I'll do the correct things and I win the game. If I don't, sorry, I have to lose the game and I did what the coach asked. So like, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I have that angle, right? Basically, then we have depth. Then it's just outliers. So me and Monty both have depth. So what is the angle on depth you want to say, Monty? So I, I think that, Deft has had some really low lows and there, there are there are a lot of, I think, reasonable things you could say about kind of playoff performance deft, but also his regular season deft is amazing most of the time. And even when he dies in lane, the fact that he can, I mean, he was sometimes no joke, like not an exaggeration would literally in the white versus blue matchup die like five or six times to imp in the laning phase and still win the game and hard carry his team. So there have been moments where he can bounce back extremely effectively. And I think that the longevity of his career uh, is is very important. But I do think that he has kind of under delivered when it's like, oh, Def's coming back to the Korea. Here's the super team with Def. And he hasn't really lived up to the billing. Yeah, he seems to me like almost he seems to be kind of like a choker, you know, where it's like you oh, always a choker. You want the playoffs you always want, worlds for sure. Yeah you always just want more out of him. And like, I guess he doesn't choke to the same degrees that other players choke. Like he might 
choke and still like trip over and win an LCK title yes. or like an LPL yes. title along the way. So like it's gonna be weird because like people that are the historic chokers are people that are probably like never won and stuff like that. I just always feel like I have a I have an inter- I always like am disappointed by Def's performance and I do hold them to a super high standard. Like I am awesome. I definitely like am definitely impressed by his overall play um in regular season and then I'm like let's see what happens and then I'm just like oh that was deft okay like it was deft you know I ne- I never like get that feeling where I'm like wow I'm just I'm experiencing greatness right now like this is like some next level like 80 carry which is like weird because you you see him at times and it's like I don't know there's people that overperform when it counts like even like perks is an 80 carry in 2019 like when it mattered like he was pretty fucking good and like he would play the champions that he needed to play and I just feel like just deft is the, the fact that he's a choker just puts him under the other two for me. Here's the thing. I definitely agree when he came back to Korea and then in sub and then even when he was with an EDG, but the world's performances, I think he has some mega chalks then. I think there's times where he just does not show up to the fucking server because the problem is to me, like deft actually basically again was someone who like the trajectory keeps tracking, like, right, they're ready to go back to being the go to get far fuck the fall off again. Well, they're, they're going back up again. It's another chance. Like the longevity is unbelievable on this guy. In my opinion, when he was on EDG, he was better than Uzi I in the LPL. He was fucking sick. When he was in Korea, yeah, he's a guy who died in lane. When he got to the LPL, he fixed that. He actually became fucking super sick. And in fact, when he came back to Korea, it's probably the most underrated aspect. Most players go the opposite. Most players start out super strong mechanically and then go, right, just play the game with your brain from here and take a few chances like all the junglers. Death did the opposite. He became an aggressive fucking AD carry. And in fact, there's a reason why there are so many stories from pro players at those worlds he failed that go like this. In scrims, he just shit on everyone. That, there's a million stories from so many years. It's just for some reason in the main games, mainly it was Worlds. Yeah, I agree. It was a massive fucking choker. I don't know why. I don't even think it was about skill. It was just psychological. And here's the difference. I actually kind of like some of my like honorable mentions we might get to in a moment. Listen, I think I'd agree. Ruler, I actually had, think, has the most polish to his game. Uzi I has the most like raw brute power. But what I always loved about Deft was he also had like finesse when he played a team fight. That was it. it was, like when he would move around, it wasn't like he was like flashing away from this kind of gap closer. It's like he just ne- he did the perfect thing as an AD carry, which it sounds simple. This is why the, all esports games and sports are about fundamentals. He steps forwards, so you are slightly in range, does the damage, steps slightly back, so you can't do an attack to him, steps slightly forwards, does that. And as long as you peel for him, like he's going to win a lot of those fights, except if it's like game five or the fucking world championship, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So, in which case, again, he's just going to randomly walk in and die. Unfortunately, like, yeah. What the fuck just happened? So, like, so, you know, like, no, I agree. He's regular season. And incredible. And regular season would put him in this candidate. In fact, regular season, I think he's like a goat candidate. I agree, though. I think playoff. He's an example of where playoffs. It's not just his team. He had some very, very, very he, good he's, teams. By he's the way. just like one some of the that teammates. has that has all the skill, and you just wish they weren't so much of a pussy when it mattered. Where it's just like, man up and fucking take what's yours, man. You're <laughs> Who's the best that guy in Europe? Who's that guy in Europe? <laughs> now people know why. By the way, if you all watched this as a Westerner, I went, I agree you completely. What you said about Def Thorin. Then stop being in love with a guy from Sweden because he's the fucking same guy in Europe his whole career. And that's why I was trying to encourage him, you daft fucking idiots, to actually learn this lesson and become a great player. Because just like Deft, he had all the stacked teams. He had all the solo laners. And where are all the fucking massive, like, worlds, MS... He didn't get any of them, did he? Ne- never available, no matter who he has. So There's... it's the same story. The difference is you love Reckless's personality, so you ignore that part. Whereas I don't know Deft as a person, so I can just see all his flaws. So the other thing is that you have to remember, too, that he's in the same boat as score for losing in the quarterfinals of 2018 Worlds, where mm-hmm. he could have easily been a world champion as well. And it could have yes. changed a lot of the conversation. So I, I don't count that against him. The, but the he's one that, of the people that I actually I, like. Ho- I hate the most that he that he, that uh, he oh, didn't no. win that he, here, Here's the thing. Here's the thing about Deft. He is the biggest fucking cock tease in League of Legends history, because yes. unlike Ruler, by the way, unlike Ruler, he has the X factor, right? He has that thing. He has the eye test that makes you fucking want him to do something so badly. Mm. And then he just blue balls you every fucking time. That's what's so frustrating about him is it's like if ruler was losing, would anyone be like this upset? No, because he's never shown the like flashes of like true brilliance in the same way that Deft has. That's what's fucking frustrating about him. Uh, Yeah, that frustration literally makes me value him less than somebody like ruler, though. Like the fact that it's like. You're so good, but you don't do it. Is like it shows like some type of like uh, I don't know. It just shows but it's the like peaks are higher than ruler. That's the thing. That's what's so annoying. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And that's what that's why that's why it hates. Uh, I hate it even more, right? Because like I see I see when he goes off, goes off, and I'm like, yeah, this is like we're about to see like the year of death. And then where the fuck is it? 
Where right. where is that? So the, all I'm gonna say is like the greatest cock tease is not the person who never teases the cock, which is ruler. It's deft who just leaves you just you know he's edging it, you for here's years. the analogy he's not just the cock tease monty he's the one where you just have the most insane first night sex with him on and so you you're always chasing that dragon you're always trying to get back to that but you never will doesn't matter if you set up the fucking flowers and the music and the thing every time it's like oh i came too far oh shit oh fuck oh, i've ruined it all or you know whatever women do i don't know it's just a joke in it guys i mean i would just say that like so like depth is a, the type of, of of player or like if you were to put them in that same analogy, right? Like Deft is the one where you're like, damn, this is going to be insane. This is going to be like the highlight of my life. And then she's like, she's like fucking wood chipping the dick. She's using like, like she's gnawing on that shit. And it's like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is, is so much. Oh, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's like, oh no, it's fine. It's fine. Like whatever. Yeah. Just keep on going. Like, Whereas like rulers, the one where it's like, it's like, oh, well, like, you know, she wasn't the hottest, but like uh, she, she, you know, we had good synergy, you know, I like, yeah. I like what happened throughout. So like, <laughs> listen, she's the girl next door. Who that's not to life. You know, you grew up like, with her. Yeah. You know, she's reliable, she cooks food, yeah. very respectful, you know, great. Yeah, and you're parents like, and grandma. Like, after you're done, you're yeah. like, damn, where did you learn how to do that? Like respect. Yeah. Like <laughs> that's, that's how I feel when it comes to, to ruler, you know? Right, there's three outliers, and two of them are me, and one's Monty. So my two, basically, and this is actually just this is why actually I think this is a very interesting discussion. I tried to set up the ruler angle that way. In my opinion, of all the roles in the game, the most uh, reliably similar in all versions of the game is AD, AD Carry, sure. and it's the one where, as I've said before, like it's the one where it's actually the worst. If you notice these lists of names, it's the worst to be the best AD Carry. And as in, like, the best in the world, and then you're the best player on your team. Like, you need fucking help from solo laners or a good jungler or something. Like, you, it's the one role I don't think you can ever hard, You can't hard carry like Faker do. You can't 1v9 the whole game and definitely win because you're the best. So my problem is, I've picked two people here who I think, again, in my own way, have, like, a definitive AD carries. It's two of the Chinese ones. It's Wei Zhao and Nami. So I'll do them very quickly. Wei Zhao, listen, basically, he invented what AD carry is. I know he basically copied how Dota players play the one-position carry. But, like, again, this was the guy where you give him all the resources. It's not Uzi Ice, style, like, I have to have them all. I must have them. No, you just give him them normally, and then he overperforms the other AD carry every single time. Basically, a perfect laner, perfect team fighter, like, unbelievable. Listen, longevity is an issue, obviously. It's a long time ago. Look, Go on. I mean, I was just going to say about the Name thing. Name yeah. is, like, so... If we're going to go with that same analogy, Nami is actually the catfish. We're like the first time you saw Nami, like Nami show up to the world. It's like, wait, this isn't even the same. Like, this is literally just some dude. Yes. Like this, the, you're not even, yes. a, you're not even the person from your picture. Like this yes. is a different person. <laughs> that's a different gender. Exactly. So, exactly. So that's what Nami is, is for me, you know, like yeah, that's yeah. on the analogy. I mean, that's how I feel about him. Like he, he just, when, when he showed up, it was so far removed from what he was actually like that you can't even like judge it. And it's like, all right, well, you're just out of the conversation. Yeah. Do you have a thoughts on either Wei Zhao and Nami and then I'll give my thoughts on Nami? I think Wei Zhao was too, like, it was too early. I think Wei Zhao was just too early for me. Yeah, fair um, enough. In, but, in enough. general. Uh, but also, this is another, car uh, another carry that goes by the kind of, like, uh, if, you know, uh, influence Korean principle. Korean because, mm -hmm. because, like, the way that players play AD carry in terms of auto-attacking would not be the same without Wei Zhao. Yeah, I can, I can understand that for sure. Okay, Monty, do you have thoughts on those two and then I'll do my name? Oh, I think Weijia was in the same vein as like Madlife and, uh, you know, those kind of players. Insec also, you know, was a, a player who like redefined the flame. These guys um, is definitely like a valid shout along those lines. Uh, and Name, obviously everybody, well, not everybody, people who watched his domestic games know how insane this guy was. And mm -hmm. he got a super bad rap for showing up at Worlds and being god awful for whatever reason. Basically, there were four splits in a row of LPL that he was the best AD carry, and these were the two years that Uzi I went to the World's Finals. Two like in the in the first year when he was Devil, he actually was a very aggressive player. He had like a he had a shitter fucking support, and they just had to carry the whole game. Still was in the he was on all the LPL finals when Uzi I had never made one, and mm -hmm. then. You go to the 2014 year, and this is why there's an infamous comment that morons who use results-based analysis try to use against me and Monty, which is we declared he was the best AD carry in the world. Here's why. Everything you liked about Deft when he was winning in Korea, Nami was that, but slightly more polished. He also wasn't the super sick player in lane at this point in time, but if you just get him to the team fight, 
He will literally finesse, like just paint a masterpiece. He'll just do all the right damage in all the areas. Doesn't matter. And remember, Chinese players go fucking ham at that area of time. So if you're the AD carry, like it's almost like playing it now. Like you're just looking for how long can I stay alive? Never mind, like, can I kill all these fucking players? Like you're trying to dodge between stuff and is someone flanking me? And he was just a master at like time, spacing out the fights, knowing when to go in, when to play with a teammate. So I thought he was a fucking sick player, but a lot of that's based on like LPL, obviously. Sadly, he was very much like Death that he just blew the world, didn't he? So now it doesn't matter. And then unfortunately, basically he just like, no one really knows why this is. It's always been very bizarre. It never came out. But something happened in his career where he just got sort of blackballed by the industry. And he got to come back briefly in season six. But even then, they like dumped him partway through the playoffs. Even they'd been the AD carry for Mate and RNG. And then he just never appeared again. Like, he's not. This is the one thing about Koreans and Chinese players in the early part of league that is so bizarre. You could be literally one of the best in your role and you might never even play in the league again. Your team might never field you again. You might not get a transfer. This is why I say I don't think transfers work the same way. You might just go to the bench and disappear forever and never, ever play another game. In LCS, you go to another team. In fact, you might even go to the t another team next split. You know, you might just get the transfer. So I would say I'm just putting him in there because, again, I think, like, just like Deft, he's one of the people who's, like, one of the masters of AD carry. Again, longevity doesn't hit stand-up. The last one, so this is Monty's, is he just put Viper in there. Mm -hmm. Again, this is another trajectory pick. Right. Uh, so this is one that I think Viper... First off, I think Viper has been one of the best AD carries in the world this year in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, you you made the argument for Ruler, but I think Viper is certainly in that conversation. And I think if you look at how fast Viper's ascendancy was as a player, the fact that he was making uh, finals early in his career, I think this guy has a really bright future ahead of him and i think in maybe a year or two might be in this conversation yeah sure i just i think that his 2020 like i mean, obviously like there's reasons why like his team wasn't good but there's like a level where it's like all right man like even if your team is bad you should be winning more than like one out of like 16 series <laughs> like one out of sure. 18 different series you know or like whatever the fuck Honda life did uh last year so i feel like his his 2020 he definitely was in an unfavorable position but it seems like when he was in the unfavorable position he completely like gave into it which i don't like really like respect or fuck with that much like you, i want to you see don't you don't like his weak mental <laughs> well pretty much like i want i want a player to like really like try their best and because like i feel like there's there's tons of teams like piochik is another example of somebody who looks like he'd got completely fucked from the outside when you look at that drx team i don't think anyone's pr predicting them to end up like top five people thought this was going to be the, one of the worst teams right like all of his teammates are fucking gone who the fuck is he playing with how does he how do you win the game like that and he was able to you know find ways to actually yeah but he was in like, a, he was in a carry jungle meta in a role that actually has agency in the early game whereas like if if you're the rest of your maps behind and you're 80 carry you're kind of yeah but bone. i mean like i mean also like viper got to play with the same support that he was able to like win lane with before and then it felt like he wasn't like winning lane with lahens anymore yeah, and yeah. obviously lahens has, has fallen off so there's like other things that we could get oh, into, I agree. but just overall i, I think that he should have been sorry. able to do more I've just got a quick detail to throw in there because it'll actually help explain some of the issues with the Korean and the Chinese angle. Here's the thing. You know, from the Korean angle, I made it that because it's an honor-based culture. Like, you don't just betray the team that put you on and you won the championship soon. And by the way, those fans might never forgive you back then if you left those teams as well. It ain't like now where in fucking football, people have actually gone from Real Madrid to fucking Barcelona, which is like the most hated rivalry. Like, that doesn't happen in Korea back then. But the other angle is this. In China, it was about money. Now, what people don't understand is the whole Korean exodus comes from those enormous Chinese streaming contracts streaming not playing the put the genius of those moves was they understood what lcs never understood which is very few players are going to stay massive streamers if they don't play the game anymore so they want you to do both at the same time so what people don't know is this when you go to china the reason you can never go to the other teams and you have to sort of stay in your team is you do two contracts you have the riot contract which is your professional career and you might have an influencer contract that lasts years you're locked in for ages then and so basically the org owns you they decide if you keep playing that's why you saw all these mad scenarios where it's like Jackie Love can't choose where he goes or why doesn't the deal get done he wants to go to RNG why does Uzi I say he's gonna he's ill and he wants to quit and maybe he retires you but then he comes back like there's all sorts of fuckery goes on in that one so anyway let's vote on the player because I'm guessing it's Uzi I is everyone voting Uzi I for this I yeah. am <laughs> yeah but also, I will say this but, yeah go on also this conversation has proved that even though the AD carry position has changed the least amount in League of Legends history it's actually shockingly hard to come up with this and I would say that even Uzi's crown is not very secure right now. No like, no. Basically oh, sure. basically like another pretty good season from like Deft or Ruler could easily oh. knock him off this. If Ruler if Genji becomes the best team in Korea and Ruler wins worlds this year then Ruler's the goat AD carry.
Yeah, it's the good. problem is I actually do feel like I said in theory you are supposed to play AD carry like Ruler does on the rails, but just do everything correctly while you do it. It's like playing Time Crisis or something. What Uzi I does is he's actually playing Quake, mate. He just runs around and does whatever he wants. And the problem is, in a mad way, because he breaks the role, it just meant he always looked like the absolute best when he win the game because it looks like it's just him who won the game. It's one of the only players that I genuinely do believe did the one v nine. Most one v nines it's hyperbole. He actually has one v nine games, a lot of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I do want to put a shout out to Prey in there just because I think as far as like a kind of secondary carry 80 role, he was the best ever at doing that. Like he knew his place and was like extremely fucking good at it. And that enabled, you know, the Tigers to do really, really well. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, right. yeah, if, if, we go the now, carry. <laughs> if we go to the last position support, here's the interesting thing. I actually suspect this is actually one of the roles where people can probably guess where the ang angle will go. But interestingly, it was one where actually a lot of us were all over the place with some of our like extra names. This one's hard. Actually, yeah. <laughs> so the interesting thing is, right, there's two I don't players. Think we've had one. There's two players that we all named. So the first one is, of course, Mata. Take it away, Monty, maybe. So Mata was the was the MVP of 2014 Worlds. He is a mastermind. He was also later on a variety of other teams, including the KT team, the same one that we've been talking about the whole time in 2018 with score and deft. Uh, he did have, you know, he was benched at times later in his career because the individual mm -hmm. ability was pretty garbage by the end. But his mind for the game has always been a superb. He is the player. So unlike a player like Flame or a player like Madlife, he is actually probably the most innovative player who created a different way to play the position, who actually had significant competitive success, yes. right? Because Flame didn't win the title. All of it, yeah. Madlife didn't win Worlds, but Mata did. Uh, Mata, well, Mata won Worlds, and he won a title later with KT. Um, and and with with the previous version of Samsung as well. Um, but LCK, you mean he said worlds well, LCK, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yes. yes. Um, uh, but I, I mean, this guy probably had the biggest peak and also had an insane effect on the way that supports Rome, um, that supports place vision that they play with the rest of their team invented kind of high level jungle support synergy, uh, had a very high peak was consistent for a number of years. Came, like I said, came back, but five years later and was still pretty good in Korea, still winning titles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, uh, for, for me, like I, I have him as, as on, on my list as well. Like, I think he's probably like the one that you have to say is the best. Um, the thing that, that for me, I never really like that. I always just like hold judge, like withhold judgment is like the whole like shot color angle. Right. Like, cause that's like part of the reason why you're giving him this title is like, because he is known as like being like, pretty much the, the best shot caller of all time oh. or at least within 2014 like he was like the most that was when the idea of being a shot caller really mattered the most and it seems like he was the one that did it best in the world um i think a lot of his uh strength comes from like the the innovation like like you said i think the duo support jungle warding was something that you know he's credited for i mean when we heard players on team talk like it seemed like he was the guy that came up with like the idea of like hey i go with the jungler and we ward together and then i go back to late so um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much like I, I, I'm giving him, so I don't really care about influence and innovation as much on this tier list in general, but I just think that there hasn't been enough like great supports that anyone like has been mechanically good enough for long enough that they can overtake him. So like, he's somebody that if we have, see a really great support, like I'd be pretty willing to change, but I think that right now, um, we've never seen a support that was good enough for long enough to really like compare him to anything or like to take away his crown. Is a stat for you, a piece of trivia, right? I'm obviously not counting the summer of season nine because he was subbed out at that point in time. He wasn't the support. So I'm going to go when he was a starting player and I'm going to show you the influence. And the, I, this is where people used to tell me with all the players I named, like those, Mithy. Well, I, how do we know he's a shot caller? Because he's the only one who remains. Everyone else changes and they're all fucking teams that are at the top of the meta and they're in contention to win. So you ready for some trivia? So he won with MVP Ozone in season three, the LCK, right? Then he won Worlds with Samsung White, a slightly different team the next year, right? Then in season six, he won LPL with RNG. Zero players overlapping between these teams. Season 8, he goes to the KT Super Team, wins a split. Then Season 9, he's on SKT, wins a split. Like, 
That's season three, season six, season eight, season nine, and season four. He's like, yep. at one point in time, his team is just the best in a major company. Yeah. That, that is impossible if he is not having some sort of influence. Because sure. as we say, we're not saying I test he was like, you know, every game so absurd. Like, that isn't the angle. So just it, like by process of deduction, he, I think he has to be like probably the best support ever. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with that. I would just say that like, because he won season four and he was so good in season four. Like, I feel like that, that sets him up for all these. He was never at that peak. Yes, of course. So like when he's going to RNG, like RNG, I mean, he's playing with, with, with a uh, Uzi, right? Like, so no, he's, he won, he won with Woosh. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I mean, so, I mean, but he's like going to, to RNG, like uh, assuming uh, uh, we assume because like, you know, he's joining. Like, uh, he was on team. a bad team in the meantime. He was on that team with Dandy. He went to the Vici team with Dandy and mm -hmm, they just shit in mm -hmm. the bed. And then the next year bad. he got on to, <laughs> he got on to, so, yeah. yeah. So, and then like the super team, like that he joined in, in 2018. And then when he joined SKT, like, I know he uh, says that he won. He was pretty washed back then. He, won he the was washed. Some, he was, summer he was washed. Summer spring, but like, but <laughs> effort played the summer one, right? Like he didn't actually yes, play. That's why I said okay. doesn't count on that one. Okay. All right. So, I mean, I, I feel like, like 2014 is the one season where I would say that he's definitely the best support in the world. Yes. I'm not sure if the other seasons I would say he was the best support in the world. No, probably not. I would agree. Oh, with yeah, that. That's fair enough. That's yeah. why I say it has to be the influence angle. That's heavy fame. But as Monty yeah. says, he has the influence and the championships. Well, and then, I mean, and sort of like, listen, he doesn't have longevity because it's not peak performance, but he has an insanely long career. Well, that's and the he thing won multiple titles. So, yeah. So uh, that's the thing is like, so because, like peak performance and all that stuff is like less factored into the support that goes to like my second one, which I'm not sure how many of you guys agree with. My second one is mad life. Um, Everyone has mad life. It's the only other player. So go ahead. Okay. So I think mad life comes from the same idea where it's like his influence is, is more than like the titles and all that other stuff. And the fact that he uh, went to a world final, like all that, like it's just the fact that he changed the way support was played. Yep. People like he has a move named after him, which is the mad life because he would, understand when people would be forced to use their summoner spells or forced to use their dashes and and essentially just aim for where they would end up rather than like where they started which i mean sounds fucking obvious now and everyone like ends up doing it but like that people didn't know that like i i was influenced like that as a player when, when i have that like flash prediction like the mad life body slam top slide like i wouldn't have been able to do that if he didn't exist and show like how like how high you can like when you're playing with good players what the chances are that people actually make the right move, which is extremely high. So that's like why mad lifing works out and people still do it to this day is like, if you put people in the right positions and they're a good player, you know, people used to have the mentality of like, they could do anything. They could flash anywhere, but in reality, they can only flash so many places that make sense for them at a time that like would be optimal in the situation. So being able to like hone that in and like reduce like in your mind, all the possibilities and then be able to like, aim towards the most likely one. I think that that was something that people didn't have a correct perception of. It was also the first support player ever to actually be able to hard carry a team um, mm -hmm. because of the way that he was playing like Thresh and like using Blitzcrank. Thresh Hook and, and Blitzcrank and Alistair, but using Thresh Lanterns to pull people in, like having somebody teleport in, then hook someone over a wall and then like pull with the lantern his teammate mm -hmm. in. He basically invented like almost all of the Thresh mechanics that are still used today and debuted them at a professional level that was actually truly amazing at the time. And also... Unlike Mata, he was definitively the best player in the world before Faker showed up, uh, mm -hmm. like immediately before play Faker showed up. It really wasn't a question as to who who was on top. So I think these are these are all like really important factors that lend themselves to Mad Life. It, it was a very short time where I think he was the, like kind of the king mm -hmm. uh, unquestionably. But huge End of season of two to the beginning of season three, right? Yeah, basically, basically. Mm -hmm. I would just say the, the other thing is like uh, the champions that he played, like outside of just the mechanics within those champions, because he was able to play these engaged supports or these hook champions at such a high level, it changed the way that people perceived the role, right? Like people yes, thought- he changed the role entirely. So, so people mainly thought that like the best supports were like Sona and like Janna and these types of champions because but, of like how much they could actually do later on, but um, like later on in the game. But he was the first- person that that showed how hard and how consistently you could shit on these types of like weak early game range supports with the champion like thresh with the champion like blitzcrank um to like invalidate the sorakas and all that other type of stuff so i i definitely credit him for like all of that type of stuff that's why he's my number two and even after his peak too he was on some truly fucking awful teams and he'd be better for another year for sure <laughs> he was put in space prison and he was still good after that and he was still like 
the best player yes. on many iterations of Frost after they changed all of his like teammates a around. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and like he came up with some really important playoff performances. I think he caused his team to overperform a lot of the time. If he got on uh, on the picks, he was really dangerous on. So there was a lot about this guy that I think was was great. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there's the ones we had all of them, right? Then me and Monty both have a name, which I can already guess the angle, especially with this conversation has gone. So me and Monty have put Gorilla on the list, right? So I'm going to guess already, Monty. This is an example of where a lot of people do tout championships, etc. Just this guy's resume, you have to at least say his name. Yeah, and I think what's important to note here is that he was the act, the more active part participant in the in the duo with prey because what was great about prey is you could just leave him the fuck alone on ezreal in the bot lane and uh gorilla could just walk around the map and like help his teammates especially smeb in the top lane get ahead and carry the game so he also was super innovative in that regard in terms of helping out the top lane and playing being able to find timings to recall and play through the top lane while prey remained safe in the bot lane which exerted a huge amount of pressure on the map and was a really 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 important part of the Tigers' success. I think that if you rate the players on the Tigers in terms of all-time best, you know, we're not... It's, it goes Smeb and then Gorilla. Yeah. Um. So for me, Gorilla is like the main thing that I have against Gorilla. And I think that something that you you later got to see in his career was that he actually was never the best engaged player um, as a support. So like he was like able to roam the map and like find kills and things like that. But in terms of his ability to engage, which is something that I really, really value. Um, hey, Prey did the engage, player. right? Yeah. So Prey was the one. So that's like part of like when you dice when you when you reverse engineer the bot lane, you're yes. like, oh, well, they're really good at like Ash lanes and Varus lanes. And then like you just assume that that was like the because they were so good, it was kind of like, oh, they're the best team in the world right now, and this is how they play. So uh most likely it's just because they think the champions are strong. And then when you start seeing like how Gorilla acted on other teams, he actually severely lacked the ability to like engage well consistently. Um, and he relied on prey for a lot of like or that. Smab. Yeah, or SMEB for, for a lot of that, like yeah, the cannon flanks and things like that. So um I think that that's the one knock I have against Gorilla is that I just think that he was kind of like limited in his skill set uh, and he lacked one of the major uh, tools that I think is like required for like a uh, uh, support. Yes. To me, he was more like, you know, like a fucking caster support type player. And it was yeah, like, like a Zyra player to me. But by the way, traditionally, like, again, if we're going like traditional roles, this is what you expect from us at Korean support. Like, just help the air to carry, help the team, don't mm-hmm. do anything crazy. Not, we don't have to go nuts in lane. We're not being silly. Let's not throw the game. Solo lanes carry the game. We get to the team fight. I heal people. Mm-hmm. I do a little bit of CC sometimes. Yeah. And then it's like why he's the decent on Thresh because Thresh is not like a hard engaged champion. Yes. Thresh is a champion that's versatile and will be able to do everything. It's it's also though like you can hold that against him, Dom. But to go back to when you said you were reviewing with with Munchables the SKT Rock series from 2016 Worlds, the semis that you said you thought was the greatest best of five of all time. Remember that he had the balls to bring out, out the, the MF, MF support yep. pick during that match, which completely swung the match and all uh, like almost basically forced a ban later on. Like to to have the balls to pull out that pick. At, in the most important match of that entire tournament and create that series was phenomenal, right? So yeah. he, he definitely thought outside the box in terms of what champions you could play in that role. And I just, if you think about it at the time, it was totally inconceivable that he would do that. Like, I remember watching that series and being mm-hmm. like, holy shit, like, this is incredible. Yeah, and it fits within his profile that we're, like, saying, right? Like, MF is not an engaged support. It's, like, a poke support in lane that, like, kind of functions as a caster. And then in team fights, it, like, f- like the way that they played it was Ash MF, right? So they would yeah. Ash arrow and then layer the MF E, which he would be maxing at that point, and R on top of the arrow in order to, like, finish off the guy that was already CC'd. Yeah, so my argument would be, sure, he may not have been the best engaged support, but he was also added a dimension that no one else had to the kinds of supports that he played. And in a way that almost won them a world championship. So, But it is weird. The other two (laughs) names we're picking, again, it's like an Uzi eye. You just break the game from your role. So Matter and and Madlife at their peak is like Thresh, Blitz, like some aggressive shit, right? If you think of someone like Gorilla, you think of like Nami, fucking... Jana. What else? Jana, yeah. Like I said, Mm -hmm. it's like the traditional support champions that the game was actually in theory invented to be based on. Zyra, yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. Then after that... We each have one outlier each. So interestingly enough, I want to see where we go on this angle. So Dom's outlier is he has Ming, obviously at the end of his career, mm-hmm. the UZI support from RNG. Why do you pick Ming? 
Um, so I think Ming is like a player that, you know, he has like a lot of accomplishments, right? Like he has three domestic championships at this point, an MSI championship. He's been to semifinals of Worlds. Um, and, and like you can say that he's been on the same team the whole time, but in reality, he's just been on a bunch of different teams, right? Like the the Uzi RNG is completely different than the Zhao yes. top RNG yes, that we're, we're living course. in right now. Um, and I think that his ability to engage is, is really good. I mean, it's the reason why you see him on like Nautilus Leona all the time. I think he's really, really smart um, about that. And I feel like he's, yeah, I mean, he had one of the hardest jobs in the world, which is supporting Uzi, right? Like that is, and he was the one that I was able to do it the best, right? Like, I think he's probably the best. He was the chosen ever. one by Uzi too. Yeah, he's the chosen one for a reason, right? He was the only one that could actually like play the way that Uzi wanted to play. Um, so I think that that he's like probably my third. Uh, I, I probably like after hearing the gorilla arguments, I, I don't necessarily think I would put him third all time over gorilla. I think gorilla had too much like time where he was good, but I definitely think that, that Ming is somebody who is like generally undervalued. He's more somebody I want to talk about in this format more than somebody Fair who enough. I want to like definitely yeah. put on the list and be like, no, he's the third best support of, of all time, you know? Yeah. Well, I think he's also one that's still going strong, right? So like, this is another player mm -hmm. who has Perfect. an extremely good trajectory, even if he hasn't had the longevity that gorilla has, there's certainly the opportunity to pass gorilla. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Like he might I mean, be in a second MSI next week, right? So, yeah, or... he could. I mean, he's the favorite, right? He's he's the favorite to win this MSI. And then, like, what happens if he gets a world title under there? I just think that's, that he's somebody who, I mean, when you're playing with Uzi, you're never going to be the one that's um, credited. But, like, when you look at, like, when Uzi was popping off the hardest, like, people, people, like, they were a sick bot lane, man. Yeah, they were a good fucking bot lane. So I, I think that, uh, yeah, Ming just deserves a uh, credit. I mean, the other person I wanted to talk about because, like, I think just like Chinese supports are. This like, might be mine, man. Is it Mako? It, it's Mako. Yep, there you I go. Think, that was uh, my pick. So all right, yeah, go ahead. No, I, well, right, I'll do it then. Okay. It. Yeah, I'll do it. So, first of all, Mako. he's another player where, unfortunately, just like actually, fucking Ming just gets the whole like Uzi Eye thing to him. It's like we just went on. People already remember when Mako was with the Deft on EDG and they won the championship. So they're like, ah, oh. so yeah, he was just playing with Deft. Here's the thing. He was like a rookie when he first won with Deft. So yes, he wasn't that great at that point in time. And uh, eventually the next year though, because they played two years together, season six, actually they had a very good, but this is when Deft started to get more aggressive. He was a really good support at that point in time. I remember Kelsey Adam was like the MVP in one split or something. Then the years later, it's the years later that people don't understand because here's what people don't get. So he won the... Uh, one time he won the LPL with Deft. He twice won the LPL with iBoy. Now, nobody mentioned iBoy for the fucking best AD carry. Because iBoy, no. he throws I -boy was the most ridiculous example of a Chinese AD carry where it's just mechanics. And they and they and it's like if you if you don't hold on to the leash of the dog, it just fucking runs off completely. Like, what the fuck? So his job was to keep that fucking leash at the right times and know when and set up the whole lane and lead the lane, in my opinion. So I thought he did a great job. Now he's with Viper, obviously, in EDG. Sick, sick player, true, but he's integrated a Korean immediately, right in the mix. By the way, also, they were right behind the two teams, FPX and RNG. They were a very good team lead, one of the top LPL teams for the most of the split. So I think you look at his longevity, he's won championships domestically without the big yep. name necessarily. Uh, he's obviously been a bunch of worlds, but sadly with death, they sort of bombed those ones. And then the iBoy, let's, let's face it, they just weren't very good teams. They never had any business doing anything at Worlds. So I just think like... I test checks out longevity is pretty good. He's also maybe even someone who can keep going on this list. And as I say, like actually not bad resume when you look at it. I mean, you can tell he has respect from, from Chinese AD carries. I mean, fun, like I did the MSI or not the MSI, the world's boot camp last year um, where I was spectating the super server games. And that was actually who Uzi like just do a cute, a million games with. He was just playing with Mako every single time. Like not Ming, he was playing with Mako. So that, that was, was always one of the ones, by the way, behind the scenes. Again, you can't always do these moves. That was always the move that a lot of the LPL experts wished happened. I and mean, it's before Ming came along, really. But they always wanted it to be Mako and Uzi I was the bot lane. Yeah. Could have been interesting. I definitely think both these players, like Mako and Ming, are pretty, like, toss-up. Like, whichever one is you know, you pick, you can say is, is better all the time. Oh, yeah, by the way, similar in terms of there's career. one last thing that Nisi mentioned here in the same context as like some of the other players revolutionized the game. One of the reasons Monty was right in the early years that you should never think the Chinese team is better is because at jungle and support, they didn't fucking have any, did they? Like they used to just play, have the sick laners and an AD carry, which carry the game. Well, here's the thing as well as Ming did it in later years, 
For me, Mako is like a, one of the only players. He's playing support, right? That is a Korean role. That is a role dominated by Koreans. And this guy legitimately was one of the best support players in the world in some of his years. So the mm -hmm. idea that he made China actually have legit supports. When people look now, and I know Dom's addressed this, like people still think like, all they do is just team fight, like bloody games. It's like, mate, that's the oldest narrative of all time. They have sick macro now. What are you talking about? Amazing they understand macro. vision control. If anything, they understand when you can create like, actual picks and skirmishes better than fucking the Korea does. And mm -hmm. he's one of the reasons that's why in my opinion so I've, that's why i had it. yeah no I, I think that well, one thing to just add on to that is like so many people view macro as like just overall map movements in the late game but there's a bunch yes. of macro decisions in the early game like deciding to group your jungler and your mid laner together and go dive a side lane is a macro decision that is a team-wide like map concept that you're that you're executing so like when when people say like we didn't get to see any of rng's macro because they played against shit teams it's completely like yeah we didn't get to see any of their mid and late game macro which might be bad in comparison to dom one like that's definitely an angle that could actually happen in the tournament that we're, we're still yet to see but in terms of their like early game macro like their ability to like stack waves and then collapse their their mid laner with their jungler on the wave dive bring their top laner in to tp at the same type of times like those that those uh and then their macro responses like when the enemy team makes a play how they respond to i mean rng is so so good at this tournament compared to like any other team at least in the early game so there's there's a lot of like macro that goes on here that is just completely like undersold and yeah i mean i just think that chinese macro is actually really fucking good these days Agreed. And then the last guy. Oh, sorry. Do you have something you want to say about more? No, I, I should have. I, I should have included both of those on my list too. I oh, fair enough. Agree with you guys. The last one, Monty just threw it in there. As you get, it's a similar trend. I'm guessing it's for the future. It's crisp. Yeah, and the reason why I put crisp in uh, right now is because again, it's the player that I see potentially trending towards the future. I think that. Like I said with Tian, in a very similar capacity, he was he and Tian were the ones who actually carried FPX uh, during the 2019 World Championship. And mm -hmm. I think unlike Tian, he hasn't had the same drop off. In fact, he's probably the better of the two uh, to be heading towards like a, an all time greatness in their role. Uh, so I think he just continues to perform extremely well uh, and didn't didn't have the same like period away from League of Legends or drop off that we saw from from Tian. I think it's just yeah, throw this in there, just cause, just because it's what I'm told from behind the scenes by my source network. They do tell me that the problem with Tian and Crisp is that they are effectively mind controlled by Doinby, and that like they they that have a lot of questions true. about what would happen in a world where they didn't play with Doinby. Basically, yeah. if they just went with a normal mid laner, like a lot of them think that like they'd just suddenly be you know like two points worse on the scale or whatever. You know, that, yeah. that very well may be true. I, mean, I agree. I think, Mechanically, he looks sick to me. I always thought he was a monster. Yeah, Crisp is really fucking good. And then also, like, I mean, his ability to adapt to the game, I think is really, really great. I mean, obviously, this fits within his profile. Like, Rel is an engaged champion, and he's an engaged support. I mean, his best champion was Nautilus for the longest time, right? So, um, definitely fits within his profile, but the ability that he was that he had to like pick up Rel and then not even take Rel to like whatever like level we see like in the West, like because people didn't even know that Rel was good actually, like in North America. People were like not even picking it. It was like one off as a troll pick. Chris just started picking it, and like for the longest time, he won every single game that he got Rel um, the entire time. So like not only is he a world champion, um, he also is a domestic champion one time, and he almost won another title right here. So. Uh, I definitely think that 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 Crisp is somebody that has trajectory. Just compared to like the longevity argument of um, of, of Ming and Mako, I just wouldn't put him yeah, there. I agree yet. with you. I agree with you. By the way, one thing I would like to say: listen, we didn't we did actually majority outvote him, but we didn't manage to get a Dom off the Bengi train. But I'm just yeah. so glad because you know what? Here's <laughs> the one thing I'm actually good at. Actually, Monty established this many many years ago because obviously in games like CS, Quake, Ca Starcraft, I actually have studied those games for years and years and years and years. Like. I can sort of, like, in StarCraft, I'm not as good at, like, the build orders and stuff, but, like, Quake and Counter-Strike, I'll just straight up say I consider myself the foremost expert ever to live because I'm the only person I know, as far as I know, who worked in esports to watch every single big game. I'm the only one I spent decades thinking about them. But when I come into these other games, I do have to do things, like, to understand who's the best player in a certain matchup. I have to sort of pass a whole bunch of experts. Now, what I do is I don't take one expert. I try to get them all. That's, that's the secret of what I'm doing on my shows, by the way. I'm fucking just brain-draining all these motherfuckers, getting all the interesting angles. Now, I see what makes sense to me, right? But one thing Monty nailed way, way, way in the beginning, that was actually one of my strengths is, I always had it, mainly because I've tried to, I, I always try to boil the game down to the fundamentals of the role, and then I consider style realistic matchups so Monty pointed out a long time ago like player performance was always actually like probably be my best strength like I have a good sense for how good people are it's why by the way 
Like, there are certain players I'm, like, half a decade ahead of everyone on. Like, people now, especially now all these stories are coming out, they'll admit all the problems Reckless has. Nobody would admit that for, like, three or four years. It was crazy. I was just told he was the perfect player. Like, he didn't do anything wrong and that everything he did was correct and it was everyone else's fault. So there's a few players I would say I've actually been, like, ahead of the game on. And, like, this was definitely one of them. But another one that I'm so glad none of these players got referenced, we've totally turned the corner on this, was the fucking years I had to sit through being told, individually and as a bot lane, Bang and Gorilla, uh, Bang and Wolf are the best. <laughs> that hurt me inside. <laughs> the idea, you, like, you motherfucking fans hurt Thorin inside. Yeah, Feel like that. At, at the time, <laughs> I stand by what I said at the time. Not anymore, because I'm sure Samsung probably takes the credit now. At the time, I thought Wolf was the most boosted player to ever win the World Championship. Yeah. I mean, I'm not hitting. He just did his job. Who, who, else, did his job. who else would go into like worst players to ever win a world championship? Crown, like Crown in his form when he won. Yeah, when he maybe just Crown. Crown that was pretty sad. Bao Lan, maybe. Oh, Bao Lan for sure. Yeah, he's mega. He, he's probably the new boosted one. Yeah, he, he probably took the title right after you, right? Yeah, I think yeah, Bao Lan I mean, has to take it. Yeah, Looper. Maybe, maybe Gim Goon. Looper. So here's the thing about Looper. Looper actually he was had, fine. He had some pretty baller performances. Yeah, in yeah like he he had like that Akali game that was really good. At, his, at, his fucking singe teleport on TSM. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm biased, but was still fabulous. By the way, I Thor, will say you this. That, wait, wait, Come on. Did you know that it's the one year anniversary of the our victory in the TSM Holy War? Oh, today? okay. Fair That's enough. today. Wait, did right, you guys so just self, fire self up the Lenovo? Or what happened? What do you mean? We did win. What were <laughs> you kidding me? How did we yeah, lose? How did we lose? Go on, then. How did we lose? <laughs> well, we, we said, are you ready? We okay. said, these people have a conflict of interest. The problem with conflict of interest, of course, is you'll never be able to prove it. In fact, one of the only ways you'd prove it is if they either A, That's where you're incorrect. Or, you or underestimated B. how dumb they were. Oh, no, that's, that's what's mad. <laughs> by the way, I was making a very good point. I have no nodes of conflict of interest, and you never get to find out if they did it. That's why you have to eliminate them, by the way, because mostly it's unenforceable. The joke is, well, the reason we won dumb is because they actually went out of their way to essentially both inadvertently admit it and get recorded secretly all of their own doing. Like, that's right. That, uh, so, listen, I, I won't say we won it on our end, Dom, but they they threw it. It was all yeah. they hinted, you know. Yeah, yeah no, actually, we still I thought won, it was though. gonna go on. I, I thought we it was still gonna won. go on because it's like oh, it should have. It should have. No, I, I remember because I actually watched this video because uh, so uh, like my girlfriend doesn't really like watch this type of stuff too yeah, much, of course. you know. So so I mean she's she's like watched league content and stuff for, for a while, but she's never actually watched like talk shows and like super specific like videos. So she didn't really know who Thorne was. So the way I decided to introduce her to Thorne because she obviously watches my stuff now and sees as a coach was to send the TSM Holy War video that he did called Oops, yeah. Lena Did It Again. It was like the second and By the way, banger title. Yeah. Fucking banger title. That's yeah. one of my better ones for this sure. This is now like how she, how she <laughs> interprets it. I'm like, you want to know who Thorin is? Just watch this video. And we Legal. sat down That's and prime. watched 40 minutes on the couch of Thorin's TSM Holy War. <laughs> where he's talking about yeah. he's like he's just talking about like how incompetent lena is like <laughs> how fucking dumb she is the whole time i was like jesus christ he just pulled no fucking yeah. punches no i was meant to <laughs> it by the way do you want to know something really funny beautiful. that might that might confuse people because the obvious bullshit angle people tried to pull was you're just doing it because she's a girl right do you know what's funny by definition, you are objectively the sexist because you believe a girl could not possibly be the president of a company and be held to the standards of an executive mm -hmm. of a major esports company valued at hundreds of millions of dollars. I treated that woman as though she was actually someone who was the president of a company, regardless of what her sex was. I am objectively not the sexist. You guys are. But it's okay, TSM fans. You've never True. really been able to see things outside of black and white colours, have you? <laughs> You're like in Pleasantville before it fucking turned into colour, aren't you? You never had that magic in your life. Life. It's okay. All By right. the way, I do genuinely believe I manifested all those world's failures. Like they always had half decent teams, you know. Anyway, yeah, who do we vote for this one? It's between matter and mad life. So who do you pick? I, I, I have matter. Matter. Yeah, I had matter as well, right? So anyway, our team then is Smeb, Score, Faker, Uzi, I, Matter, and basically only one of us disagreed on one, which was Don would have had Dandy as the jungler. By the way, mm -hmm. that's a fucking banger team right there. <laughs> yeah. Now what we need to do is we need to get all of them to play in a show match for us. Yeah, and then, no, I feel like the, the thing about those is you just end up like, like, even if you're like, oh, Never it's a show match, the value, would it? it always looks so bad that you just like end up like being like, wow, maybe they weren't that good. Like that thought always creeps into the back of your mind. You know when they do those matches where it's like, they're bringing back all the old fucking fanatic yeah, like in China or whatever. Like, please don't. Please, yeah. please, please don't do it. Like, also, I don't want to so watch that game. What, what, so they can ruin also, their legacy the in real time for us? Or like, what the fuck is the point? Also, by the way, this just makes 
as I keep hitting on this point, how depressing season uh, 2018 season uh, worlds was three of these players were on the same team on that KT roster. Yep. It's so fucking sad that they got eliminated in the quarters. Essentially, Why can't Monty, we have double elim? Monty, <laughs> essentially, we have conclusively proven that KT is the razor kick in the entire history of the game no! League of Legends. It's, it's scientific. They literally now. had yeah. three out of the five it's best science. players ever. Yeah. God, you you literally could not pick a worse team to be a fan of than KT or Ulster. No, shut the couldn't. fuck up, Dom. Shut if you if you look up. at the history of League of Legends and you're like, what would be the worst team to be a fan yeah, of? Right? Because shut, like shut other. The fuck up. <laughs> like if you're a fan of like a, of another team you can probably drop it a lot easy but there's no team that like consistently can disappoint you as much as KTR. Yes. This is this history. has been my life for 10 years. Thank you very much for reminding yeah, me. Yeah, I can, of, of I, the I can see cake. why you quit the, the league team cake. for like 2 years. <laughs> I heard you guys mention the razor cake on on Crackdown when I was listening to the show before mm -hmm. you guys started here. And so to describe the razor cake to people is it's not just that there might be razors in the cake. The thing is about the razor cake is that every year you're served a beautiful cake. And it might, you know, one year it might be have like vanilla frosting or chocolate frosting. One year it might have, you know, frosting roses all over it. Might look like red velvet. But the thing is, every year there's a beautiful cake in front of you. It looks delicious. You take a bite and there's a razor in it. And next year you're like, there might be a razor in this cake. The thing is, every year there's a razor in it. And you keep eating the fucking cake. And that's what I've done for KT for many years. And it's just proof, like this roster that we just made, where, where it's not only that KT had all these players on different versions of KT, they literally had them all on one I version know, something of Something sicker. Monty, <laughs> th thank God Deft never did overtake OZI. Otherwise, like, it would no! just be like, you know what? I'm out. I'm out. So yeah, that's, that's actually fucking pathetic. I'm out. You've got the best part of the five best players of all time. Couldn't win fucking shit except one time. I'm out. Peace. <laughs> Someone to, whoever's the last out of KT rolls to turn the lights off. <laughs> it's all right. It's this version of KT they have now is just even more like th this is the true tragedy. At least there, I will have to say, at least the razor cake ended this year because nobody wanted to fucking eat the KT yes. cake in 2021. Yeah. That roster is just garbage. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> at the end, right? Listen, Monty, do, do we, should we have Dom here for a couple of the questions? Sure. There's some Rob good ones. Because I'm sure mind, he, he can, he can adapt yeah, on sure. the fly. Yeah. We'll just do like half an hour more basically. And then we'll be done. Okay. I know it was a monster. Four hour like, episode. It listen, is. it was a monster, but it was I worth do. it. I, th I think we nailed this premise, by the way. We did a really good yeah. job, like not only arguing all the points, we put all the legit people in there. We even talked about the ones we didn't include. I think we actually nailed this premise. I'm very glad with how it turned out. So let's do it. Yeah, I think, I think this was a great, great show. It was really fun. So if you want to um, know how this works, to ask a question, obviously you can't do it like the second, you have to do it for the next episode. You basically go to the summon in insight, insight any spot rather, Discord. You go in, you go into a channel called no, wait Rod a second. Coin lounge. <laughs> yes, yeah, you go there and pinned it'll explain how you like buy the coins, which is a type of rally coin. And then once you got that, you go into the Grog Coin 25. So you have to have 25 of them. I think it's only cost like $50 at this point in time or somewhere. And when you've got those 50, hold. Hoddle, hoddle, or whatever you fucking kids say diamond nowadays. Hands. Yeah, diamond hands it. There's that way every time you can potentially ask a question. Throw your questions in there, and then when the episodes come up, we'll ask a few of them basically. Yeah. Yep. And this so time we get a bonus. Line. We get Dom, one of the biggest core streamers. They can fuck all off this stream. And now he's going to answer your questions. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you could mandate that every esports event must use a single format until the end of time, what format would you choose? Like GSL groups or Swiss versus round robins for group stage, double limb versus single limb for playoffs. So it's every esports event. You have one, every esports event. I mean, I, I like I'll say I don't I don't know what the GSL or the Swiss one is. I would just say that the best League of Legends tournament format I saw was the recent LPL one. I thought that one was extremely good. Um, you have like you like you tear it all the way back. So this would be the equivalent of like in groups, you have like the third places team, the third place teams from each group or even the fourth place team from each group qualified to like earlier portions in best of fives. And you have them play up until the top four. And then once you get the top four solidified, because like, it's very rare. I mean, obviously in the KT versus IG, that's probably the only time where like a true championship contender went out in like quarter five. I mean, yes. maybe there's other ones, but the, the point is that like, generally speaking, top four is like reasonable. And then you double elimination from that point. So I'd say like LPL 2021 spring was like the best format that I've watched. Like I really enjoyed that format.
I mean, mine's yeah. very simple. It's from many years ago, but I think it was, uh, I think off the top of my head, we're talking like season five. It's the, what the TI format used to be, where it was GSL for like four man groups. And I'm think, I think I've got this right off the top of my yeah. head. And then basically most of the teams, it was just for seeding, still went to the playoffs. But if you were like yeah, the like last 12 team, out went, of the 16 or something. you went to the lower bracket and did a best yep. of one first. So listen, by the way, you deserve that. You didn't fucking get like top three or something. You got all top two. And then you, the, the other teams have like a winner bracket. They start slightly further along. So it's kind of like a modified one, like Dom City, but double a limb the whole way. And then it's just double a limb, best of threes the whole way beyond that. Except in League of Legends, you do best of fives, of course. Yeah, and it, I just feel like all... it's the one where, like, pretty this way, if you're the best team and you don't win that, it's like you weren't probably the best team, I've got to tell you. Like, you know, it's hard to lose that format, put it that way. Yeah, I'm a fan of kind of the seeding uh, based on regular season into or group stages into um, like a more advanced versions or the kind of the upper brackets. So you get two chances if you're better, but lower bracket if you do worse. So I think some of the like, honestly, the LCS and LEC playoff formats haven't been heinous. Like they've been getting better. I think for all esports, though, so Dom, GSL groups are four teams or four players in a group and it's a double elimination group. So you basically like you know, two teams play against each other, then two teams go into the loser's bracket, two teams go into the winner's bracket, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you play through. So GSL groups are just the perfect format for esports. Any, Basically, any esport can be played in a GSL group and you're going to get good results. So that into double limb is definitely, I think, the top. Yeah. Um, question for me and Thorin, outside of the horsemen themselves, who in esports is genuinely qualified to call out a horseman on their bullshit? Um, the horsemen would do it themselves. We would do it themselves, or we would recuse ourselves if we were conflicted, probably. Um, but, but is the thing, like, did he say in history? No, uh, it, no right now. But oh, it, right now. That's the hard part because here's the yeah. bad news, guys. First of all, a mixture of politics and then industry politics and business have sort of ruined a lot of the yeah. classic. Like, if we go back years and years, so Scoops could do it. If you go Slasher. back a long time, yeah, many, many years ago, there's a lot of legit people who back DJ then, yeah, they, they would have been in a great position to do it, yeah. B basically, Live on 3 was kind of the Four Horsemen before the Four Horsemen existed, but unfortunately, like, a lot of those people have insane bias now, or I guess like DJ Wheat don't really involve themselves on. in yeah. esports. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he's doing much better things uh, now. <laughs> if you've been watching the Twitch drama at all. Now, here's the sad thing: I might, if I was being really generous, like a year ago, I might have said Jacob Wolf, right? But as you saw when he tried calling me out, swinging a miss, and I'd just bunt for that one if I were you, mate. It didn't fucking work for you. That ball went right in your nuts. What are you talking about? <laughs> so in this scenario. Uh, there's got to be someone. Let me think. You know what? I'll give you one. Like in theory, when he before he retired to become an agent, DK in Counter Strike, he was a guy who was just basically like a very legit guy. He was always mm -hmm. ethical in yeah, all yeah, regards. Yeah. Never revealed. Never printed a story that was nonsense or That's based on bullshit. So if he called me out, I, I would actually go. It's probably got a fucking point. I better think about it. The problem, the problem with finding these people is they have to have a, a really long history in esports, and they also have to know enough about many esports and kind of the operations of the industry. And finding those people, like like you're saying, those people that used to do live on three are kind of peripherally involved in esports these days, or not at all. Um, so it's really tough because we've kind of lost many of those voices, I feel like. And I assume he does mean, like, because he said the horseman, like an industry angle. Like, listen, if it's about the game, many people can't. Dom oh, Coach, yeah, fucking sure. LS, Kelsey. Like, yeah, like yeah. if these people call me out on a region they watch all the time, I'm going to fucking listen, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's mostly just about industry stuff. But that's why you we think there's anyone, show. Dom? Is there anyone you'd put forward? <laughs> Who would you like to, if someone had to call us out on our bullshit, and some, like, industry angle, like, you know, maybe we have, like, two closer ties with this company or something. Do you know anyone that you would go to? Who would you go to if you had to, you had to save the world by taking us down? Like, I'm like, Al, Al, Al Capone. How are you going to take me down, Dom? Who are you going to go to to do it? Oh, I would probably go to... Wait, can I go to Richard Lewis? Can I convert Richard Lewis? Uh, I guess? If Richard Lewis, to be fair, of all of them, like, I don't know in the case of Monty, but like, if I really had to, like, I've, this is, sounds fucked up. I know this sounds so fucked up. Because even though <laughs> I, I, I could, I could mentally get myself to a place where I would be like, depending on who it was they killed, maybe like, that is like a factor of life and the human law is like a construct. But I will say this, <laughs> if like Monty or Richard ever kill anyone and I think it's not legit, I'll, I'll turn them in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Listen, that's unfortunately just where I'm at. So I know it sounds bad. And by the way, that wouldn't change that they were my friends and that. I'll visit, I'll visit, you know what? I'll visit you all the time in jail. I maybe Thanks, slip you a fucking a bread. Instead of a razor and cake, you can have 
bread with a saw inside it. You know, you can try and Andy Dufresne your way out of that motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Rotate your way around the prison guards. Will and then buy in me Richard's some cigarettes case, from the commissary. Yeah, in Richard's case, I'll just smuggle a bottle of Jack Daniels up my ass. There you go. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... I don't even know what this is. What former current league pro would you like to see on an episode of Beyond Scared Straight? Did anybody know what this show is? Yes. You mean the old prison one? Yep. Yep. When they go to prison, you, so... some kid, and then some guy goes, I'd rape you! And you're like, holy shit! Yeah, goes, <laughs> yeah pretty much. Pretty Basically. Much. <laughs> what, what they do is they, they take, uh, like, pretty much, like, I think, I mean, I know that there's ones for, for juveniles. I think it's mainly only for juveniles. Oh, you have it's to have like, committed a crime to go there. Yeah. Right? All right, all right. Okay. the answer is Peanut. <laughs> <laughs> no i mean so so like essentially you just have like these like guards that are like oh yeah you think you're tough now well you're in prison now i'll show you what tough is like and then it's just like okay. and they'll just be yelling in the person's face and like they'll be That's like brilliant. what you think you're tough and they'll be like no sir <laughs> wait a minute like, no, sir, wait a minute was tough. it supposed to be a pro that we had to send yeah yeah, yeah. oh because former... i was gonna say i would have sent loco doco just for the bats like i'd just like to <laughs> yeah. see him go oh, to he was a pro we just America. forget that he was yeah. i would, I would... Set... Send him to San Quentin tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know who I'm picking? I'm picking film it all. I'm Hashtag picking Loco to San Quentin. <laughs> okay. So we talked about him earlier on the show. I'm sending Deft because I feel like Deft needs to get the Hard shit scared off. out of him. Yeah, so it gets harder, and then he comes right. back. He'll be like, "Dude, I already had to yes. do like I, I already experienced." It'll be like Ben when he comes back, wouldn't right. he? Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's like peanut, peanut is the same boat, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Same boat. All right. Uh, what, what pro player in any game would you want to transfer to, to get his mechanics, but keep your mentality? Probably some of the people we've never listened to. Uzi, he's not a fucking bad shout. <laughs> the shy. By the way, these are even players where the reason I like that is I also do think, like, I won't really say it in league, but in CSGO, when I think I know the game, I, if you know this, but what you know is if he plays in Flashbot now, if I could take anyone's skills in CSGO, and I'm not taking like the obvious one, like simple, because that's like the fake of the game, I would take a player called Config's aim, and I'll just use my brain. Now, that's <laughs> insulting, because I'm saying I think I know the game better than him, but I'll just tell you right now, I think I do. So, <laughs> in this scenario, like, I don't really know league better, so actually it wouldn't help me, but I'd like, like, Uzi Eye or the shy skills, and then I would just, basically, I would play the way Ruler plays, but with their skills. And as a result, like, listen, mate, you're never going to beat me. Like, I'm going to win every fucking championship, you know. <laughs> Would you yeah, have one bomb? Who would you take? Hmm. Whose mechanics would I take? Because you might want a jungler so you could experience what it's like to have good mechanics. I would, I would so. definitely take a jungler. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I had good mechanics for my day. I don't, I don't really yeah, you did back in the day. Season yeah. 5, sure. Yeah, I, I think it's season 5. I, I never thought I was mechanically lacking. Um, what, so is your brain that was holding you back? What's, what's going on here? He had some no, rough to be fair. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I, think, I think that my ability to like influence others helped me back a, a decent amount. Like I kind of like didn't want to press people too far and have them potentially break on me. So I think, and like, you know, going back, knowing that I had Quas as a teammate, you know, like this, this is probably like a decent approach that I, that I should have had at the point, but, yeah. um, but uh, I don't know. Like, I think that for a jungler, who would I want? I would want to be like, I'd be, I'd want to be somebody who had, who had like Lee Sin godlike mechanics at a point. Ooh, Lee Sin. Insect? Uh, nah, I'm thinking like more like, I mean, Tian was pretty sick. Yeah, I was thinking about Tian, maybe. My mentality, and I could take their like hands and everything. Shadow would probably be pretty good, considering that he had the great mechanics last year, but never lived up. Yeah, I would Old say maybe. Young I, I would actually probably say Clid. <laughs> you okay. mean the first time he was in SKT? Yeah. Yeah, I think Clid. Like I think old Clid, like season nine Clid, I think was like yes. mechanically amazing. Oh, like his Lee Sin, his Gragas, he was like next fucking level on them. So yeah, I would say Clid actually. All right. Do you have someone, Monty? Who would you take the mechanics on? I take Shadow last year. I I think he was extremely good mechanically, and that if you could apply the same mechanics to different champions and use his brain better, then he might still be on an LEC team. By the way, I also just love because this is a, it's the same in almost every sport, right? is I love in League, especially because they're young guys, the way it's nearly always like that. The guy with the craziest mechanics is never the guy with the most controlled, like clean, polished players. It's just almost, it almost never goes hand in hand. That's why actually when he was at his peak, I did think Faker was like untouchable because he just sort of combined both. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, what's the next question? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Esports teams having their own theme songs like, uh, you know, baseball walkouts or WWE wrestling. Oh, it has to be a real song, basically. Well, mm -hmm. it, just thoughts on like 
If that's a good oh, thing, I, mean, I, I wish we thing. could. I, that would be sick. Like, I think it creates really strong identity. And if we, and honestly, like, if you watch some of the old Korean stuff, like MSL used shit, to have yeah. like walkouts for the players. Yes. The thing about that was so great about OGN, among many other things, was that because they were owned by a larger entertainment company that had all of the rights to all of the music on Earth, basically, that's why we could use things like Imagine Dragons or Lord or all of these other major artists for all of the hype videos and include them within the broadcast itself. So I wish there were more rights like that because I think it would be really additive and it would be sick to have walkout music for, for teams. I wish they did have that. Every esports team have the DJ Khaled set from the first of watching finals <laughs> as their walkout music performed live by the man. Another one. That's him. Yes. Listen, anytime you're hiring someone whose name is fucking DJ to do a live vocal performance, y'all already done fucked up. I don't know if you know basic like terminology in the English language there, Bobby Kotick, but that ain't going to work, is it? What you do next, hiring DJ Premier for a fucking crooning ballad, like Tony Bennett style. Doesn't he make sense, does it? He's supposed to be cutting up wax. That's right. I'm getting down with the kids there. Still saying shit from the A's. <laughs> I'm going I'm to pick some questions that are good for Dom, just because we had some yeah, from the it. last one as well. Um, about Kane joining the Africa Freaks as head coach. Um, basically, like... Former Team Liquid coach. Yeah, the former mm -hmm. Team Liquid coach. So I imagine you have some behind-the-scenes information about Kane. Uh, and how good he can be. I mean, traditionally, he's done very well, so you would yeah. think this would be a good pickup. I think he'd be, he's a good pickup because not only does he understand the game, but, like, I think one of his biggest struggles was just, like, dealing with, like, personalities and, like, people being, like... I mean, you're dealing with with people that have a huge amount of ego in, in North awesome. America, right? And I feel like in Korea, you get more default respect just for being in your position. Like, oh, you're a former pro who's, like, won championships as a coach, and now you're coming to coach us, and we aren't a good team. Like, I feel like the players are going to – like, he's going to have a lot of control, so I think it's a really good pickup. Yep. I think generally it should be fine. I think from my understanding, from talking to people within the, the LCS scene, that it was most, mostly, like, cultural issues or – uh, potentially Kane not being forceful enough in certain situations mm -hmm. that yep. caused it wasn't a lack of game knowledge or or a bit you know coaching ability. So I, I tend to agree with Dom from my what I know. Um, how much do you think regional separation has crippled the outliers of weaker regions in League of Legends like Flash Wolves or TSM in 2016? I will disagree with TSM in 2016 as actually being a good team, but that's fine. Uh, they were boosted by Samsung White trolling in their quarter final match so they look better than they were oh that um, was 2014 okay what 2016 yeah. 2016 uh, sorry yeah yeah 2016 yeah they were okay in 2016 yeah they um, did pretty good in 2016 yep so uh let's see here i i think the regional separation is incredibly damaging like i yeah, i've brought i brought this up before but in overwatch league the NA and European players used to be way worse than the Korean players. And then when Overwatch League started and everybody was in Los Angeles, all of a sudden those players started becoming much better and on par with Korean players. And for the last two years, there's been a mixed roster championship team. When they are able to actually, when the best in the world are actually able to compete against each other, they can be as good. And we would see in this Dota, in League of, of Legends. Yeah, Dota, mm -hmm. Counter-Strike, like... We yep. have all these games that show... When if you're really the best, it doesn't matter what region you come from in those games, you will become the best. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a really shitty practice problem that's in NA and a lack I mean, of international competition. You see the trajectory the G2 goes on every single world. Like, if you understand... Like, the thing is, you never get to see G2 when they start boot camping, right? If you talk to people from G2, they say they go to international competition and then get their shit pushed in for, like, two weeks straight every single time. And now they, they get their sh shit pushed in so often that they personally start the tournament like with weaker teams that they scrim and then they start like scrimming like you know after like the first like four days then they'll start scrimming everyone because they need to get exposed to it but like you see the amount of progress they go in to every tournament as like the 10th best team or like the ninth best team or the eighth best team or some shit like that and then they end up like top four or top two at the end of every single one because of how much they're able to improve over the course of the boot camp like who's to say that if they were in a league like if g2 you took those players with that skill and their mindset in 2019 and you throw them into uh like lck or or lpl and they get to play a full split that they wouldn't if they if they ended up be, still being able to qualify for worlds they wouldn't end up performing better with all that experience like i think that it's definitely something that that harms regions um especially when you deal with like not only do you deal with like different practice partners, but then there's so much solo queue that goes into like 
being a professional League of Legends player. And the solo queues are so drastically different. Like, I haven't been to Korea in eight years, so I don't know what their solo queue is like now. But I know that the gap between NA and EUS solo queue was huge. Like, it was massive. It was mind-blowing when I actually ended up going, which actually made it easier for me to play. I, I experienced, like, I, I climbed faster. It felt better. So I think that a lot of these players, when exposed to, to better players... It's a great commercial for the, for the Korean solo queue. I climbed faster. It felt better. E, no, like EUS. Fucking, EUS yeah, shot doing that about. thing back in the day. Dominion, it's yeah. fast. It's fun. It's Korean solo queue. Yeah. No, for, it's meme EUS Gumbo's solo always... I'll, I'll, it's I'll Monty. About EUS solo queue, but I keep that thing. meme gombo just at the side, mate. And I just, you know, I give it a stir every now and then, mate. <laughs> All right, next question. Um, Let's give me the last one, maybe. Uh, I've got two more. We'll do two oh, more. Cool. What changes slash buffs would you need to make dominant assassin champions like Zed, Kiana, and Diana viable? First off, Diana is viable right now. Yes. So just not in mid, in jungle. Mm -hmm. uh, second off, I feel like Zed is just... It was in a Zed game at MSI, which LS was yeah. like digging up, where it was like the fucking Pentanet guys, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think... I... Yeah, go for go it. Go for it. No, you go. Uh, well, I was just going to say that for the, for these types of champions, what needs to happen is for these champions to either have like better like tools to do what they're supposed to do. So like these are assassins that actually should not be able to solo kill you in lane. That's the problem, right? So like if you play a Zed versus an Orianna, not only are you going to get your shit pushed in, even when you hit your like spike at level six, you can't realistically kill a pro player that's playing Orianna well. Um, if they're like adapted in the situation, they potentially bring exhaust, they use the tools at their disposal. TP is just super fucking broken right now. Um, so essentially like these types of champions, like like champions like Zed are different than champions like Kiana. You can't just be like, oh, they're both AD assassins, so they're both right. similar. So like Kiana has uh, Kiana is so fucking bad in lane that the fact that she has more utility, she's so over nerfed in lane, means that she's like hardly playable. But a champion like Zed just needs to actually be able to use his kill windows and like he can't actually kill enough to matter in lane. He's also just it just feels like Zed's kit is really outdated in a lot of ways. Cause if you want kind of the in and out vibe, like Yone is just way better right now it feels like yone is just kind of like the more modern contemporary form of zed in in some fashion and so i just feel like zed's kit probably needs an overhaul in yep. general please don't <laughs> also please don't because i don't want that but that's fine yeah. <laughs> uh this is a good one there are it is a question about <coughs> film oh that's one thing i should have said earlier listen I'll, I'll only say it now just to have it for for posterity the one angle i also forgot to make was this because we were actually just comparing hard for i know nevis is like how we were comparing players from all different regions of the game and all different time areas of the game and all different metas of the game but one thing i would throw in there if you want to do the whole rookie versus faker angle is here's the thing faker did all that crazy shit that you're thinking of in the, your mind mainly that's like leblanc it's like fucking Ari. Riven, zed right rookie would do it on like oriana and fucking syndra and shit and he would still like dominate the game and yes, like, right. maybe not the exact same way but an unbelievable way to dominate again so yeah just say again stylistic difference throw yep. that in there what was the question money Okay, so uh, <laughs> there's a question about theoretical films. There are two magic buttons that produce a masterpiece. One, yeah. an action-packed, based on a true story, Captain Phillips vibe, retelling of the TSM Holy War as a film. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would have gone with Kingdom of Heaven, not like Captain Phillips, but, you know, that could have been fine. The other, a sitcom that blows all the other sitcoms out of the water. Here comes Reggie. <laughs> That's a classic one. Yeah. <laughs> Which one do you press it if you could only press one? Oh, it's definitely the sitcom for me. Like, you literally just get Seinfeld, but instead of Kramer, you just have Reggie all the time. Yeah, <laughs> that was my joke. Yeah, back in the day. Here's the thing. The reason why the movie went angle, I won't go with Kingdom of Heaven, though. I'll go with a different movie by the same director, Gladiator. Because obviously it's just like, oh, and who is this journalist? And my name is Thorin, and I'm the you know, <laughs> co-host of a slain co coach, you know, the whole deal. And I will have my revenge, this world, or any of the other worlds, really, because you're shit. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I think Kingdom of Heaven could be a, a pretty good one. At like the sitcom one, I feel like we don't need a movie of that because that's just it's real exists, life. It? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's called TSM Legends. That's how I'm, if people don't know. That, that is the lens. I used to say this all the time. That's the lens I view TSM through. I love TSM. They're one of my favorite teams. I fucking love that series. I love it. It's the shit. Yeah. No, TSM, TSM Legends, Legends is my shit. So I feel like the what I'm lacking is the the high budget, like actual Kingdom of Heaven style Holy yeah. War film where it just gets ridiculous in terms of the epic scope of it. I feel like I get the sitcom as it is. I feel like the sitcom is just me living in this universe. <laughs> so I'd pick that one. 
that it? Was that the last That's question? It. There you go. <laughs> it, was a, it was a monster, but we did it. Oh, oh, well, we'll do one more because we had talked um, about it earlier. What is the worst cast or curse you've seen live or caused yourself? My fandom of KT. That's why. We just discussed why. <laughs> yeah, okay. Monty ruined KT. For sure. I did ruin T. Do you have a one from like call stream or something, Dom, where you like called some shit and it was just like 100% the opposite? <laughs> uh, I guess uh, like hyping LPL going into Worlds last year. Like I feel like LPL just played so like they underperformed so hard. And it's so weird to, to say that, right? Because people don't accept that underperformance occurs. Like it just the way that people view things is like, no, they were just bad. They were just bad and they got exposed. But they didn't even like... I mean, they still made the final, but it just didn't look anything like, like, like specifically JDG and top. They look nothing like JDG and top uh, domestically, just their overall approach to the game, like things that you could go back in the tape and like show that it was completely like up to their own decision making. It's not like they were pressured into like making like errors or anything like that. Like they were just one of like JDG is one of the best teams in the world at support uh, jungle warding. Like they would be very early to group uh, Lamau and Kanavi and just walk into the enemy jungle, get good wards down, set up for a dragon and like play together. And they just completely lost that during world. So for me, I think that that was like probably one of the ones where it was like, damn, like these guys really are, are choking and it's really hard to like even like give context to people that haven't watched them as to what teams they are and like how how they are choking. I've got two, so I've got one, and obviously I'm not a caster, but this is just like calls I made that like it became like 100% the opposite. So there's two. I'll do the League of Legends one first, which is in line with the Nami angle, because that year I was watching all LPL. I was balls deep on it, and a lot of people don't know that team. Aside from Worlds, like they just they just won like they were like a golden generation. They won both the LPL splits. They won something like four or five other land tournaments. That had all bunch of LPL teams there. Like they were in all the finals except like they finished second in like one online cup or something like they were they, like so i thought when they came to worlds most people thought this right because at the time they thought well all three korean teams should be better they thought right best case scenario maybe you could make like semis because they were on the side of the bracket after the the group where they had the the, the other two chinese teams and then najin fucking shield who'd already lost to alliance i really thought that they were going to make the final because i thought fuck they beat they beat the Star Hunt Royal Club because that was like a joke team at the time. Then they're going to play Najin Shield. If they play Najin Shield, it's actually, I think they've got a better, a better team fighting style. They win that. So I had them being in the final. Obviously, they just got straight banged out in like a bizarre five game season in the round of eight. And then now I have to carry Nami around my neck forever. And then in CSGO, I had one that was like similar because it was just, it was just a lot of fans, by the way, are so dumb. They always have to try and get me by using looper time bending techniques that I don't have access to because I have to live life forwards one second at a time so what they love to do is go you said something on monday and on friday you said something different it goes stop a second imagine why that's possible did anything happen is it still monday and then they go no but it's not correct though it's like is yeah. it possible things change? So what the problem is a caster as well is sometimes you don't have information because it's secret, right? So basically, coming into the last major, because sadly it was two years ago and we haven't had any land since then, the last major in Counter-Strike was the Star Ladder Berlin major in 2019. And in the run-up to that, Team Liquid was so dominant. They'd won six tournaments in a row. They won the Intel Grand Slam. They were smashing everyone. They'd even beaten their rivals, Astralis, who'd like sort of gone off form and taken time off. And coming into the major, which was after a player break, they looked like they were just going to win this for sure. They're going to win it, and it's going to be like an NA era. It's going to set this night. When they played Astralis in the quarterfinals, both of them had been a bit ropey in this tournament, and both were looking like, who the fuck knows? I don't know if either of them is going to win this tournament. In the map veto, basically, at the time, the other reason why Astralis was in deep shit is Liquid had the map veto. They had like a whole bunch of maps they were really good on, and then even the weird maps that no one played at the time, like Vertigo, they were 5-0 and zero on Vertigo, and the last time they played Astralis, they'd beaten them on it. So the one thing no one expected was Astralis picked Vertigo, because what Team Liquid thought was, well, we both just won't play Vertigo, so we'll fought it till the end of the map veto. When Astralis picked it, Logically, because Astralis wasn't in the best form yet, they leveled up in the playoffs. And it's not a map that's like their strong map they've secretly been playing as far as we knew in games, like officials, and Team Liquid's 5-0. And I actually thought, dude, they've mentally conceded. This is a panic pick. They've picked it because they are because they know they can't play the normal maps and they're just saying, let's just make it random. It actually turned out, no joke, they had secretly for the last like week or whatever, just practiced that one map and that was like their secret pick that they designed. So after the game, I had to then do a tweet where I said, actually the decider in the series was the genius pick of Vertigo. So every fan was like, but you said it was a panic, but it's like, shit. So what you're saying is if we exclude all context and facts that we've learned since, I'm wrong. I feel like you're pushing it on that one, guys. Is that really the only way I can be wrong? I'm wrong about loads of stuff. You're just not smart enough to pick up on it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's like it's, it, I, I experienced a similar thing with um, 
with, with MSI recently, right? Where I like went into the tournament. I'm like, I think Cloud9 will go like 4-2 in their group, right? And then after they lost an Almwon the first time, um, and then they also lost a Japanese team. That I'm like, okay, Sage well, the Sage well. <laughs> well, I didn't know. Then I was like, I was like, oh, I actually, I, I probably think now, like based on the first week of games, like they, or the first round robin where they lost like a game that, that I didn't expect them to lose. I still think that they'll probably advance out of the group, but they'll go three, three. So in both situations, I have them advancing um, out of the group second seed. Uh, not that second seed matters because the groups are terrible and the format is dog shit. But anyways, I had them inv- and, like uh, coming out of the um, the group second. And then people were like, oh, well, you know, like, well, you are only right because you made multiple predictions. And like, if you make multiple predictions, then you're guaranteed to be right on them, which is like, number one, like what what I predicted was not that different. Like I predicted a 4-2 and a 3-3. And it was like, like and, and all I said is given the context that like, since I didn't expect them to lose the Japanese team, they probably still get out of the Japanese team. But they probably uh, end up like, you know, losing the game to Dom one. Anyway, I didn't expect them to beat Dom one. Okay. And suddenly that like discredits your whole opinion where it's like, okay, well, I mean, what did I say the whole time? The overall thing shouldn't matter what games. The point is what matters, right? Yeah. The point and how and the point do. is, is that I'm still predicting them to get out of groups. I'm still predicting them to get yes. top four at the tournament. Doesn't mean I have to be happy in the fashion that they do it. I don't think they're like a good team. I just think that they'll get top four at the tournament. By because the way, there's a lot of bad teams at the tournament. Just for the producer, is it possible, just because we're going to end any second, is it possible you could really quickly pull up this tweet and show it on stream? Just show this image, because Monty's going to appreciate it, right? Just, <laughs> just show this. You have, to, you have to show it on stream to end the episode, though, because this this describes like the vibe when we got deep into like, like figuring out who the actual super team was. Just just show this image. It might be the best copium done so far, basically. It's so depressing. Like That realization was actually just horrifying in the end. Especially the deft one. It's like, wait a minute, you could actually have had four out of five of the KT super like, <laughs> that's like that's like that dog when he was looking off into the distance you know the one with the cupcakes yeah <laughs> gotta show this before it ends then we'll just wrap this motherfucker up because everyone needs to see this work of art that fucking nelson's done who was by the way a copy of artist in case people are unaware uh too good too good I was actually surprised by the result, you know, upon the reflection yeah. and, and talking. I hadn't actually over. thought about who it all was. I was only going individually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll get it here eventually. It's added to the. I mean, I will OBS. say, by the way, if you made it like an alternate team, and the alternate team was like the shy, dandy, rookie, fucking deft, and mad life. It's not a fucking bad team either, mate. And by, by the way, that team just fucking yeah, shit stops you. Or something. Yeah, you know that team doesn't even <laughs> doesn't even try and play macro. They just destroy you, don't they? <laughs> oh, also, I guess we can mention this. The reason why we didn't talk about MSI is because first off, there's barely anything to talk about. So as hyped as some of you guys were getting by these upsets first off it's best of one and second off come on those games were bad <laughs> I, I feel like the takeaways were super limited and the tournament itself is only really worth talking about now that we're going to get into the rumble stage that's how i feel about it i've got to give all you in league of legends a bit of a black pill for a second because it's going to be depressing to you because you all care about league of legends right i've always <laughs> been a tourist in league of legends listen i just had except and i'm not a tourist i have a summer home in league of legends i just pop there you go there's a copy of, by the way here's the story <laughs> right so basically i come and ask summer in league of legends but then i'm off you know in fucking like tokyo like seoul like fucking dallas or whatever that's like you know fucking cs go whatever game i want to go into right so as a result when no msi happens i watch some of the games that i go you know what if i really want to watch something i'll just go watch the CS tournament now. So you're all like a guy who's just starving. You've been living on Arby's sandwiches. And by the way, Arby's tastes like actual ass. I, I would rather eat ass than, than Arby's. I just hope it has more protein in. Right? Basically, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. When we had them as a sponsor for E-League, I just said, well, if we're doing the sponsor segment, where the fuck are the Arby's sandwiches? They were like, trust me, you don't want one. I was like, I do. It's a fucking sponsored segment. Bring me an Arby's. They brought me. I ate a bite and I was like, is this prop food? Is this real? Was that, the fries was that the are fake really one? good. Was the that a fake one from the commercial or something? So anyway, <laughs> like there's the angle right basically you're you're so starving and on a malnourished diet that when someone throws you just some graham crackers with jelly you're going 
Oh, 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 this is oh, this is so succulent and rich. Oh, God, MSI. Oh, an underdog team won a game. Oh, God, please, I'm coming. Ah. Like, I just watch it and I go, this is fucking garbage. Someone wake me up in two weeks when, like, the final's on or whatever. Like, I can't handle it, boys. It's like you've been wandering it. through the desert and you yeah. find, like, one pool of dirty water and you think it's the sweetest, the sweetest nectar from the gods that you've ever tasted. <laughs> Meanwhile, other esports are just not in the desert. Turns out you don't have to be in the desert. Yes. <laughs> Turns out. You and don't also, have to be unfortunately, listen, I know why people get hyped for the upsets because like you just think they can't happen. The problem I have is this. I just always like have a mournful feeling of like what could have been if this tournament was double a lame or what could be if it had a better format or that's I, I just I can't escape that when MSI comes. It just always feels like it's just so underwhelming. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thanks. MSI for... sucks. It's overrated. It, <laughs> it's it is a... what it is. I made a whole video on it. Yes. I'm <laughs> go, go to watch. Dom's YouTube and watch it. Thank you for coming on today, Dom. I know no it was cheers. a long show, but it was super interesting. Oh, no problem. I've uh, done six hours straight of Thorin content. I, yeah, now I'm good I for another week. I gotta, I gotta have some time to cool <laughs> off. Next week. All right. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>